Chapter Twenty Two of Agnes Sorrel by G. P. R. James. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Chapter Twenty Two. All great events are made up of small incidents. The world is composed of atoms, and so is fate. A man pulling a small bit of iron under a gun performs an act, abstractedly of not much greater importance than a lady when she pins her dress but let this small incident be combined with three other facts that of there being a cartridge in the gun that of twenty thousand men all pulling their triggers at the same moment that of there being twenty thousand men opposite and you have the glorious event of a great battle with its long sequence of misery and joy glory and shame affecting the world perhaps to the end of time Two little incidents occurred at the Chateau of Beauté during the day, the commencement of which we have just noticed, not apparently very much worthy of remark, but which nevertheless must be noted down in this very accurate piece of chronology. The first was the arrival of a courier, whose face Jean Charost knew, though it was some time before he could fix it, to the neck and shoulders of a man whom he had seen at Pithiviers, not in the colours of the House of Burgundy, but in those of fair Madame de Giac. The letter he bore was addressed to the Duke of Orléans, and it evidently troubled him, threw him into a fit of musing, occupied his thoughts for some moments, and made the Duchess somewhat anxious lest evil news had reached her lord. He did not tell her the contents of the note, however, nor return any answer at the time, but sent the man away with largesse, saying he would write. The next incident was another arrival, that of a party of three or four gentlemen from Paris, who were invited to stay at the Chateau of Beauté that night, and who supped with the Duke and Duchess in the great hall. The Duke's face was exceedingly cheerful, and his health was evidently improved since the morning, when some secret cause seemed to have moved and depressed him a great deal. The conversation principally turned upon the events which had lately taken place in Paris. They were generally of little moment, but one piece of intelligence the strangers brought was evidently, to the Duke at least, of greater importance than the rest. The guests reported confidently that the unhappy king, Charles the Sixth, had shown decided symptoms of one of those periodical returns to reason, which chequered with occasional bright gleams his dark and melancholy career. The Duke seemed greatly pleased, mused upon the tidings, questioned his informant closely, but uttered not his own thoughts, whatever they might be, and retired to rest at an early hour. During the whole of that day, without absenting himself for any length of time from his own apartments, Jean Charost wandered a good deal about the castle, and, to say sooth, looked somewhat impatiently for Juvenal de Royan in every place where he was likely to be met with. He did not find him anywhere, however, and on asking Signor Lomellini where he should find the young gentleman, he was informed dryly that Monsieur de Royan was particularly engaged in some affairs of the Duke's, and would not like to be disturbed. The evening passed somewhat dully for Jean Charost, for he confined himself almost altogether to his own apartments, expecting every moment that the prince would send for him, but in this he was disappointed. He did not venture to retire to rest till nearly midnight, and then he slept as soundly as in life's happiest days and he was only awakened in the morning by the sound of a trumpet announcing as he rightly judged the departure of the preceding evening's guests he was dressing himself slowly and quietly when martin grille bustled into the room exclaiming quick sir quick or you will have no breakfast have you not heard any news the duke sets out in half an hour for paris and you will be wanted of course half the household stays here with the duchess go with twenty lances and the lay brethren of which class praised be god for all things you and i may consider ourselves i have had no commands replied jean charost but i will be ready at all events not many minutes elapsed however ere a notification reached him that he would be required to accompany the prince to the capital all speed was made and breakfast hastily eaten but haste was unnecessary for an hour or two elapsed before the cavalcade set out and it did not reach paris till toward the close of the day the duke looked fatigued and as he dismounted in the courtyard of his hotel 
he called Lomellini to him, saying, Let me have some refreshment in my own chamber, Lomellini. Send to the prior of the Celestin, saying that I wish to see him tomorrow at noon. There will be a banquet, too, at night. Twelve persons will be invited, of high degree. De Bracy, I have something to say to you. He then walked on up the steps into the house, Jean Charost following close and after a moment or two he turns, saying in a low voice, "'Come to me as the clock strikes nine. Come privately by the toilet-chamber door. Enter at once without knocking.' Several of the other attendants were following at some distance, but the duke spoke almost in a whisper, and his words were not heard. Jean Charost bowed and fell back, but Lomellini, who had now become exceedingly affectionate again to the young secretary, said in his ear, "'Come and sup in my room in half an hour.' They will fare but ill in the hall to-night, for nothing is prepared here, but we will contrive to do better. A few minutes afterward, the duke, having been conducted to his chamber door, the attendant separated, and Jean Charost betook himself to his own rooms, where Martin Grille was already busily engaged in arranging his apparel in the large, fixed coffers with which each chamber was furnished. There was a sort of nervous anxiety in the good man's manner, which struck his master the moment he entered, but laying his sword on the table and seating himself by it, Jean Charost fell into a quiet and somewhat pleasing fit of musing, just sufficiently awake to external things to remark that ever and anon Martin stopped his work and gave a quick glance at his face. At length the young gentleman rose, made some change in his apparel, removed the traces of travel from his person, and buckled on his sword again. "'Pray sit,' said Martin Grille, in a tone of fear and trepidation. "'Pray, sir, don't go through the little hall, for that boisterous good-for-nothing bully, Juvenel de Royan, is there all alone, watching for you, I am sure. He was freed from his arrest this morning, and he would have fallen upon you on the road, I dare say, if there had not been so many persons around.' "'His arrest?' said Jean Charost. "'How came he in arrest?' "'On account of his quarrel with you yesterday morning, Monsieur de Bracy, replied Martin Grille, "'did you not know it? All the household heard of it.' "'I have been deceived,' answered Jean Charost. "'Signor Lomellini told me he was engaged when I inquired for him. "'But you are mistaken, Martin. A few sharp words do not make exactly a quarrel. "'But there was no need of placing de Royan under arrest. "'It was a very useless precaution.' so much so indeed that i think you must be mistaken he must have given some offence to the duke that could not easily be settled he then paused for a moment or two in thought and added wait here till i return and if de royan should come tell him i am supping with signor lomellini but will be back soon do as i order you and make no remonstrance if you please thus saying he left the room and bent his step at once toward the little hall leaving at some distance on the right the great dining-room from which loud sounds of merriment were breaking forth he hardly expected to find juvenal de royan still in the place where martin grille had seen him for the sound of gay voices was ever ready to lead him away on opening the door however the faint light in the room showed him a figure at the other end beyond the table moodily pacing to and fro from one side of the room to the other and Jean Charost needed no second glance to tell him who it was. He advanced directly toward him, taking a diagonal line across the hall, so that de Royan could not suppose he was merely passing through. The young man instantly halted and faced him, but Jean Charost spoke first, saying, "'My valet told me, Monsieur de Royan, that you were here alone, and as I could not find you yesterday when I sought you, I am glad of the opportunity of speaking a few words with you.' "'Sort for me,' cried de Royan. "'Methinks no one ought to have known better where I was than yourself.' "'You are mistaken,' replied Jean Charost. "'I asked Signor Lomellini where I could find you, "'and he told me you would be occupied all day in some business of the Duke's.' "'A lying old panda!' exclaimed de Royan bitterly. "'But our business may soon be settled, de Bracy. "'If you are inclined to risk a thrust here, I am ready for you.' no place makes any difference in my eyes in mine it does replied jean charost very quietly you are not a coward i suppose cried the young man impetuously i believe not replied jean charost and there are few things that i should be less afraid of than risking a thrust with you monsieur de Royan, 
in any proper place and circumstances here in a royal house you ought to be well aware we should subject ourselves by broiling to disgraceful punishment and we can well afford to wait for a more fitting opportunity which i will not fail to give you if you deserve it of course i do replied juvenal de Royan. i do not see the of course replied jean charost i have never injured you in anything never insulted you in any way have borne perhaps too patiently injury and insult from you and have certainly the most cause to complain well i am ready to satisfy you exclaimed de Royan with a laugh on horseback or on foot with lance and shield or sword and dagger do not let us spoil a good quarrel with silly explanations we are both of one mind it seems let us settle preliminaries at once i have not time to settle all preliminaries now replied jean charost for i am expected in another place but so far we can arrange our plan the day after to-morrow i will ask the duke's permission to go for three days to mantes i will return at once to moudon you can easily get out of paris for an hour or two and join me there at the auberge then a ten minutes walk will place us where we can settle our dispute without risk to the survivor on my life this is gallant replied de royan with a considerable change of expression you are a lad of spirit after all de bracy you have insulted my father's memory by supposing otherwise replied jean charost but do not let us add bitterness to our quarrel we understand each other whenever you hear i am gone to mont remember you will find me the next day at moudon and so good-night thus saying he left him and hurried to the eating-room of lomelini who would fain have extracted from him what the duke had said to him as they passed into the house but jean charost was upon his guard and as soon as supper was over returned to his own chamber martin grille though he had quick eyes could discover no trace of emotion on his young master's countenance and desperately tired of his solitary watch he gladly received his dismissal for the night a few minutes after jean charost issued from his room again and walked with a silent step to the door of the duke's toilet chamber no attendants were in waiting as was usual and following the directions he had received he opened the door and entered he was surprised to find the prince dressed in mantle and hood as if ready to go out but upon the table before him was lying a perfumed note open and another fastened with rose-coloured silk and sealed welcome de bracy said the duke with a gay and smiling air i wish you to render me a service my friend you must take this note for me to-night to the house of madame de giac and give it to her own hand hear what she says and bring me her answer I shall be at the Queen's Palace near the Porte Barbette. The blood rushed up into Jean Charost's face, covering it over with a woman-like blush. It was the most painful moment he had ever as yet experienced in existence. His mind instantly rushed to a conclusion from premises that he could hardly define to his own mind, much less explain to the Duke of Orléans. He fancied himself employed in the basest of services, used for the most disgraceful of purposes and yet nothing had been said which could justify him in refusing to obey whether he would or not however and before he could consider the words oh sir burst from his lips and his face spoke the rest plainly enough the duke of orleans gazed at him with a frowning brow and a flashing eye and then demanded in a loud stern tone what is it you mean sir jean charost was silent for an instant and then replied with painful embarrassment i hardly know what i mean your highness i may be wrong and doubtless am wrong but i feared that the errand on which your highness sends me might be one unbecoming me to execute and which your highness might afterward regret to have given he had gone a step too far so dangerous with the spoiled children of fortune the anger of the duke was excessive he spoke loud and sharply reproached his young secretary for presuming upon his kindness and condescension and reproved him in no very measured terms for daring to intermeddle with his affairs and jean charost feeling at his heart that he had most assuredly exceeded perhaps the bounds of due respect had come to conclusions for which there was no apparent foundation and had suffered his suspicions to display themselves offensively 
stood completely cowed before the prince when the duke at length stopped he answered in a tone of sincere grief i fear that i have erred sir greatly erred and that i should have obeyed your commands without even presuming to judge of them pray remember sir that i am very young perhaps too young for the important post i fill if your highness dismisses me from your service i cannot be surprised but believe me sir wherever i go i shall carry with me the same feelings of gratitude and affection which had no small share in prompting the very conduct which has given you just defence affection and gratitude said the duke still in an angry tone what can affection and gratitude have to do with disobedience to my commands and impertinent intrusion into my affairs they might sir answered jean charost for your highness communicated to me at a former time some regrets and i witnessed the happiness and calm of mind which followed the noble impulses that prompted them gratitude and affection then made me grieve to think that this very letter which i hold in my hand might give cause to fresh regrets or perhaps to serious perils for i am bound to say that i doubt this lady that i doubt her affection or friendship for your highness that i am sure she is linked most closely to your enemies you should not have judged of my acts at all replied the duke of orleans what i do not communicate to you you have no business to investigate your judgment of the lady may be right or wrong but in your judgment of my conduct you are altogether wrong there is nothing in that note which i ever can regret and could you see its contents you would learn at once the danger and presumption of intruding into what does not concern you to give you the lesson i must not sacrifice my dignity and though in consideration of your youth your inexperience and your good intentions i will overlook your error in the present instance remember it must not be repeated jean charost moved toward the door while the duke remained in thought but before he reached it the prince's voice was heard exclaiming in a more placable tone de bracy de bracy do you know the way as little in this case as in the last replied jean charost with a faint smile come hither come hither poor youth holding out his hand to him good-humouredly there think no more of it all young men will be fools now and then now go and get a horse you will find my mule saddled in the court wait there till i come i am going to visit my fair sister the queen who is ill at the hotel barbette and we pass not far from the place to which you are going i will direct you so that you cannot mistake jean charost hurried away and was ready in a few minutes in the court he found a cream-coloured mule richly caparisoned and two horses saddled with a few attendants on foot around but the duke had not yet appeared when he did come four of the party mounted and rode slowly on through the moonlight streets of paris which were now silent and almost deserted after going about half a mile the duke reined in his mule and pointed down another street which branched off on the right directed jean charost to follow it and take the second turning on the left the first hotel he added on the right is the house you want then return to this street follow it out to the end and you will see the hotel barbette before you bring me thither an account of your reception his tone was grave and even melancholy and jean charost merely bowed his head in silence he gave one glance at the duke's face from which all trace of anger had passed away and then they parted never to meet again End of chapter 22chapter twenty three of agnes sorrel by g p r james this librivox recording is in the public domain chapter twenty three standing in the street at the door of the house to which he had been directed jean charost found a common-looking man whose rank or station was hardly to be divined by his dress and drawing up his horse beside him he asked if madame de giac lived there she is here replied the man what do you want with her i have a letter to deliver to her answered jean charost briefly give it to me replied the man that cannot be answered the young secretary it must be delivered by me into her own hand who is it from 
inquired the other. She does not see strangers at this hour of the night. The young secretary was somewhat puzzled what to reply, for a lingering suspicion made him unwilling to give the name of the duke, but he had not been told to conceal it. On seeing no other way of obtaining admission, he answered, after a moment's consideration, "'It is from His Highness of Orléans, and I must beg you to use dispatch.' "'I will see if she will admit you,' replied the man. "'But come into the court, at all events. You will soon have your answer.' Thus saying, he opened the large wooden gates of the yard, and, as soon as Jean Charost had entered, closed and fastened them securely. There was a certain degree of secrecy and mystery about the whole proceeding, a want of that bustle and parade common in great houses in Paris, which confirmed the preconceived suspicions of Jean Charost, and made him believe that a woman of gallantry was waiting for the visit of a prince whose devotion to her sex was but too well known. Dismounting, he stood by his horse's side, while the man quietly glided through a door, hardly perceivable, in the obscurity of one dark corner in the courtyard. The moon had already sunk low, and the tall houses round shadowed the whole of the open space in which the young secretary stood, so that he could but little see the aspect of the place, although he had ample time for observation. Nearly ten minutes elapsed before the messenger's return, but then he came, attended by a page bearing a flambeau, and, in civil terms, desired the young gentleman to follow him to his mistress's presence. Through ways as narrow and as crooked as the ways of love usually are, Jean Charost was conducted to a small room, which would nowadays probably be called a boudoir, where, even without the contrast of the poor naked stone passages through which he had passed, everything would have appeared luxurious and splendid in the highest degree. Rumour attributed to the beautiful lady whom he went to visit, a princely lover, who some years before had commanded an army against the Ottomans, and received a defeat which rendered him morose and harsh throughout the rest of his life, but had acquired, during an easy captivity among the Mussulmans, a taste for oriental luxury which never abandoned him. All within the chamber to which Jean Charost was now introduced spoke that the lady had not been uninfluenced by her lover's habits. Articles of furniture, little known in France, were seen in various parts of the room, piles of cushions, carpets of innumerable dyes, and low sofas or ottomans, while, even in the midst of winter, the odour of roses pervaded the whole apartment. Madame de Giac herself, negligently dressed, but looking wonderfully beautiful, was reclining on the cushions, with a light on a low table by her side, and, on the approach of Jean Charost, she received him more as an old and dear friend than a mere accidental acquaintance. A radiant smile was upon her lips. She made him sit down beside her, and in her tone there was a blandishing softness which he felt was very engaging. For a minute or two she held the letter of the Duke of Orléans unopened in her hand, while she asked him questions about his journey from Pithivier to Blois, and his return. At length, however, she opened the billet and read it, not so little observed as she imagined herself, for Jean Charost's eyes were fixed upon her, marking the various expressions of her countenance. At first her glance at the note was careless, but speedily her eyes fixed upon the lines with an intense, eager look. Her brow contracted, her nostrils expanded, her beautiful upper lip quivered, and that fair face for an instant took upon it the look of a demon. Suddenly, however, she recollected herself, smoothed her brow, recalled the wandering lightning of her eyes, and folding the note, she curled it between her fingers, saying, "'I must write an answer, my dear young friend. I will not be long. Wait for me here.' and rising gracefully she gathered her flowing drapery around her and passed out by a door behind the cushions the door was closed carefully but jean charost had good reason to believe that the time of madame de giac was occupied in other employment than writing a murmur of voices was heard in which her own sweet tones mingled with others harsher and louder the words could not be distinguished but the conversation seemed eager and animated beginning the moment she entered, and rising and falling in loudness, 
as if the speakers were sometimes carried away by the topic, sometimes fearful of being overheard. Jean Charost was no great casuist, and certainly, in all ordinary cases, he would have felt ashamed to listen to any conversation not intended for his ears. Neither on this occasion did he actually listen. He moved not from his seat. He even took up and examined a beautiful golden-sheathed poniard with a bejewelled hilt, which lay upon the table where stood the light. But there was a doubt, a suspicion, an apprehension of he knew not what in his mind, which, if well founded, might perhaps have justified him in his own eyes in actually trying to hear what was passing. For assuredly he would have thought it no want of honour thus to detect the devices of an enemy. The voice of Madame de Giac was not easily forgotten by one who had once heard it, and the rougher, sterner tones that mingled in the conversation seemed likewise familiar to the young secretary's ears. But those who were speaking he believed to be inimical to his royal master. He heard nothing distinctly, however, but the last few words that were spoken. It was seen that Madame de Giac had approached close to the door, and laid her hand upon the lock, and the other speaker raised his voice, adding to some words which were lost, the following, in an imperative tone. "'As long as possible, remember, by any means.' Madame de Giac's murmured reply was not intelligible to the young secretary, but then came a coarse laugh, and a deeper voice answered, "'No, no, I do not mean that, but by force if need be.' "'Well, then, tell them,' said the fair lady. But what was to be told escaped unheard by Jean Charost, for she dropped her voice lower than ever, and a moment after re-entered the room. Her face was all fair and smiling, and before she spoke she seated herself again on the cushions, paused thoughtfully, and looking at the dagger which the young gentleman replaced as she entered, said playfully, "'Do not jest with edged tools. I hope you did not take the poniard out of its sheath. It comes from Italy, from the very town of the sweet Duchess of Orléans, and they tell me that the point is poisoned, so that the slightest scratch would produce speedy death. It has never been drawn since I had it, and never shall be, with my will. I did not presume to draw it, said Jean Charost, but may I crave your answer to His Highness's note? How wonderfully formal we are, said Madame de Giac with a gay laugh. This chivalrous reverence for the fair, which boys are taught in their school days, is nothing but a sad device of old women and jealous husbands. It is state and dress and grave surroundings de bracy that makes us divinities a princess and a page in a little cabinet like this are but a woman and a man due propriety of course is right but forms and reverence all nonsense beauty and rank have both their reverence madam replied jean charost but at the present moment all other things aside i am compelled to think of his highness's business for he is waiting for me now at the Hôtel Barbette, expecting anxiously, I doubt not, your answer. The conversation that followed does not require detail. Madame de Giac was prodigal of blandishments, and, skilled in every female art, contrived to while away some twenty minutes without giving the young secretary any reply to bear to his master. When at length she found that she could not detain him any longer without some definite answer, she turned to the subject of the note, and contrived to waste some more precious time on it. "'What if I were to send the Duke a very angry message?' she said. "'I should certainly deliver it,' replied Jean Charost. "'But I would rather that you wrote it.' "'No, I have changed my mind about that,' she answered. "'I will not write. You may tell him I think him a base, ungrateful man, unworthy of a lady's letter. Will you tell him that?' "'Precisely, madam, word for word,' replied Jean Charost. "'Then you are bolder with men than women,' replied the lady, with a laugh slightly sarcastic. "'Stay, stay, I have not half done yet. Say to the Duke, I am of a forgiving nature, and if he does proper penance and comes to sue for pardon, he may perhaps find mercy. "'Whither are you going so fast? You cannot get out of this enchanted castle as easily as you think, good youth, at least not without my consent.' "'I pray, then, give it to me, madam,' said Jean Charost, "'for I really fear that his highness will be angry at my long delay.' 
poor youth, what a frightened thing it is, said the lady. Well, you shall go, but let me look at the duke's note again, in case I have anything to add. And she unfolded the billet, which she still held in her hand, and looked at it by the light. Again Jean Charost marked that bitter, fiend-like scowl come upon her countenance. And in this instance, the feelings that it indicated found some expression in words. "'Either you or his priest are making a monk of him,' she said bitterly. "'But it matters not. Tell him what I have said.' And murmuring a few more indistinct words to herself, she rang a small silver bell which lay upon the cushions beside her, and the man who had given Jean Charost admission speedily appeared. The lady looked at him keenly for an instant, and the young secretary thought he saw a glance of intelligence pass from his face to hers. "'Like this young gentleman out,' said Madame de Gillac. "'You are a young fool, de Precy. she added laughingly. "'But that is no fault of yours or mine. Nature made you so, and I cannot mend you. And so, good-night.' Jean Charost bowed low, and followed the man out of the room but as he did so he drew his sword-hilt a little forward, not well knowing what was to come next. Madame de Gillac eyed him with a sarcastic smile, and the door closed upon him. The man lighted him silently, carefully, along the narrow, tortuous passage, and down the steep staircase by which he had entered, holding the light low, that he might see his way. When they reached the small door which led into the courtyard, he unbolted it, and held it back for the young gentleman to go forth. But the moment Jean Charost had passed out, the door was closed and bolted. Not very courteous, thought Jean Charost, but doubtless he takes his tone from his lady's last words. What a dark night it is! For a minute or two in the sudden obscurity after the light was withdrawn, he could discern none of the objects around him, and it was not till his eye had become more accustomed to the darkness that he discovered his horse standing fastened to a ring let into the building. He detached him quickly and led him to the great gates, but here a difficulty presented itself. The large wooden bar was easily removed, and the bolts drawn back, but still the gates would not open. The young gentleman felt them all over in search of another fastening, but he could find none and he then turned to a sort of guard-room on the right of the entrance, attached to almost all the large houses of Paris in that day, and transformed, in after and more peaceable times, into a porter's lodge. All was dark and silent within, however, the door was closed, and no answer was returned when the young gentleman knocked. He then tried another door, in the middle of the great façade of the building, but there, also, the door was locked, and he could make no one hear. His only resource, then, was the small postern by which he had been admitted, but here also he was disappointed, and he began to comprehend that he was intentionally detained. He was naturally the more impatient to escape, and, abandoning all ceremony, he knocked hard with the hilt of his dagger on the several doors, trying them in turns. But it was all in vain. There were things doing which made his importunity of small consequence. With an angry and impatient heart, and a mind wandering through a world of conjecture, he at length thrust his dagger back into the sheath, and stood and listened near the great gates, determined, if he heard a passing step in the street, to call loudly for assistance. All was still, however, for ten minutes, and then came suddenly a sound of loud voices and indistinct cries, as if there was a tumult at some distance. Jean Charost's heart beat quick though there seemed no definite link of connection between his own fate and the sounds he heard. A minute or two after, however, he was startled by a nearer noise, a rattling and grating sound, and he had just the time to draw his horse away ere the gates opened of their own accord and rolled back without any one appearing to move them. A hoarse and unpleasant laugh at the same moment sounded on Jean Charost's ear, and looking forth into the street he saw two or three dark figures running quickly forward in one direction. End of chapter 23
there was in paris an old irregular street called the street of the old temple which had been built out toward the port barbette at a period when the capital of france was much smaller in extent than in the reign of king charles the sixth no order or regularity had been preserved although one side of the street had for some distance been kept in a direct line by an antique wall built it is said by the voluntary contributions or personal labours of different members of the famous order of the temple the brethren of which though professing poverty were often more akin to dives than to lazarus the other side of the street however had been filled up by the houses and gardens of various individuals each walking in the light of his own eyes and using his discretion as to how far his premises should encroach upon how far recede from the highway thus when sun or moon was up and shining down the street a number of picturesque shadows crossed it offering a curious pattern of light and shade varying with every hour a strange custom existed in those days which has only been perpetuated that i know of in some towns of the tyrol of affixing to each house its own particular sign which served as numbers do in the present day to distinguish it from all others in the same street sometimes these signs or emblems projected in the form of a banner from the walls of the house overhanging the street and showing the golden cross or the silver cross or the red ball the lion the swan or the heart to every one who rode along sometimes with better taste but perhaps with less convenience to the passenger in search of a house he did not know the emblem chosen by the proprietor was built into the solid masonry or placed in a little gothic niche constructed for the purpose the latter was generally the case where angel or patron saint prophet or holy man was the chosen device and especially so when any of the persons of the holy trinity for whom the parisians seemed to have more love than reverence gave a name to the building thus at the corner of the street of the old temple and another which led into it a beautiful and elaborate niche with with a baldachin of fretted stone and a richly carved pediment offered to the eyes of the passers-by a very well executed figure of the virgin holding in her arms the infant saviour and from this image the house on which it was affixed obtained the name of the hôtel de notre dame notwithstanding the sanctity of the emblem and the beauty of the building for it was of the finest style of french architecture then in its decay the house had been very little inhabited for some twenty or thirty years it had been found too small and incommodious for modern taste men had built themselves larger dwellings and although this had not been suffered to become actually dilapidated there were evident traces of neglect about it casements broken and distorted doors and gates on which unforbidden urchins carved grotesque faces and letters hardly less fantastical mouldings and cornices time-worn and mouldering and stones gathering lichen and soot with awful rapidity all was darkness along the front of that house no torches blazed before it no window shot forth a ray and the sinking moon cast a black shadow across the street and halfway up the wall on the other side nevertheless in one room of that house there were lamps lighted and a blazing fire upon the hearth wine too was upon the table rich and in abundance but yet it was hardly tasted for there were passions busy in that room more powerful than wine it was low in the ceiling the walls covered with hangings of leather which had once been gilt and painted with various devices but from which all traces of human handiwork had nearly vanished leaving nothing but a gloomy dark drapery in the wall which seemed rather to suck in than return the rays it was large and well proportioned however the great massy beams which any one could touch with their hand were supported by four stout stone pillars and the whole light centred in the middle of the room leaving a fringe as it were of obscurity all round if numbers could make any place gay that room or hall would have been cheerful enough for not less than seventeen or eighteen persons were collected there and many of them appeared persons of no inferior degree each was more or less armed and battle-axes maces and heavy swords lay round but a solemn gloomy stillness hung upon the whole party it was evidently no festal occasion on which they met 
The wine, as I have said, had no charms for them. Conversation had as little. One tall man sat before the chimney with his mailed arms crossed upon his chest, and his eyes fixed upon the flickering blaze in the fireplace. Another was seated near the table, drawing with the end of a straw wild fantastic figures on the board with some wine which had been spilled. Some dull men at a distance nodded, and others, with their hands upon their brows and eyes bent down, remained in heavy thought. At length one of them spoke. "'Tedious work, this,' he said. "'Action suits me best. I love not to lie like a spider at the bottom of his web, waiting till the fly buzzes into his nest. Here we have been five or six long days, and nothing done. I will not wait longer than tomorrow's sunrise, whatever you may say, Ralph.' The other, who was gazing into the fire, turned his head a little, answering in a gruff tone, "'I tell you, he is now in Paris. He arrived this very evening. We shall hear more anon.' The conversation ceased, for no one else took it up, and each of the speakers fell into silence again. Some quarter of an hour passed, and then the one who was at the table started and seemed to listen. There was certainly a step in the passage without, and the moment after there was a knock at the door. One of those within advanced and inquired who was there. "'Ich howd, answered a voice, and immediately the door was unlocked, and a ponderous bolt withdrawn. All eyes were now turned toward the entrance, with a look which I do not know how to describe, except by saying it was one of fierce expectation. At first the obscurity at the further side of the room prevented those who sat near the light from seeing who it was that entered, but a broad-chested, powerful man, wrapped in a crimson mantle, with a very large hood thrown back upon his shoulders, and on his head a plain brown barret cap, with a heron's feather in it, advanced rapidly toward the table, inquiring, "'Where is Actonville?' His face was deadly pale, and even his lips had lost their colour, but there was no emotion to be discovered by the movement of any feature. All was stern and resolute and keen. Here, said the man who had been sitting by the fire, rising as he spoke. The other advanced close to him and spoke something in a whisper. Actonville rejoined in the same low tone, and then the other answered louder. I have provided for all that. Thomas of Courthos will bear him a message from the king. Be quick, for he will soon be there. How got you the news, sir? asked Actonville. "'By the fool, to be sure, by the fool,' replied the other. "'It is all certain, though a fool told it.' "'The moon must be up,' said Actonville. "'Were it not better to do it as he returns?' "'He will have many more with him,' answered the man who had just entered, "'and the moon is down.' "'Oh, moon or no moon, many or few,' exclaimed the man who had been sitting at the table. "'Let us about it at once. "'Brave men fear no numbers, and only dogs are scared by the moon.' Some more conversation, brief, sharp, and eager, sometimes in whispers, sometimes aloud, occupied a space, perhaps, of three minutes, and then all was the bustle of preparation. Swords, axes, maces were taken up, and a few inquiries were made and answered. "'Are the horses all ready?' asked one. "'They only want unhooking,' replied another. "'The straw is piled up in both the rooms,' said a third. "'Shall I fire it now?' "'No, no, are you mad?' replied Actonville. "'Not till it is done.' "'Then I'll put the lantern ready,' replied the other. "'Where will you be, sir?' asked Actonville. "'Close at hand,' replied the man in the crimson mantle. "'But we lose time. "'Go out quietly, one by one, and leave the door open. "'Put out the lights, William of Courthouse. "'I have a lantern here, under my cloak.' "'The lights were immediately extinguished, "'and by the flickering of the fire, Eighteen shadowy forms were seen to pass out of the room like ghosts. Through the long passage from the back to the front of the house they went as silently as their arms would permit, and then gliding down the irregular side of the road one by one, they disappeared from their rank to lay in wait in what the prophet calls the thievish corners of the streets. The man who had last joined them remained alone, standing before the fire, his arms were crossed upon his chest. A lantern which he had carried stood on the ground by his side, and his eyes were fixed upon a log from which a small thin flame, 
yellow at the base and blue at the top rose up wavering fitfully he watched it for some five or six minutes suddenly it leaped up and vanished ha said that dark stern man and turned him to the door ere he reached it there was a loud outcry from without a cry of pain and strife he paused and trembled what was in his bosom then god only knows man never knew End of chapter 24chapter twenty five of agnes sorrel by g p r james this librivox recording is in the public domain chapter twenty five the gates of the hotel barbette formerly the hotel montaigne opened instantly to the duke of orleans and he was kept but a moment in the great hall ere the queen gave an order for his admission although still suffering from illness he found the beautiful but vindictive isabella in bed but that formed no objection in those days to the reception of visitors by a lady of even queenly rank and after having embraced his fair sister-in-law he sat down by her bedside and the room was soon cleared of the attendants you have received my note louis she said laying her hand tenderly upon his for there is every reason to believe that the duke of orleans was the only one toward whom she ever entertained any sincere affection i did sweet isabella answered the duke and i came at once to see what was your will how many men brought you with you asked the queen i hope there is no foolhardiness orleans oh in paris i have plenty replied the duke hard upon five hundred the rest i lived with valentine aborte for she is going to chateau thierry to gather all her children together how many i have brought hither to-night good faith isabella not many two men on horseback and half a dozen on foot imprudent man exclaimed the queen do you not know that burgundy is here oh yes answered the duke of orleans he supped with me this night quite in a tranquil way be not deceived be not deceived louis of orleans answered the queen who can feign friendship and mean enmity so well as john of burgundy and i tell you that to my certain knowledge he is cabaling against you even now your life is never safe when you are near him unless you be surrounded by your men-at-arms well then we do not play an equal game replied the duke for his life is as safe with me as with his dearest friend did he know that you were coming hither asked the queen with an anxious look assuredly replied the duke but then he added with a gay laugh he suspected i fancy from his questions that i was going elsewhere first though i told him i was not where where demanded the queen to madame de giac's replied the duke of orleans with a look of arch meaning the serpent muttered isabella and you have not been assuredly not replied her brother-in-law then he knows you have come here said isabella thoughtfully and the way back will be dangerous you shall not go orleans till you have sent for a better escort well kind sister if it will give you ease it shall be done replied the duke i will tell one of my men to bring me a party of horse from the hotel let it be large enough said the queen emphatically the duke smiled and left the room in search of his attendants but neither of his two squires could be found heaven knows where they were or what they were doing but the queen had a court of very pretty ladies at the hotel barbette who were not scrupulous of granting their conversation to gay young gentlemen a young german page fair-haired and gentle lolled languidly on a settle in the great hall but he knew little of paris and the duke of orleans sent for one of his footmen and ordered him to take one of the squire's horses return to the hotel d'orleans and bring up twenty lances within an hour he then went back to the chamber of the queen and sat conversing with her for about ten minutes when they were interrupted by the entrance of one of her ladies who brought intelligence that a messenger from the hotel st paul had arrived demanding instant audience of the duke who is he asked isabella gazing at the lady her suspicions evidently all awake how did they know at the hotel st paul that his highness was here it is thomas of courthose your majesty 
replied the lady, and he says he has been at the Hôtel d'Orléans, whence he was sent hither. "'By your good leave, then, fair sister, we will admit him,' said the duke, and in a minute or two after, Thomas of Courthose, one of the immediate attendants of the king, was ushered into the room. He was not a man of pleasing aspect, dark-haired, down-looked, and with the eyes so close together as to give almost the appearance of a squint. But both the duke and the queen knew him well, and suspicion was lulled to sleep. Approaching the Duke of Orléans with a lowly reverence, first to the queen and then to him, the man said, "'I have been commanded by his royal majesty to inform your highness that he wishes to see you instantly, on business which touches nearly both you and himself.' i will obey at once replied the duke tell my people as you pass to get ready i will be in the court in five minutes stay orleans stay cried the queen as the man quitted the room you had better wait for your escort dear brother the duke only laughed at her fears however representing that his duty to the king called for his immediate obedience and adding i shall go safer by that road than any other they know that I came hither late, and will conclude that I shall return by the same way. If Burgundy intends to play me any scurvy trick, arrest, imprison, or otherwise maltreat me, he will post his horsemen in that direction, and by going round I shall avoid them. Nay, nay, Isabella, example of disobedience to my king shall never be set by Louis of Orléans. The queen saw him depart with a sigh but the duke descended to the court without fear and spoke gaily to his attendants whom he found assembled we do not know what to do sir said one of the squires stepping forward leonard has taken away one of the horses and now there is but one beast to two squires let his master mount him and the other jump up behind said the duke laughing did you never see two men upon one horse in the meantime, while his own mule was brought forward, and setting his foot in the stirrup, the duke seated himself somewhat slowly. Then, looking up to the sky, he said, The moon is down, and it has become marvellous dark. If you have torches, light them. About two minutes were spent in lighting the torches, and then the gates of the Hôtel Barbette were thrown open. The two squires on one horse went first, and the duke on his mule came after the German page following close, with his hand resting on the embossed crupper, while two men with torches lighted walked on either side. The porter at the gates looked after them for a moment as they took their way down the street of the old temple, and then drew to the heavy leaves and barred the gates for the night. All was still and silent in the street, and the little procession walked on at a slow pace for some two hundred yards. The torchlight then seemed to flash upon some object suddenly, which the horse bearing the two squires had not before seen, for the beast started, plunged, and then dashed violently forward down the street, nearly throwing the hindmost horseman to the ground. The duke spurred forward his mule somewhat sharply, but he had not gone a dozen yards when an armed man darted out from behind the dark angle of the neighbouring house. Another rushed out almost at the same moment from one of the deep, arched gateways of the time, and a number more were seen hurrying up, with the torchlight flashing upon cuirasses, battle-axes, and maces. Two of the light-bearers cast down their torches and fled. A third was knocked down by a rush of men coming up, and at the same moment a strong, armed hand was laid upon the Duke of Orléans' reign. The dauntless prince spurred on his mule against the man who held it, without attempting to turn his head, and it was seen that he still doubted that he was the real object of attack, for while the assassin shouted loudly, "'Kill him! Kill him!' he raised his voice loud above the rest, exclaiming, "'How now! I am the Duke of Orléans!' "'Tis him we want!' cried a deep voice close by, and as the duke put his hand to the hilt of his sword, a tremendous blow of an axe fell upon his wrist, cutting through muscle and sinew and bone. The next instant he was struck heavily on the head with a mace, and hurled backward from the saddle. But even then there was one found faithful. The young German boy who followed cast himself instantly upon the body of his lord, to shield him from the blows that were falling thick upon him. 
but it was all in vain the battle-axe and the mace terminated the poor lad's existence in a moment his body was dragged from that of the prostrate prince and a blow with a spiked iron club dashed to pieces the skull of the gay and gallant louis of orleans shouts and cries of various kinds had mingled with the fray but after that last blow fell there came a sudden silence three of the torches were extinguished the bearers were fled one faint light only flickered on the ground throwing a red and fitful glare upon the bloody bodies of the dead and the grim fierce countenances of the murderers in the midst of that silence a man in a crimson mantle and hood came quickly forward bearing a lantern in his hand the assassins showed no apprehension at his presence and holding the light to the face of the dead man he gazed on him for an instant with a stern hard unchanged expression and then said it is he perhaps some convulsive movement crossed the features from which real life had already passed away for that stern gloomy man snatched a mace from the hand of one standing near and struck another heavy blow upon the head of the corpse saying out with the last spark there were some eight or ten persons immediately round the spot where the prince had fallen but others were scattered at a little distance up and down the street suddenly a voice cried hark and the sound of a horse's feet was heard trotting quick away cried the man in the red mantle fire the house and disperse you know your roads away then came a distant cry as if from the gates of the queen's palace of help help murder murder but the next moment it was almost drowned in a shout of fire fire dark volumes of smoke began to issue from the windows of the hotel notre dame and flashes of flame broke forth upon the street while a torrent of sparks rushed upward into the air all around the scene of the murder became enveloped in vapour and obscurity with the red light tinging the thick heavy wreaths of smoke and serving just to show figures come and go still increasing in number and gathering round the fatal spot in a small agitated crowd but the actors in the tragedy had disappeared now here now there one or another might have been seen crossing the bloody-looking haze of the air and making for some of the various streets that led away from the place of the slaughter till at length all were gone and nothing but horrified spectators of their bloody handiwork remained few if any remained to look at the burning house and none attempted to extinguish the flames for the cry had already gone abroad that the duke of orleans was murdered and the multitude hurried forward to the place where he lay those who did stop for an instant before the hotel notre dame remarked a quantity of lighted straw borne out from the doors and windows by the rush of the fire and some of them heard the quick sound of hoofs at a little distance as if a small party of horse had galloped away from the back of the building few thought it needful however to inquire for or pursue the murderers a sort of stupor seemed to have seized all but one of those who arrived the first he was a poor mechanic and seeing an armed man with a mace in his hand glide across the street he followed him with a quick step traced him through several streets paused in fear when the other paused turned when he turned and dogged him till he entered the gates of the hotel d'artois the residence of the duke of burgundy in the meanwhile the body of the unhappy prince and that of the poor page who had sacrificed his life for him were carried into a church hard by the news spread like lightning through the whole town neighbour told it to neighbour many were roused from their sleep to hear the tidings and agitation and tumult spread through paris every sort of vague alarm every sort of wild rumour was received and encouraged the queen isabella of bavaria horrified and apprehensive caused herself to be placed in a litter and carried to the hotel st paul a number of loyal noblemen believing the king's own life in danger armed themselves and their followers and turned the court of the palace into a fortress but the followers of the deceased duke remained for some hours almost stupefied with terror and only recovered themselves to give way to rage and indignation which produced many a disastrous consequence in after days in the meantime the church of the white friars was not deserted 
the brethren themselves gathered round the dead bodies and with tapers lighted and the solemn organ playing chanted all night the services of the dead high nobles and princes too flocked into the church with heavy hearts and agitated minds the duke of bourbon and the venerable duke of berry were the first then came the king of navarre then the duke of burgundy and then the king of sicily who had arrived in paris only the preceding morning all were profuse of lamentations and of execrations against the murderers but none more so than the duke of burgundy who declared that never in the city of paris had been perpetrated so horrible and sad a murder he could even weep too but while the words were on his lips and the tears were in his eyes some one pulled him by the cloak and turning round his head he saw one of his most familiar servants nothing was said but there was a look in the man's eyes which demanded attention and after a moment or two the duke retired with him to the chapel of st william they have taken one of those suspected of conniving at the murder whispered the man which who who is he asked the duke eagerly no one your highness knows replied the man gazing in the duke's face though the chapel was very dark he is a young gentleman said to be the duke's secretary monsieur charost de bracy the duke stamped with his foot upon the ground saying with an oath that may ruin all see that he be freed as soon as possible before he is examined it cannot be done i fear rejoined the man in the same low tone he is in the hands of william de tignonville de prevost but cannot the murder be cast on him sir they say he and the duke were heard disputing loud this night and that on the way to the hotel barbette he suddenly turned and rode away from his royal master folly and nonsense said the duke impatiently and then he fell into a fit of thought adding in a musing tone this must be provided for but not so not so well we will see leave him where he is he must be taught silence if he would have safety End of chapter twenty five Chapter twenty six of Agnes Sorrel by G. P. R. James. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Chapter twenty six. We must now once more follow the course of Jean Charost. It has been said that when the gates of the house of Madame de Gillac, by a contrivance very common at that time in Paris for saving the trouble of the porter and the time of the visitor, but with which he was unacquainted, rolled back on their hinges without the visible intervention of any human being, he saw several persons running up the street in the direction which he himself intended to take. Man has usually a propensity to hurry in the same course as others and springing on his horse's back jean charost spurred on somewhat more quickly than he might have done had he seen no one running as he advanced he saw in the direction of the porte barbette a lurid glare beginning to rise above the houses and glimmering upon large rolling volumes of heavy smoke the next instant loud voices shouting reached his ear but with the cries of fire he fancied there were mingled cries of murder on up the street he dashed and soon found himself at the corner of the street of the old temple but he could make nothing of the scene before his eyes the house in front was on fire in various places and would evidently soon be totally destroyed and though there were a number of people in the street running hither and thither in wild disorder few stopped before the burning building even for a single moment and most hurried past at once to a spot somewhat further down the street all who had collected as yet were on foot though he could see a horse further up toward the city gate but while he was looking round him with some wonder and hesitating whether he should first go on to inquire what was the matter where the principal crowd was collected or ride at once to the hotel barbette a man in the royal liveries with a halbert in his hand crossed and looked hard at him suddenly another came running up the street completely armed except the head which was bare the man with the halbert instantly stopped the other apparently asking some question and jean charost saw the armed man point toward him exclaiming he must be one of them he must be one of them 
the next moment they both seized his bridle together but they did not both retain their hold very long for while he of the halbert demanded his name and business there threatening to knock his brains out if he did not answer instantly the armed man slipped by on the other side of the horse turned round the corner of the street and was lost to sight jean charost's name and business were soon explained but still the man kept hold of his bridle two or three persons gathered round and all apparently conceded that a great feat had been accomplished in making a prisoner although there was no suspicious circumstance about him except his being mounted on horseback when all the rest were on foot they continued to discuss what was to be done with him till a large body of people came rushing down from the hotel barbette among whom the young secretary recognised one of the squires and two of the lackeys of the duke of orleans to them jean charost instantly called saying there is something amiss here pray explain to these men who i am for they are stopping me without cause and i cannot proceed to join his highness why did you leave him so suddenly an hour ago cried the young squire in a sharp tone you came with us from the hotel d'orleans and disappeared on the way you had better keep him my friends till this bloody deed is inquired into then turning to jean charost again he added do you not know that the duke has been foully murdered the intelligence fell upon the young man's ear like thunder he sat motionless and speechless on his horse while the party from the hotel barbette passed on and he only woke from the state of stupefaction into which he was cast to find his horse being led by two or three persons through the dark and narrow streets of paris whither he knew not his first distinct thoughts however were of the duke rather than himself and he inquired eagerly of his captors where and how the horrible deed had been perpetrated they were wise people and exceedingly sapient in their own conceit however the queen's servant laughed with a sneer saying no no we won't tell you anything to prepare you for your examination before the prévôt he will ask you questions and then you will answer him otherwise he will find means to make you we are not here to reply to your interrogatories the sapient functionary listened to no remonstrances, and finding his efforts vain, Jean Charost rode on in silence, sometimes tempted, indeed, to draw his sword, which had not yet been taken from him, and run the man with the halbert through the body, but he resisted the temptation. At length, emerging from a narrow street, they came into a little square, on the opposite side of which rose a tall and gloomy building without any windows apparent on the outside except in the upper stories of two large towers flanking a low dark archway all was still and silent in the square no light shone from the windows of that gloomy building but straight toward the great gate they went and one of the men rang a bell which hung against the tower a loud ferocious barking of dogs was immediately heard but in an instant the gates were opened by a broad-shouldered, bow-legged man, who looked gloomily at the visitors, but said nothing. And the horse of Jean Charost was led in, while the porter drove back four savage dogs, which would fain have sprung at the prisoner, and instantly closed the gates. The archway in which the party now stood extended some thirty feet through the heavy walls, and at the other end appeared a second gate, exactly like the first, but the porter made no movement to open it, nor asked any questions, but suffered the queen's servant to go forward and ring another bell. That gate was opened, but not so speedily as the other, and a man holding a lantern appeared behind, with another personage at his side, dressed in a striped habit of various colours, which made Jean Charost almost believe that they had a, buff that they had a buffoon even there. From the first words of the queen's servant, however, he learned that this was the jailer, and his face itself, hard, stern, and bitter, was almost an announcement of his office. Nevertheless, he made some difficulty at first in regard to receiving a prisoner from hands unauthorized, but at length he consented to detain the young secretary till he could be interrogated by the prévôt. The captors then retired and the jailers made their captive dismount and enter a small room near, where sat a man in black writing. His name, his station, his occupation was immediately taken down, 
and then one of those harpies called the valet de Géole, was called who instantly commenced emptying his pockets of all they contained took from him his sword dagger and belt and even laid his hands upon a small jewelled fermeil or clasp upon his hood the young man offered no resistance of course but when he found himself stripped of money and everything valuable he was surprised to hear a demand made upon him for ten livres this is a most extraordinary charge he said looking in the face of the jailer who stood by though it was the valet who made the demand why so boy asked the man gruffly it is the jail it's due you said your name was jean charost baron de bracy a baron pays the same as a count or a countess but how can i pay anything when you have taken everything from me asked the young secretary oh you are mistaken said the jailer with a rude laugh i see you are a young bird all that has been taken from you except the fees of the jail will be restored when you go out if you ever do but you must consent with your own tongue to my taking the money from my due otherwise we shall put you to sleep in the ditch where you pay half fees and i take them without asking take it take it said jean charost with a feeling of horror and dismay that made him feel faint and sick treat me as well as you can and take all that is your right if more be needed you can have it the jailer nodded his head to the valet who grinned at the prisoner saying we will treat you very well depend upon it you shall have a clean cell with a bed four feet wide and only two other gentlemen in it both of them of good birth though one is in for killing a young market woman he will have his head off in three days and then you will have only one companion cannot i be alone asked jean charost the law is three prisoners to one bed replied the valet of the jail and we can't change the custom unless you choose to pay he added four deniers a night for a single bed and two for the place on which it stands willingly willingly cried the young man who now saw that money would do much in a jail as well as elsewhere can i have a cell to myself to be sure there is plenty of room replied the jailer if you choose to pay the dues for two other barons you can have the space they would occupy jean charost consented to everything that was demanded the fees were taken by the jailer the rest of the money found upon him was registered by the man in black who seemed a mere automaton and then he was led away by the valet of the jail to a small room not very far distant on the way and for a minute or two after his arrival in the cell the valet continued to give him rapid but clear information concerning the habits and rules of the place he found that if he attempted to escape the law would hold him guilty of whatever crime he was charged with that he could neither have writing materials nor communicate with any friends without an application to one of the judges at the chatelet that all the law allowed a prisoner was bread and water and in the end that everything could be procured by money except liberty jean charost hesitated not then to demand all he required and the valet on returning to the jailer after having thrice locked and thrice bolted the door informed his master that the young prisoner was a good orange which probably meant that he was easily sucked End of chapter twenty six Chapter twenty seven of Agnes Sorrel by G. P. R. James. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Chapter twenty seven. Do you recollect visiting the booth of a cutler? In that very booth, the day after the arrest of Jean Charost, might be seen the intelligent countenance of the deformed boy, Petit Jean, peering over the large board on which the wares were exposed, and saluting the passers by with an arch smile, to which was generally added an invitation to buy some of the articles of his father's manufacture the race gamma is of very ancient date in the city of paris where witty and mischievous imps were found to have existed in great abundance as far as recorded history can carry us it must be owned too that a touch of the gamma was to be found in poor petit jean although his corporeal infirmities prevented him from displaying his genius in many of the active quips and cranks in which other boys of his own age indulged 
on the present occasion when he was eager to sell the goods committed to his charge he refrained as far as possible from any of his sharp jests so long as there was any chance of gaining the good will of a passing customer and the gamin's spirit fumed off in a metaphor but a surly reply or cold inattention generally drew from him some tingling jest which might have procured him a drubbing had not his infirmities proved a safeguard what do you lack messire behu he cried as a good fat courier rolled past the booth sure with some customers you have your knives must be all worn out here buy one of these they are so sharp it would save you a crown a day in time and your customers would not have to wait like a crowd at a morality the good-natured courier paused and bargained for a knife for flattery will sometimes soften even well-tanned hides and petit jean contented with his success assailed a thin pale sanctimonious-looking man who came after in much the same manner but this personage scowled at him saying no no boy no more knives from your store the last i bought bent double before two days were over that's the fault of your cheese peter Quim, answered the boy sharply it served don joaquin the canon of st laurent worse than it served our knife for it broke all his teeth out of his head ask him if it didn't you lie you little monster said the cheesemonger irritably it was as bad iron as ever was sharpened not so hard as your heart perhaps answered petit jean but it was a great deal sharper than your wit and if your cheese had not been like a millstone it would have gone through it the monger of cheeses walked on the faster for two or three women having come up all of whom but one an especial friend of his own were laughing at the saucy boy's repartee ah dear dame Maturine, cried petit jean addressing the grave lady buy a new bodkin for your cloak it wants one sadly just to pin it up with a jaunty air don't matter in me monkey cried the old woman walking on after the cheesemonger and the boy winking his eye to the other women exclaimed aloud well you are wise a new bodkin would only tear a hole in the old rag she wore that cloak at her great-grandmother's funeral when she was ten years old and that is sixty years ago so it may well fear the touch of younger metal well you rogue what have you to say to me said a young and pretty woman who had listened much amused only that i have nothing good enough for your beautiful eyes answered the boy promptly though you have but to look at the things to make them shine as if the sun were beaming on them this hit told well and the pretty bourgeoise very speedily purchased two or three articles from the stall she had just paid her money when martin grille with a scared and haggard air entered the booth and asked the boy where his father was without any previous salutation why what is the matter with you martin asked petit jean affectionately you come in like a stranger and don't say a word to me about myself or yourself and look as wild as the devil in a mystery what is it you want with my father in such a hurry i am vexed and frightened petit jean replied poor martin with a sigh i am quite at my wit's end who never was at my wit's end before your father may help me but you can't help me at all my boy oh you don't know that answered the other i can help more than people know why i have sold more things for my father in three hours since he went up to the celestin to see the body of the duke of orleans than he ever sold in three days before ah the poor duke the poor duke cried martin with a deep sigh well well come sit down said petit jean my father will be in presently and in the meanwhile i'll play you a tune with my new violin and you will see how i can play now martin grille seated himself with an absent look leaned his forehead upon his hands and seemed totally to forget everything around him in the unwonted intensity of his own thoughts but the boy creeping under the board on which the wares were displayed brought forth an instrument of no very prepossessing appearance tried its tune with his thumb as if playing on a guitar and then seating himself at martin grille's knee put the instrument to his deformed shoulder there be some to whom music comes as by inspiration all other arts are more or less acquired but those in whom a fine sensibility to harmony is implanted by nature not unfrequently leap over even mechanical difficulties and achieve at once 
because they have conceived already. Music must have started from the heart of Apollo, as wisdom from the head of Jove, without a childhood. Little had been the instruction, few, scanty, and from an incompetent teacher, the lessons which that poor, deformed boy had received. But now, when the bow in his hand touched the strings, it drew from them sounds such as a de berio or a road might have envied him the power of educing. And fixing his large, lustrous eyes upon his cousin's face, he seemed to speak in music from his own spirit to the spirit of his hearer. Whether he had any design, and if so, what that design was, I cannot tell. Perhaps he did not know himself, but certain it is that the wandering, wavering composition that he framed on the moment seemed to bear a strange reference to Martin's feelings. First came a harsh crash of the bow across all the strings, a broad, bold discord, then a deep and gloomy phrase, entirely along the lower notes of the instrument, simple and melodious, but without any attempt at harmony. Then, enriching itself as it went on, the air deviated into the minor, with sounds exquisitely plaintive, till Martin Grille almost fancied he could hear the voices of mourners, and exclaimed, "'Don't, Jean, don't! I cannot bear it!' But still the boy went on, as if triumphing in the mastery of music over the mind, and gradually his instrument gave forth more cheerful sounds, not light, not exactly gay, for every now and then a flattened third brought back a touch of melancholy to the air. But still one could have fancied the ear caught the distant notes of angels singing hope and peace to man. The effect on Martin Grille was strange. It cheered him, but he wept, and the boy, looking earnestly in his face, said with a strange confidence, Do not tell me I have no power, Martin. Mean, deformed, and miserable as I am, I have found out that I can rule spirits better than kings, and have a happiness within me over which they have no sway. You are not the first I have made weep, so now tell me what it is you want with my father. Perhaps I may help you better than he can. It was not you made me weep, you foolish boy, said Martin Grille, but it was the thought of the bloody death of, of the poor Duke of Orléans, so good a master and so kind a man and then I began to think how his terrible fate might have expiated, through the goodness of the Blessed Virgin, all his little sins, and how the saints and the angels would welcome him. I almost thought I could hear them singing, and it was that made me cry. But as to what I want with your father, it was in regard to my poor master, Monsieur de Bracy, a kind, good young man, and a gallant one, too. They have arrested him and thrown him into prison, a set of fools, accusing him of having compassed the prince's death, when he would have laid down his life for him at any time. But all the people at the hotel are against him, for he is too good for them a great deal, and I want somebody powerful to speak in his behalf, otherwise they may put him to the torture and cripple him for life, just to make him confess a lie, as they did with Paul Laroche, who never could walk without two sticks after. Now I know your father is one of the Duke of Burgundy's men, and that duke will rule the Russe now, I suppose. A strong spirits seek strong spirits, said the boy thoughtfully, and perhaps my father might do something with the duke. But Martin, he continued after a short and silent pause, do not you have anything to do with the Duke of Burgundy? He will not help you. I do not know what it is put such thoughts in my head, but the king's brother had an enemy. The king's brother is basely murdered. His enemy still lives heartily, and it is not him I would ask to help a man falsely accused. Stay a little. They took me three days ago to play before the king of Navarre, and I am to go today with my instrument to play before the queen of Sicily. I think I can help you, Martin, if she will but hear me. This murder, perhaps, may put it all out, for she was fond of the duke, they tell me, but I will send her word through some of her people when I go, that I have got a dirge to play for his highness that is dead. She will hear that, perhaps, only tell me all about it. Martin Grille's story was somewhat long, but as the reader already knows much that he told in a desultory sort of way to his young cousin, and the rest is not of much importance to this tale, we will pass over his account, which lasted some twenty minutes, 
and had not been finished five when Caboche himself entered the booth in holiday attire. His first words showed Martin Grille the good sense of Petit Jean's advice, not to speak to his father in favour of Jean Charost. Aho, Martin! cried Caboche in a gruff and almost savage tone. So your gay duke has got his brains knocked out at last for his fine doings. For which of his doings has he been so shamefully murdered? asked Martin Grille, with as much anger in his tone as he dared to evince. What, don't you know? exclaimed Caboche. Why, it is in everybody's mouth that he has been killed by Albert de Chauny, whose wife he carried off and made a harlot of. I say, well done, Albert de Chauny, and I would have done the same if I had been in his place. Then Monsieur de Bracy is proved innocent, said Martin Grille eagerly. I know nothing about that, answered Caboche. He may have been an accomplice, you know, but that's no business of mine. I went up to see the Duke lie at the Celestin. There was a mighty crowd there of men and women, but they all made way for Caboche. He makes a handsome corpse, though his head is so knocked about. But he'll not take any more men's wives away, and now we shall have quiet days, I suppose, though I don't see what good quiet does, for whether the town is peaceful or not, men don't buy or sell nowadays half as much as they used to do. There was a certain degree of vanity in his tone, as he uttered the words, All made way for Caboche which was very significant, and his description of the appearance of the Duke of Orléans made Martin Grille shudder. He remained not long with his rough uncle, however, but after having asked and answered some questions, he took advantage of a moment when Caboche himself was busy in rearranging his cutlery and counting his money, to whisper a few words to Petit Jean regarding a meeting in the evening, and then parted from him, saying simply, Remember! End of chapter 27《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》
all the facts regarding the assassination of the duke of orleans which had been collected were read by the secretary from the papers before him and when he had done he added i find my lords that a young gentleman the secretary of the late duke who was not with him at the hotel barbette was arrested by one of her majesty's servants at the scene of the murder in very suspicious circumstances shortly after the crime was perpetrated is it your pleasure that he be brought before you assuredly replied the duke of berry i have seen the young gentleman and judged well of him i cannot think he had any share in this foul deed are there any of my poor nephew's household here who can testify concerning him several your highness answered the secretary they are in the ante-room let them also be called in said the duke of berry and in a minute or two jean charost heavily ironed was brought to the end of the table and a number of the duke of orleans officers the jester and the chaplain appeared behind them the duke of berry gazed at the young man sternly but with jean charost the first feelings of grief horror and alarm had now given way to a sense of indignation at the suspicions entertained against him and he returned the duke's glance firmly and unshrinkingly with a look of manly confidence which sat well even upon his youthful features well young gentleman said the duke of berry at length what have you to say for yourself in what respect my lord asked jean charost still keeping his eyes upon the duke for the stare of all around was painful to him in answer to the charge brought against you answered the duke of berry i know of no charge your highness answered jean charost i only know that while proceeding according to the orders of my late beloved lord to rejoin him at the hotel barbette i was seized by some men at one corner of the rue barbette just as i was pausing to look at a house in flames and at a crowd which i saw further down the street and then without almost any explanation i was hurried to prison and that this morning i have been brought hither with these fetters on my limbs which do not become an innocent french gentleman it is right you should hear the charge answered the duke is the man who first apprehended him here present the tall stout lackey of the queen who had been the first to seize the young secretary's bridle now bustled forward full of his own importance and related not altogether without embellishment his doings of the preceding night he told how on learning from the flying servants of the duke of orleans that their lord had been attacked by armed men in the street he had snatched up a halbert and run to his assistance how he arrived too late and then addressed himself to apprehend the murderers he said that jean charost was not riding in any direction but sitting on his horse quite still as if he had been watching from a distance the deed just done and that a gentleman of good repute who had hastened like himself to give assistance had pointed out the young secretary as one of the band of assassins and even aided to apprehend him he added various particulars of no great importance in regard to jean charost's manner and words with the view of making out a case of strong suspicion against him you hear the charge said the duke of berry when the man had ended what have you to say i might well answer nothing your highness replied jean charost for so far as i can see there is no charge against me except that i checked my horse for an instant to look at a crowd and a house in flames nevertheless if you will permit me i will ask this man a question or two as it may tend to bring some parts of this dark affair to light ask what you please answered the duke and jean charost turned to the servant and demanded it must be confessed in a sharp tone was the man who pointed me out to you armed or unarmed completely armed except the head replied the lackey looking a little confused what had he in his hand demanded jean charost a mace i think answered the man an iron mace did he tell you how he came completely armed in the streets of paris at that hour of the night asked jean charost he said he came forth at the cries answered the servant how long may it take to arm a man completely except the head asked the young gentleman i don't know answered the servant i don't bear arms i do answered jean charost and so do these noble lords nor is it probable that a man could shuffle on his armour in time to be there on the spot so soon unless he were well armed before now tell me what was this man's name the man hesitated but the duke of berry thundered from the head of the table 
answer at once sir you have said he was a gentleman of good repute you must therefore know him what was his name william of courthose answered the man the brother of the king's valet de chambre where is he answered the duke of berry so sternly that the man became more and more alarmed judging that his stupid activity might not prove so honourable to himself as he had expected i do not know rightly your highness he replied his brother told me to-day he had gone to artois there was a silence all through the room at this announcement jean charost asked no more questions several of the council looked meaningly in each other's faces and the duke of berry gazed thoughtfully down at the table the chaplain of the late duke of orleans however and seigneur andre his fool moved round and got behind the prince's chair the former bent his head and said a few words in a low tone and the duke instantly looked up saying it seems monsieur de bracy that there was a quarrel between yourself and my unhappy nephew you were heard speaking loud and angrily in his apartments you left him half way to the hotel barbette explain all this there was no quarrel my lord replied jean charost there could be no quarrel between an humble man like myself and a prince of the blood royal his highness reproved me for something i had done amiss and his voice was certainly loud when he did so he pardoned me however on my apology took me with him on his way to the hotel barbette sent me to deliver a letter and receive an answer and commanded me to rejoin him at her majesty's house which i was on the way to do when i was arrested what was the cause of his reproving you asked the duke of berry to whom did he send you with a letter and where did you pass the time from the moment you left him to the moment of your arrest you had better monsieur de bracy give a full account of your whole conduct from the time of your arrival in paris till the time of your apprehension jean charost looked down thoughtfully and his countenance changed to betray the secrets of the dead to plant a fresh thorn in the heart of the duchess of orleans already torn as it must be to explain how and why he had hesitated to obey his lord's commandments was what he would fain escape from at almost any risk and his confidence in his own innocence made him believe that his refusal could do him no material damage it will be better for yourself sir to be frank and candid said the duke of berry a few words may clear you of all suspicion i doubt it not your highness replied jean charost for as yet i see no cause for any were i myself alone concerned i would willingly and at once state every act of my own and every word i uttered but my lord in so doing i should be obliged to give also the acts and words of my noble master they were spoken to me in confidence as between a frank and generous prince and his secretary he is dead but that absolves me not from the faithful discharge of my duty toward him what he confided to me whither he sent me nay even more the very cause of his reproving me which involves some part of his own private affairs i will never disclose be the consequence what it may and i do trust that noble princes and honourable gentlemen will not require an humble secretary as i am to betray the secrets of his lord you are bound sir by the law to answer truly any questions that the king's council may demand of you said the king of navarre sternly if not we can compel you i think not my lord replied jean charost i know of no means which can compel an honourable man to violate a sacred duty aha shouted seigneur andre he does not know of certain bird cages we have in france to make unwilling warblers sing methinks one screw of the rack would soon make the pretty creature open its bill i think so too said the king of navarre setting his teeth and not at all well pleased with jean charost's reply we give you one more chance sir will you or will you not answer the duke of berry's questions if not we must try the extent of your obstinacy as he spoke he beckoned up to him the prévôt of paris who had entered the hall a few minutes before and spoke to him something in a whisper to which the other replied oh yes sir in the other chamber the screw will do it has often more power than the rack in the meantime a struggle had been going on in the breast of jean charost it is often very dangerous to commit oneself by words to a certain course of action so long as we keep a debate with ourselves within the secret council chamber of our own bosom 
we feel no hesitation in retracting an ill-formed opinion or a rash resolution but when we have called our fellow creatures to witness our thoughts or our determinations the great primeval sin of pride puts a barrier in our way and often prevents us going back even when we could do so with honour jean charost was as faulty as the rest of our race and perhaps it would be too much to say that pride had no share in strengthening his resolution but after a short pause he replied my lord the duke of berry take it not ill of me i beg your highness that i say any questions simply regarding myself i will answer truly and at once but none in any way affecting the private affairs of my late royal master will i answer at all we cannot suffer our authority to be set at naught said the duke of berry gravely and the king of navarre turning with a heavy frown to the prévot exclaimed remove him monsieur tignonville and make him answer jean charost turned very pale but he said nothing and two of the prévost's men laid their hands upon him and drew him from the end of the table at the same moment however another young man started forward with his face all in a glow exclaiming oh my lords my lords for pity's sake for your own honour's sake forbear he is as noble and as faithful a lad as ever lived well beloved of the prince whom we all mourn think you that he who will suffer torture rather than betray his lord's secrets will conspire his death it may be his own secrets he will not reveal said the duke of berry meddle not with what does not concern you cried the king of navarre sternly but jean charost turned his head as they were taking him from the room and exclaimed thank you de royen thank you that is noble and just he was scarcely removed when the duke of burgundy entered the great entrance and the king of sicily by a small door by the duke of berry the former was alone but the latter was followed by several of the officers of his household and in the midst of them appeared a young girl leaning on the arm of an elder woman dressed as a superior servant i heard that monsieur de bracy was under examination said louis of anjou looking round accused of being accessory to the murder is he not here he has retired with a friend said seigneur andre who thought it his privilege to intermeddle with all conversation the truth is fair cousin answered the king of navarre we have found him a very obstinate personage to deal with setting at naught the authority of the council and refusing to answer the questions propounded to him we have therefore been compelled to employ means which usually make recusants answer good god i hope not exclaimed the duke of anjou here is a young lady who can testify something in his favour he turned as he spoke towards the young girl who had followed him into the hall and who has more than once appeared upon the scene already she was deadly pale but those energies which afterwards saved france failed her not now she loosed her hold of the old servant's arm on which she had been leaning took a step forward and with her hands clasped exclaimed in god's name mighty princes forbear send a messenger if you would save your own peace and countermand your terrible order i know not why you have doomed an innocent man to torture but right sure i am that somehow he has brought such an infliction on his head by honesty and not by crime by keeping his faith not by breaking it they are made for each other said the king of navarre coldly they both speak in the same tone who is she cousin of sicily mademoiselle de saint gerin agnes sorrel answered the duke of anjou in a low tone one of the maids of honour to my wife but agnes took no notice of their half-heard colloquy and turning at once with quick decision and infinite grace toward the duke of burgundy who sat with his head leaning on his hand and his eyes fixed upon the table she exclaimed my lord the duke of burgundy i beseech you to interfere you know this young man you know he is faithful and true you know he refused to betray the secret of his lord even at your command and dared your utmost anger you know he is not guilty i do said the duke of burgundy rising and speaking in a hoarse hollow tone my lords he is not guilty i am sure suspend your order i beseech you send off to chatelet and let him a deep groan which seemed almost a suppressed cry appeared to proceed from a door half-way down the hall and swell through the room like the note of an organ 
he is not far off as you may hear said the duke of navarre with an indifferent manner tell them to stop if you please fair cousin the duke of burgundy had waited to ask no permission but was already striding toward the door he threw it sharply open and entered a small room having no exit except through the hall but he paused without speaking for a moment although before his eyes lay poor jean charost struck down upon a sort of iron bedstead and one of the prévost's men stood actually turning a wheel at the head which elongated the whole frame and threatened to tear the unfortunate sufferer to pieces for an instant the duke continued to gaze in silence as if desirous of seeing how much the unhappy young man could bear but jean charost uttered not a word that one groan of agony had burst from him on first feeling the peine forte et dure but now his resolution seemed to have triumphed over human weakness and with his teeth shut and his eyes closed he lay and suffered without a cry hold exclaimed the duke at length hold monsieur prévost unbind the young man he is not guilty the duke then slowly moved toward the door and closed it sharply while jean charost was removed from his terrible couch and a little water given him to drink he sat up and leaned his head upon his hand with his eyes still closed and not even seeming to see who had come to deliver him the prévost's men approached and attempted somewhat rudely to place upon him his coat and vest which had been taken off to apply the torture patience patience for a moment he said in the meanwhile the duke of burgundy had approached close to him and stood gazing at him with his arms crossed on his broad chest can you speak young man he said at length jean charost inclined his head a little further what was it you refused to tell the council asked the duke where the duke of orleans sent me last night answered the young man faintly faithful and true indeed said the duke of burgundy and then laying his broad hand upon the youth's aching shoulder he said in a low tone if you seek new service de bracy join me at mont in a week i will raise you to higher honour and remember this you have suffered was not my doing i came to deliver you now bring him in prévost as soon as he can bear it when the duke returned to the hall he found agnes sorrel standing by the side of the duke of berry although a chair had been placed for her by one of the gentlemen near for in those days there was the brilliant stamp of chivalrous courtesy on all french gentlemen in external things at least though since blotted out by the blood of lombal and marie antoinette your testimony as to his general character and uprightness my fair young lady said the duke of berry in a kindly tone will have the weight that it deserves with the council but we must have something more definite here we find that he was absent more than an hour from the duke's suite when my poor nephew had ordered him to rejoin him immediately and that this fearful assassination was committed during that period he refuses to answer as to where he was or what he was doing during that time we will put the question to him again he continued looking toward the door at which jean charost now appeared supported by two of the prévost's men and followed by that officer himself has he made any answer monsieur de tignonville not a word your highness replied the prévost noble lad said agnes sorrel in a low voice as if to herself and then continued raising her tone my lord the duke i will tell you where he was and what he was doing the duke of burgundy started and looked suddenly up but agnes went on although there be some men to whose characters certain acts are so repugnant that to suppose them guilty of them would be to suppose an impossibility and although i and the mighty prince there opposite can bear witness that such is the case even in this instance yet lest he should bring himself into danger by his faithfulness i will tell you what he will not speak for i am bound by no duty to refrain he was at the house of madame de gillac sent thither with a note by the duke of orleans she told me so herself this morning and lamented that a foolish trick she caused her servants to play him merely to see how he in his inexperience would escape from a difficulty had prevented him from rejoining his princely master though as she justly said her idle jest had most likely saved the young man's life skilfully turned muttered the duke of burgundy between his teeth and he looked up with a relieved expression of countenance 
"'If my lords doubt me,' continued the young girl, "'let them send for Madame de Giac herself.' "'Nay, nay, we doubt you not,' said the Duke of Burgundy. "'And so sure am I of the poor lad's innocence, "'although he offended me somewhat at Pithivier, "'that I propose he should be instantly liberated "'and allowed to retire. "'Open the door, but first clip the bird's wings,' "'said Seigneur André. "'He won't fly far, I fancy, after the trimming he has had.' The proposal of the Duke of Burgundy, however, was at once succeeded to, and Louis of Anjou, whose heart was a kindly one, notwithstanding some failings, leaned across the table towards Agnes Sorrel, saying, "'Take him with you, pretty maid, and try what you and the rest can do to comfort him till I come.' Agnes frankly held out her hand to Jean Charost, saying, "'Come, Monsieur de Brecy, you need rest and refreshment. Come, you shall have the sweetest music you have ever heard to cheer you.' and may have to thank the musician, too. With feeble and wavering steps, the young gentleman followed her from the room, and the moment the door was closed behind them, the King of Sicily turned to the prévôt, saying, "'This young man is clearly innocent, Monsieur de Tignonville. Do you not think so?' "'I have never thought otherwise, my lord,' replied the prévôt. "'Well, then, sir,' said the Duke of Berry, "'you have doubtless used all diligence, as we commanded this morning, "'to trace out those who have committed so horrible a crime "'as the assassination of the king's own brother.' "'All diligence have I used, noble lords and mighty princes,' said de Tignonville, "'advancing to the edge of the table, and speaking in a peculiarly stern and resolute tone of voice. "'But I have yet apprehended none of the assassins or their accomplices.' Nevertheless, such information have I received, as leads me to feel sure that I shall be able to place them before you ere many hours are over, if you will give me the authority of the council to enter and examine the houses of all the servants of the king and those of the princes, even of the blood royal, which, as you know, is beyond my power without your especial sanction. Most assuredly, replied the king of Sicily, begin with mine, if you please, search it from top to bottom, there are none of us here who would stand upon a privilege that might conceal the murderer of Louis of Orléans. There can be no objection, said the Duke of Berry. Search mine when you please, Monsieur le Prévôt. And mine, said the Duke of Bourbon. And mine, and mine, said several of the lords of the council. The Duke of Burgundy said nothing, but sat at the table with his face pale and his somewhat harsh features sharpened, though motionless. At length he started up from the table, and exclaimed in a sharp, quick tone, "'Come hither, Sicily, come hither, my fair uncle of Berry, I would speak a word with you.' And he strode toward the great door, followed by the two princes whom he had selected. Between the great door and that of an outer wall was a small vestibule, with a narrow staircase on one side, on the lower steps of which some attendants were sitting, when the duke appeared suddenly among them. "'Avoid,' he said, in a tone so loud and harsh as to scatter them at once like a flock of frightened sheep. He then closed both the doors, looked up the staircase, and drew the Duke of Berry toward him, whispering something in his ear in a low tone. The venerable prince started back, and gazed at him with a look of horror. "'It was a suggestion of the great enemy,' said Burgundy, and I yielded. "'What does he say? What does he say?' exclaimed the King of Sicily. "'That he—' "'He ordered the assassination,' answered the Duke of Berry, in a sad and solemn tone. "'I have lost two nephews in one night.' The Duke of Anjou drew back with no less horror in his face than that which had marked the countenance of the Duke of Berry, but he gave more vehement way to the feeling of reprobation which possessed him, expressing plainly his grief and indignation. He was brief, however, and soon laid his hand upon the lock to open the door of the council chamber again. "'Stay, stay, Louis,' said the Duke of Berry. "'Let us say nothing of this terrible truth till we have well considered what is to be done.' "'Done?' repeated the Duke of Burgundy, gazing at them both with a look of stern surprise, as if he had fully expected that his acknowledgment of the deed was to make it pass uninvestigated and unpunished and passing between his two relations, he too approached the door as if to go in. But the Duke of Berry barred his way. "'Go not into the council, fair nephew. It would not please me, nor any other person there, to have you among us now. 
The Duke of Burgundy gave him one glance, but answered nothing, and passing through the opposite door and the outer hall, mounted his horse and rode away, followed by his train. "'Let us break up the council, Louis,' said the Duke of Berry, "'and summon it for to-morrow morning. "'I will hie me home, and give the next hours to silent thought and prayer. "'You do the same, and let us meet to-morrow before the council reassembles.' "'My thoughts are all confused,' said the King of Sicily. "'Is it a dream, noble kinsman, a bloody and terrible dream? "'Well, you go in. I dare not go with you. "'I should discover all. Say I am sick. "'God knows it is true. Sick, very sick at heart.' "'Thus saying, he turned toward the staircase, "'and while the Duke of Berry returned to those he had left "'and broke up the council abruptly, "'the other prince proceeded slowly and gloomily "'toward his wife's apartments.' When he reached the top of the stairs, however, and opened the door at which they terminated, a strain of the most exquisite music met his ear, sweet, slow, and plaintive, but yet not altogether melancholy. Oh, how inharmonious can music sometimes be to the spirits, even of those who love it best! End of chapter 28《ハッピーバーデー》の歌い手の歌い手の歌い手の歌い手の歌い手の歌い手の歌い手の歌い手の歌い手の歌い手の歌い手の歌い手の歌い手の歌い手の歌い手の歌い手の歌い手の歌い手の歌い手の歌い手の歌い手の歌い手の歌い手の歌い手の歌い手の歌い手の歌い手の歌い手の歌い手の歌い手の歌い手の歌い手の歌い手の歌い手の歌い手の歌い手の歌い手の歌い There are such moments, but, thank God, they are few. Heavy in heart and spirit, indignant at the treatment he had received, with his mind full of grief and horror at the dreadful death of a prince he had well loved, and with a body weary and broken with the torture he had undergone, still Jean Charost found comfort and relief in the soothing tenderness of Agnes Sorrel, and of two or three girls somewhat older than herself, who lavished kindness and attention upon him as soon as they learned what had just befallen him. Some wine was brought, and fair hands gave it to him, and all that woman's pity could do was done. But Agnes had that morning learned the power of music, and running away into an ante-room, she exclaimed, "'Where is our sweet musician? Here, boy, here! Bring your instrument, and try and comfort him for whom you pleaded so hard just now. He needs it much.' Petit Jean rose instantly, paused for one moment to screw up a little one of the strings of his violin, and then followed into the inner room, giving a timid glance around over the fair young faces which were gathered about Jean Charost. But his eyes soon settled upon the sufferer with an inquiring look which put the question as plainly as in words, What is the matter with him? They have put him to the torture, whispered Agnes, and the boy, after a moment's pause, raised his instrument to his shoulder, and drew from it those sweet tones which the Duke of Anjou had heard. A short time before, he had played a dirge for the Duke of Orléans in the presence of the Queen of Sicily. I can hardly call it one of his own compositions, but rather one of his inspirations. It had been deep, solemn, almost terrible. But now the music was very different, sweet, plaintive, and yet with a mingling of cheerfulness every now and then, as if it would fain have been gay, but that something like memory oppressed the melody. It was like a spring day in the country, a day of early spring, when winter is still near at hand, though summer lies on before. To enjoy fine and elaborate music aright, we require some learning, a disciplined and practised ear. But those, I believe, who have heard the least music are more deeply affected by simple melodies. The sensations which Jean Charost experienced are hardly to be described, and when the boy ceased, he held out his hand to him, saying, Thank you, thank you, my young friend. You have done me more good than ever did leech to sick man. You have more to thank him for than that, said Agnes with a smile, which brought out upon her face not then peculiarly handsome, this latent, all-captivating beauty which was afterward her peril and her power. Had it not been for him, neither the Queen of Sicily nor I would have ever heard of your danger. 
how can that be asked jean charost i do not know him i never saw him nor i you replied the boy but tis the story of the lion and the mouse that my grandmother told me you have a lackey called martin grille he is my cousin you have been kind to him he has been kind to me and so the whole has gone in a round he gave me the first crown he could spare that helped me to buy this thing that speaks so sweetly when i tell it it said to that young lady and to the queen to have pity and they had pity on you and so that went in a round too but i must go now for i have to meet martin on the parvis and i shall be too late stay a moment said agnes you have had no reward oh yes i have replied the boy reward enough in setting him free nay but that was but justice she answered stay but a moment and i will tell the queen you are going one of the other girls accompanied her and two more dropped away before she returned another who was elder remained talking with petit jean and asking him many questions as to how he had acquired such skill in music the boy said god sent it that from his infancy he had always played upon any instrument he could get that one of the chanters of notre dame had taught him a little and a blind man who played on the cornemuse had given him some instruction that was all that he could tell but yet though he showed no learning he spoke of his beautiful art with a wild confidence and enthusiasm that the young denison of an artificial court could not at all comprehend at length agnes returned alone bearing a small silk purse in her hand which she gave to the boy saying the queen thanks you petit jean and bids you come to her again on sunday night to-day she can hear nothing that is not sad but she would fain hear some of your gayer music tell martin that i will be home soon said jean charost indeed i see not why i should not go with you now methinks i could walk to the hotel nay said agnes kindly you shall not go yet the king has given me charge of you and i will be obeyed it will be better that he tell your servant to come hither and inquire for madame de Busserol, our superintendent then when you have somebody with you you can go in more safety tell him so petit jean i must let madame de Busserol know however lest the young man be sent away i will tell her said the other maid of honour you stay with your friend agnes for i have got that rose in my embroidery to finish farewell monsieur de bracy and if i were a king i would hang all the torturers and burn all the racks and the man who first invented them in the middle of them and she tripped gaily out of the room the boy took his departure at the same time and jean charost and agnes were left alone together or nearly so for various people came and went during well nigh an hour the light soon began to fade and a considerable portion of their interview passed in twilight but their conversation was not such as to require any help from the looks it was very calm and quiet vain were it indeed to say that they did not take much interest in each other but both were very young and there are different ways of being young some are young in years some in mind some in heart agnes and jean charost were both older than their years in mind but perhaps younger than their years in heart and nothing even like a dream of love came over the thoughts of either they talked much of the late duke of orleans and jean charost told her a good deal of the duchess they talked too of madame de gillac and agnes related to him all the particulars of that lady's visit to her in the morning why she came i really do not know said the young girl although she is a distant cousin of my late father's there was never any great love between us and we parted with no great tenderness two days after i saw you at pithiviers her principal object seemed to be to tell me of your having visited her yesterday night and to mention the foolish trick she played upon you that she seemed very eager to explain i know not why jean charost mused somewhat gloomily there were suspicions in his breast he did not like to mention and the conduct and demeanour of madame de gillac toward himself were not what he could tell to her beside him i love not that madame de gillac he said at length i never loved her answered agnes i can remember her before her marriage and i loved her not then but still less do i esteem her now after having been more than ten days in her company it is strange monsieur de bracy is it not 
what it can be that gives children a sort of feeling of people's characters, even before they have any real knowledge of them. She was always very kind to me, even as a child, but I thought of her then just as I think of her now, though perhaps I ought to think worse, for since then she has said many things to me which I wish I had never heard. How so? answered Jean Charost eagerly. What has she said? Oh, much that I cannot tell, that I forget, answered Agnes with the colour mounting in her cheek, but her general conversation with me at least does not please me. She speaks of right and wrong, honesty and dishonesty, as if there were no distinctions between them, but those made by priests and lawyers. Everything, to her mind, depends upon what is most advantageous in the end, and that is the most advantageous, in her mind, which gives the most pleasure. She may be right, answered Jean Charost, if she takes the next world into account as well as this. But still I think her doctrines dangerous ones, and would not have any one to whom I wish well listen to them. I never do, answered Agnes, but she laughs at me when I tell her I would rather not hear, and tells me that all these things, and indeed the whole world, will appear to me as differently ten years hence as the world does now, compared with what it seemed to me as an infant. I do not think it, do you? I cannot tell, replied Jean Charost gravely, but I hope not, for I believe it would be better for us all could we always see the world in the eyes of childhood. True, it has changed much more to my own view within the last few months, but it has changed sadly, and I wish I could look upon it as I did before. That cannot be, however, and I suppose we are all, though men more than women, destined to see these changes and to pass through them. Men can bear them better than women, answered Agnes. A storm that breaks a flower or kills a butterfly does not bend an oak or scare an eagle. Well, we must endure whatever be our lot, but I often think, Monsieur de Bracy, that had the choice been mine, I would rather have been a peasant girl, not a serf, but a free farmer's daughter, with a tall white cap and a milk pail on my arm, than a lady of the court, with all these gauds and jewels about me. If my poor mother had lived, I should never have been here. Thus they rambled on for some time, till at length it was announced that Martin Grille was in waiting, and Jean Charost took his leave of his fair companion, pouring forth upon her at the last moment his thanks for all she had done to serve and save him. He was still stiff and weak, feeling as if every bone in his body had been crushed, and every muscle riven, but he contrived to reach the Hôtel d'Orléans with the assistance of Martin Grille. It was now quite dark, but in the vestibule, which has often been mentioned, a number of the unfortunate duke's servants and retainers were assembled, among whom Jean Charost perceived at once, by the dim light of the lanterns, the faces of the chaplain and Seigneur André. As soon as the latter saw him leaning feebly on his servant, he cried out with an exulting laugh, "'Ah, here comes the lame sparrow, who was once so pert!' "'Silence, fool!' cried a loud voice, "'or I will break your head for you.' And Juvenal de Royat came forward, holding out his hand to Jean Charost. "'Let us be friends, de Bracy,' he said. "'I have done you some wrong. I have acted foolishly, like a boy, but this last fatal night and this day have made a man of me, and I trust a wiser one than I have ever shown myself. Forget the past and let us be friends.' "'Most willingly.' replied Jean Charost, but I must get to my chamber, de Royaume, for, to say the truth, I can hardly drag my limbs along. Curses upon them, replied de Royaume, the cruel monsters, to torture a man for faithfulness to his lord. Let me help you, de Bracy, and putting his strong arm through that of Jean Charost, he aided him to ascend the stairs, and, with rough kindness, laid him down upon his bed. Here, during the evening, the young secretary was visited by various members of the household, though, to say truth, he was in no very fit state to entertain them. Lomellini came, with his soft and somewhat cunning courtesy, to ask what he could do for the young gentleman, doubting not that he would take a high place in the favour of the Duchess. The chaplain came to excuse himself for having suggested certain questions to the King's Council, and did it somewhat lamely. Old Monsieur Blaise visited him to express warm and hearty applause of the young man's conduct in all respects. Do your devoir as knightly in the field, my young friend, 
he said, as you have done it before the council, and you will win your golden spurs in the first battle that is stricken. Several of the late duke's knights, with whom Jean Charost had formed no acquaintance, came also to express their approbation, but praise fell upon a faint and heavy ear, for all he had passed through was not without consequences more serious than were at first apparent. Martin Grill overflowed with joy and satisfaction so sincere and radiant at the escape of his master, that Jean Charost could not help being touched by the good valet's attachment. But, as a true Frenchman, he was full of his own part in the young gentleman's deliverance, attributing to himself and his own dexterity all honour and praise for the result which had been attained. He perceived not for some time, in his self-gratulations, that Jean Charost could neither smile nor listen that a red spot came in his cheek, that his eyes grew bloodshot and his lip parched. At length, however, a few incoherent words alarmed him, and he determined to sit by his master's bedside and watch. Before morning he had to seek a physician, and then began all the follies of the medical art common in those times. For fourteen days, however, Jean Charost was utterly unconscious of whether he was treated well or ill, kindly or the reverse, and at the end of that time, when the light of reason returned, it was but faint and feeble. When first he became fully conscious, he found himself lying in a small room, of which he thought he recollected something. The light of an early spring day was streaming in through an open window, with the fresh air sweet and balmy, and the figure of a middle-aged man in a black velvet gown was seen going out of the door. The eyes of the young man turned from one object around him to another, there was a little writing-table, two or three wooden settles, a brazen sconce upon the wall, a well-polished floor of brick, an ebony crucifix, with a small fountain of holy water beneath it, all objects to which his eyes had been accustomed five or six months before. The figure he had seen going out, with its quiet, firm carriage and easy dignity, was one that he recollected well, and he asked himself, was he really still in the house of Jacques Coeur? and was the whole episode of agnes and juvenel de royan and the imprisonment and the torture and the duke of orleans nothing but a dream end of chapter twenty nine chapter thirty of agnes sorrel by g p r james this librivox recording is in the public domain chapter thirty a week a fortnight a month what are they in the long, long, boundless lapse of time? A point, a mere point on which the eye of memory hardly rests in the look-back of a lifetime, unless some of those marking facts which stamp particular periods indelibly upon the heart have given it a durable significance. Yet, even in so brief a space, how much may be done? Circumscribe it as you will, make it a single hour, tie down the passing of that hour to one particular spot, and in that hour, and on that spot, deeds may be written on eternity, affecting the whole earth at the time, affecting the whole human race for ever. No man can ever overestimate the value of the actions of an hour. Within the period of Jean Charost's sickness and recovery, up to the time when he fully regained his consciousness, events had been going on around him which greatly influenced not only his fate, but the fate of mighty nations. The operation, indeed, was not immediate, but it was direct and clear, and we must pause for a moment in the more domestic history which we are giving, to dwell upon occurrences of general importance, without a knowledge of which our tale could hardly be understood. In confusion and dismay, accompanied by few attendants, and in a somewhat stealthy manner, John of Burgundy fled from Paris, after making his strange and daring confession of the murder of his near kinsman and the brother of his king. When informed of the avowal, the Duke of Bourbon, his uncle, and many other members of the King's Council, expressed high displeasure that the Duke of Berry and the King of Sicily had suffered him to quit the door of the Council Chamber, except as a prisoner, and perhaps those two princes themselves saw the error they had committed. Had they acted boldly and decidedly upon the mere sense of justice and right, France would have been spared many a bloody hour, a disastrous defeat, and a long subjugation. But when the time of repentance came, repentance was too late. The Duke of Burgundy was gone, and the tools of his revenge, 
though he had boldly named them, had followed their lord. All had gone as criminals flying from justice, and such was their terror and apprehension of pursuit, that they threw down spiked balls in the snow behind them, as they went, to lame the horses of those who might follow. In the course of his flight, however, the Duke of Burgundy recovered in part his courage and a sense of his dignity. His situation was still perilous indeed, for he had raised enmity and indignation against him in the hearts of all the princes of the blood royal and of many of the noblest men in France. Nay more, he had alienated the most sincere and the most honourable of his own followers, while the king himself, just recovered from one of his lamentable fits of insanity, was moved by every feeling of affection, and by the sense of justice and of honour, to punish the shameless murderer of his brother. No preparation of any importance had been made to meet this peril, and the Duke of Burgundy was saved alone by the hesitating counsels of old and timid men, who still procrastinated till it was too late to act. In the meantime, the murderer determined upon his course. He not only avowed, but attempted to justify the act upon motives so wild, so irrational, so destitute of every real and substantial foundation, that they could not deceive a child, and no one even pretended to be deceived. He accused his unhappy victim of crimes that Louis of Orléans never dreamed of, of aiming at the crown, of practising upon the health and striking at the life of the king, his brother, by magical arts and devices. He did all, in short, to calumniate his memory, and to represent his assassination as an act necessary to the safety of the crown and the country. At the same time, he sent messengers to his good citizens of Flanders, to the vassals of Artois, to all his near relations, to all whom he could persuade or could command, to demand immediate aid and assistance against the vengeful sword which he fancied might pursue him, and he soon found himself at the head of a force with which he might set the power of his king at defiance. Lille, Ghent, Amiens bristled with armed men, and John of Burgundy soon felt that the murder of his cousin had put the destinies of France into his hands. While this was taking place in the north and west, a different scene was being enacted in Paris, a scene which, if the popular heart was not the basest thing that ever God created, the popular mind, the lightest and most unreasonable, should have roused the whole citizens to grief for him whom they had lost, to indignation against his daring murderer. The Duchess of Orléans, accompanied by her youngest son, entered Paris as a mourner, and threw herself at the feet of her brother and her king, praying for simple justice. The will of the murdered prince was opened, and though his faults were many and glaring, that paper showed the frank and generous character of the man, and was refutation enough of the vile calumnies circulated against him. So firm and strong had been his confidence, so full and clear his intention of maintaining in every respect the agreement of pacification lately signed between himself and the Duke of Burgundy, that he left the guardianship of his children to the very man who had so treacherously caused his assassination. None of his friends, none who had ever served him, were forgotten, and the tenacity of his affection was shown by his remembering many whom he had not seen for years. It was not wonderful, then, that those who knew and loved him clung to his memory with strong attachment, and with a reverence which some of his acts might not altogether warrant. It would not have been wonderful if the generous closing of his life had taught the populace of Paris to forget his faults and to revere his character. But the herd of all great cities is but a pack of hounds, to be cried on by the voice of the huntsman against any prey that is in view and the herd of Paris is more reckless in its fierceness than any other on all the earth. Fortune was with the Duke of Burgundy, and alas, boldness, decision, and skill likewise. He held a conference with the Duke of Berry and the King of Sicily in his own city of Amiens, swarming with his armed men. He placed over the door of the humble house in which he lodged two lances crossed, the one armed with its steel head, the other unarmed, ungarlanded, a significant indication that he was ready for peace or war. The approaches of the princes he repelled with insolence, and treated their counsels and remonstrances with contempt. Instead of coming to Paris and submitting himself humbly to the king, as they advised, he marched to Saint-Denis, 
with a large force and then after a day's hesitation entered the capital armed cap a pied amid the acclamations of the populace the hotel d'artois already a place of considerable strength received additional fortifications and all the houses round about it were filled with his armed men but especial care was taken that the soldiery should commit no excess upon the citizens and though he bearded his king upon the throne and overawed the royal council with the true heart of a demagogue he was humble and courteous toward the lowest citizens flattered those whom he despised and eagerly sought to make converts to his party in every class of society partly by corruption and partly by terror wherever he went the people followed at his heels shouting his name and vociferating noel noel and gradually the unhappy king oppressed by his own vassal though adored by his people fell back into that lamentable state from which he had but lately recovered such was the state of paris when jean charost raised his head and gazed around the room in which he was lying his sight was somewhat dim his brain was somewhat dizzy feeble he felt as infancy and yet it was a pleasure to him to feel himself in that little room again to fancy himself moving in plain mediocrity to believe that his experience of courtly life was all a dream what a satire upon all those objects which form so many men's vain aspirations when he had gazed at the window and at the door and at all the little objects that were scattered directly before his eyes he turned feebly to look at things nearer to him he thought he heard a sigh close to his bedside but a plain curtain was drawn round the head of the bed and he could only see from behind it part of a woman's black robe falling in large folds over the knee a little rustle that he made in turning seemed to attract the attention of the watcher the curtain was gently drawn back and he beheld his mother's face gazing at him earnestly oh it was a pleasant sight and he smiled upon her with the love that a son can only feel for a mother my son my dear son she cried you are better oh yes you are better and darting to the door she called to him who had just gone out monsieur jacques monsieur jacques he is awake now and he knows me gently gently dear lady said jacques Coeur, returning to the room we must have great quiet and all will go well the widow sat down and wept and the good merchant placed himself by the young man's side looked down upon him with a fatherly smile and pressed his fingers on the wrist saying ay the syrian drug has done marvels canst thou speak my son jean charost replied in a voice much stronger than might have been expected but jacques coeur fell into a fit of thought even while he spoke which lasted some two or three minutes and the young man was turning toward his mother again when the good merchant murmured as if speaking to himself i know not well how to act there are dangers every way listen to me my son but with perfect calmness and let me have an answer from your own lips which i can send to the great man whose messenger waits below two days ago we heard that the duke of burgundy had caused inquiries to be made concerning you as where you were to be found and when you had left the hotel d'orleans to-day he has sent a gentleman to inquire if you will take service with him he offers you the post of second squire of his body and promises knighthood on the first occasion what do you answer jean jean charost thought for a moment and then laid his hand upon his brow but at length he said twere better to tell him i am too ill to answer or even think but that i will either wait upon him or send him my reply in a few days wisely decided said jacques Coeur, rising that answer will do right well and quitting the room he left the door open behind him so that the young man could hear him deliver the message word for word merely prefacing it by saying he sends his humble duty to his highness and begs to say a rough voice in a somewhat haughty tone replied is he so very ill then sir merchant his highness is determined to know in all cases who is for him and who is against him i trust you tell me true therefore you can go up fair sir and see replied jacques Coeur, but i must beg you not to disturb him with any talk the other voice made no reply but the moment after jean charost could hear a heavy step coming up the stairs and a good-looking man of a somewhat heavy countenance completely armed but with his beaver up appeared in the doorway 
He merely looked in, however, and the pale countenance and emaciated frame of the young gentleman seemed to remove his doubts at once. "'That will do,' he said. "'I can now tell what I have seen. The Duke will expect an answer in a few days. If he dies, let him know, for there are plenty eager for the posts, I can tell you.' Thus saying, he turned away and closed the door, and Madame de Bracy exclaimed, "'God forbid that you should die, my son, or serve that bad man either.' "'So say I, too,' replied Jean Charost. "'I know not why you should feel so regarding him, dear mother, "'but I cannot divest my mind of a suspicion that he countenanced, "'if he did not prompt the death of the Duke of Orléans.' "'Do you not know that he has avowed it?' exclaimed Madame de Bracy. "'But her son's face turned so deadly pale, even to the very lips, "'that Jacques Coeur interposed, saying gently, "'Beware, beware, dear lady,' He cannot bear any such tidings now. He will soon be well enough to hear all. His judgment proved right. From that moment every hour gave Jean Charost some additional strength, and that very day before nightfall he heard much that imported him greatly to know. He now learned that the Duchess of Orléans, after a brief visit to the capital to demand justice upon the murderers of her husband, had judged it prudent to retire to Blois and to withdraw all the retainers of the late duke jean charost being in no situation to bear so long a journey she had commended him especially to the care of jacques coeur who had ridden in haste to paris on the news of assassination he now learned also that one of the last acts of the duke had been to leave him a pension of three hundred crowns then a large sum charged upon the county of Bertou and that a packet addressed to him, sealed with the Duke's private signet, and marked, to be read by his own eye alone, had been found among the papers at the Chateau of Beauté. He would have fain heard more, and prolonged the conversation upon subjects so interesting to him, but Jacques Coeur wisely refused to gratify him, and contrived to dole out his information piece by piece, avoiding, as far as possible, all that could excite or agitate him. A pleasant interlude toward the fall of evening was afforded by the arrival of Martin Grille, whose joy at seeing his young master roused from a stupor which he had fancied would only end in death was touching in itself, although it assumed somewhat ludicrous forms. He capered about the room as if he had been bit by a tarantula, and in the midst of his dancing he fell upon his knees and thanked God and the Blessed Virgin for the miraculous cure of his young lord which he attributed entirely to his having vowed a wax candle of three pounds weight to burn in the lady chapel of the notre dame in case of jean charost's recovery it seems that since the arrival of madame de bracy in paris she and martin grille had equally divided the task of sitting up all night with her son and well had the faithful valet performed his duty for without an effort or any knowledge on his part jean charost had won the enthusiastic love and respect of one who had entered his service with a high contempt for his want of experience, and perhaps some intention of making the best of a good place. Well has it been said that force of character is the most powerful of moral engines, for it works silently and even without the consciousness of those who were subject to its influence, upon all that approaches it. How often is it that we see a man of no particular brilliancy of thought, of manner, or of expression, come into the midst of turbulent and unruly spirits, and bend them like osiers to his will. Some people will have it that it is the clearness with which his thoughts are expressed, or the clearness with which they are conceived, the definiteness of his directions, the promptness of his decisions, which gives him this power, but if we look closely, we shall find it is a force of character, a quality of the mind which men feel in others rather than perceive, and which they yield to often without knowing why. The following morning rose like a wayward child, dull and sobbing, but Jean Charost woke refreshed and reinvigorated after a long calm night of sweet and natural sleep. His mother was again by his bedside, and she took a pleasure in telling him how carefully Martin Grille had preserved all his little treasures at the Hôtel d'Orléans, at a time when the assassination of the duke had thrown all the better members of the household into dismay and confusion, and left the house itself for a considerable time, at the mercy of the knaves and scoundrels that are never wanting in a large establishment. 
She was interrupted in her details by the entrance of the very person of whom she spoke, and at the same time loud cries and shouts and hurrahs rose up from the street, inducing Jean Charost to inquire if the king were passing along. "'No, fair sir,' answered Martin Grille. "'It is the king's king, but on my life my lord of Burgundy does not much fear rusting his armour, or he would not ride through the streets on such a day as this.' "'Does he go armed, then?' asked Jean Charost. "'From head to foot,' answered his mother. And Martin Grille added, "'He is seldom without four or five hundred men-at-arms with him. Such a sight was never seen in Paris. But I must go my way and get the news of the day, for these are times when every man should know whatever his neighbour is doing.' "'I fear your intelligence must stop somewhat short of that,' said Jean Charost. "'I shall get all the intelligence I want,' replied the valet, with a sapient nod of the head. "'I have a singing bird in the court cage that always sings me truly.' And away he went in search of news. During his absence a consultation was held between Madame de Brecy, her son, and Jacques Coeur, as to what was to be done in regard to the message of the Duke of Burgundy. "'We have only put off the evil day,' said Jacques Coeur, "'and some reply must soon be given.' "'My reply can be but one,' answered Jean Charost, "'that I will never serve a murderer, "'still less serve the murderer of my dear lord.' "'Madame de Brécy looked uneasy, "'and the face of Jacques Coeur was very grave. "'You surely would not have me do so, my dear mother,' "'said the young gentleman, raising himself on his arm "'and gazing in her face. "'You could not wish me, my good and honourable friend.' "'No, Jean, no,' answered Jacques Coeur, but yet such a reply is perilous, and before it is made we must be beyond the reach of the strong arm that rules all things in this capital. You have had a taste, my son, of what great men will dare do to those who venture to oppose them, even in their most unjust commands. Depend upon it, the Duke of Burgundy will not scruple at acts which the King's Council themselves will not venture to authorise. Why he should wish to engage you in his service I cannot tell but that he does so earnestly is evident, and refusal will be very dangerous, even in the mildest form. Some fanciful connection between my fate and his was told him one night by an astrologer, said Jean Charost. That is the only motive he can have. Perhaps so, replied Jacques Coeur thoughtfully, and then he added the moment after, and yet I do not know. His Highness is not one to be influenced in his conduct by any visionary things. They may have weight with him in thought, but not in action. If he had been told that his death would follow the poor dukes as a natural consequence, he would have killed him notwithstanding. He must have seen something in you, my young friend, that he likes, that he thinks will suit some of his purposes. He has seen little of me that should so prepossess him, answered the young gentleman. He has seen me peremptorily refuse to obey his own commands, and obstinately deny the counsel the information they wanted, even though they tried to wring it out by torture. "'Probably the very cause,' answered Jacques Coeur. "'He loves men of resolution. "'But let us return to the subject, my young friend. "'Your answer must be somewhat softened. "'We must say that you are still too ill to engage in any service, "'that you must have some months for repose, "'and then that you will willingly obey any of His Highness's just commands.' "'Never, never,' answered Jean Charost warmly. "'I will never palter with my faith and duty toward the dead. "'If ever I can touch a lance against this duke's breast, "'I will aim it well, and the memory of my master will steady my arm. "'But serve him I will never, not even lead him to expect it.' "'Jacques Coeur and Madame de Brecy looked at each other in silence, "'but they urged him no more, "'and the only question in their minds now was— what course they could take not to suffer the young man's safety to be perilled in consequence of a resolution which they dared not disapprove. In the midst of their consultation, Martin Grille returned, evidently burdened with intelligence, and that not of a very pleasant character. "'What is to be done, I know not,' he said with much trepidation. "'I cannot, and I will not leave you, sir, whatever may come of it.' "'What is the matter, Martin?' asked Jacques Coeur. Be calm, be calm, young man, and tell us plainly, whatever be the evil. Listen, then, listen, said Martin Grille, lowering his voice almost to a whisper. 
an order is given out secretly to see if every orleanist now remaining in paris in his bed this night at twelve of the clock it is true it is true beyond all doubt i heard it from my cousin petit jean who got it from his father old caboche now the duke of burgundy's right-hand man in paris then we must go at once said jacques Coeur. whatever be the risk we must try if you can bear the motion of a litter jean but all the gates are closed except two said martin grille and they suffer no one to go out without a pass news has got abroad of all this the queen went yesterday to melon the king of sicily the duke of berry the duke of brittany have fled this morning the duke of bourbon has been long gone and the burgundians are resolved that no more shall escape jacques coeur gazed solemnly down upon the floor and madame de bracy wrung her hands in despair go my friend go said jean charost you are not marked out as an orleanist take my mother with you god may protect me even here if not his will be done stay cried madame grille stay i have thought of a way perhaps many of these burgundian nobles are poor cannot you lend one of them a thousand crowns monsieur jacques and get a pass for yourself and your family he will be glad enough to give it to see a creditor's back turned especially when he knows he can keep him at arm's length as long as he will i am sure my young lord will repay you repay me exclaimed jacques Coeur indignantly but your hint is a good one i will act upon it but not exactly as you propose some of them owe me enough already to wish me well out of paris tell all my people to get ready for instant departure and look for a litter that will hold too i will away at once and see what can be done have plenty of men with you messire jacques said martin grille eagerly men that can fight for there are burgundian bands patrolling all round the city i am not good at fighting and my young lord is as bad as i am now we must take our chance said jacques Coeur, and quitted the room End of chapter thirty Chapter thirty one of Agnes Sorrel by G. P. R. James. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Chapter thirty one. It was past ten o'clock at night when a litter, escorted by four men on horseback, passed the gates of Paris. A short detention took place before the guards at the gates would suffer the party to proceed, and one man went into the guard-house, and brought out a lantern to examine the inside of the litter and the countenances of the cavaliers. He used it to examine the pass, though, to say truth, he could not read a word, albeit an officer of some standing. In this respect, none of his companions were in better case than himself and they all declared that the handwriting was so bad that nobody on earth could read it it seemed likely at one time that this illegibility of the writing or want of the reading faculty on the part of the guards might be made an excuse for detaining the whole party till somebody with better eyes or better instruction should come up but one of the horsemen dismounted saying i will read it to you and looking over the officer's shoulder he proceeded thus I, William Marquis de Giac, do hereby strictly enjoin and command you, in the name of the high and mighty prince, John, Duke of Burgundy, to pass safely through the gates of Paris without let or impediment. Maître Jacques Coeur, clerk, his wife, and three serving men, and to give them aid and comfort in case of need. Signed, de Giac. Is that it? asked the officer, staring on the paper. Yes, don't you see? answered jacques coeur pointing with his finger to let pass the gates of the city of paris well well go along said the man and mounting his horse again the merchant led the way and the litter with those that it contained followed for a wonder martin grille held his tongue all this time but ere they had gone half a dozen furlongs he approached the side of the litter and putting in his head asked how his young master was better martin better replied jean charost every hour i feel better well thank god we are out of the city said martin grille my heart has been so often in my mouth during this last half hour that i thought i should bite it if i did but say a word 
I wonder which way we are to direct our steps now. Toward Bourg, Martin, replied Jacques Coeur, who was riding near. Toward Bourg? said Martin Grille. Then what's to become of the baby? The baby? repeated Madame de Brecy, in a tone as full of surprise as that in which Martin had repeated the words toward Bourg. In heaven's name, what baby? Jean Charost laid his hand gently on his mother, saying, It is very true, dear mother. A young child, quite an infant, has been given into my care, and I have promised to protect and educate her. But whose child is she? asked Madame de Brecy, in a tone of some alarm and consternation. I cannot tell, replied her son. I believe she is an orphan, but I am ignorant of all the facts. She is an orphan in a double sense, said Jacques Coeur, mingling in the discourse. At least I believe so. I have nothing to guide me but suspicion, it is true, but my suspicion is strong. Ay, my young friend, you are surprised that I know aught of this affair, but a friend's eye is often as watchful as a parent's. I saw the child some days after it was given into your charge, and there is a strong likeness, as strong as there can be between an infant and a grown person, between this poor thing and one who is no more. Who? Who? asked Jean Charost eagerly. One whom you never saw, replied Jacques Coeur, and Jean Charost was silent, for although he himself entertained suspicions, his friend's words were quite adverse to them. It was well bethought of, Martin, continued Jacques Coeur, after a short pause. We had better take our way by Bolte. It is not far round, and we shall all the sooner get within the posts of the Orléans party, for they are already preparing for war. We cannot take the child with us, for she is too young to go without a nurse, but we can make arrangements for her coming hereafter. And, of course, that which you promised, when in peril of your life had you refused, must be performed to the letter, my young friend. Assuredly, replied Jean Charles, can we reach Beauté to-night? I fear not, answered the merchant. But we must go on till we have put danger behind us. Now, draw the curtains of the litter again, and try to sleep, my son. Sleep is a strange whiler away of weary hours. But, though the pace of the horse-litter was drowsy enough, it was long before anything like slumber came near the eyes of Jean Charost, and he had just closed them, with a certain sort of heaviness of the lids, when the words, Halt! Halt! Whoever you are! were heard on all sides, together with the tramp of many horses, and the jingling of arms. Madame de Brecy and her son drew back the curtains instantly, and they then found that they were surrounded by a large party of men-at-arms, two or three of whom were conversing with Jacques Coeur a little in advance. The moon had somewhat declined, but it was shining on the faces of several of the group, and after gazing out for a moment or two, Jean Charost exclaimed, De Royan! Monsieur de Royan! His voice, which was weak, was at first not attended to, but on repeating the call, one of the horsemen turned quickly round and rode up to the side of the litter. Ah, de Bracy, is that you? cried the young man, holding out his hand to him. Here, monsieur, what's your name? We will believe you now, for here is one who has suffered enough for his faithfulness to the good duke. Why, how is this, de Bracy, in a litter, when we want every man in the saddle? But I heard you were very ill. You must get well soon, and strike a good stroke beside me and the rest, for the memory of our good lord, whom they sent to heaven before his time. Oh, if I could get one blow on that Burgundian's head, I would aim better than I did at the Quintain. Well, you shall come on with us to Juvisy, and we will lodge and entertain you. Thus saying, Juvenel de Royan turned away, rode back to his companions, and gave them explanations which seemed satisfactory, for the merchant and his party were not only suffered to proceed, but obtained the escort of some forty or fifty men-at-arms, who had been about to return to Juvisy when they fell in with the little cavalcade of Jacques Coeur. None of the many moral enigmas with which we are surrounded is more difficult of comprehension to the mind of a man of fixed and resolute character than the sudden changes which come upon more impulsive and volatile people. The demeanour of Juvenel de Royan 
was a matter of serious and puzzling thought to jean charost through the rest of the journey he seemed so entirely changed not only in feelings toward the young gentleman himself but in disposition frank active impetuous as ever he had in the space of a few terrible weeks lost the boyish flippancy of manner and put on the manly character at once jean charost could not understand it at all and it seemed to him most strange that one who would willingly have cut his throat not a month before should now upon the establishment of one very slight link between them treat him as a dear and ancient friend jean charost was less of a frenchman than juvenal de royen both by birth and education for the latter had been born in the gay and movable south and had been indulged if not spoiled during all his early life while the former had first seen the light in much more northern regions and had received very early severe lessons of adversity neither perhaps had any distinct notion of the real causes of their former enmity but jean charost was at least well satisfied that it should be terminated and as he was of no rancorous disposition he gladly received the proffered friendship of his former adversary though to say sooth he counted it at somewhat less than it was worth on account of the suddenness with which it had arisen he knew not that some of the trees which spring up the most rapidly are nevertheless the most valuable End of chapter thirty one chapter thirty two of agnes sorrel by g p r james this librivox recording is in the public domain chapter thirty two let us abridge and improve french history as it is generally written it is quite susceptible of both abridgment and improvement the power of the duke of burgundy was without bounds in the city of paris and his daring and his ferocity were as boundless he remembered ancient offences as tenaciously as the duke of orleans had remembered kindnesses and every one in paris who had at any time shown enmity toward him either sought refuge in flight or stayed to receive abundant marks of his vindictive memory but he had skill also as well as daring and especially that dark and politic skill which teaches the demagogue to turn the best and wisest deeds of an adversary to his disadvantage in the eyes of the people and his own worst actions to the services of his own ambition oh what a fool is the people always the dupe of hypocrisy and lies always deceived by promises and pretences always the lover and the support of those who at heart most despise and condemn it that great many-headed fool followed the duke's path with acclamations wherever he appeared although the evils under which they laboured notwithstanding all his promises were augmented rather than diminished by his sway a hired sophist defended the assassination of the duke of orleans in presence of the court and the university and the people shouted loudly though the excuse was too empty to deceive a child the duke declared that the maladministration of orleans compelled the continuance of the taxes promised to be repealed and the people shouted loudly still the prévôt de tignonville was punished and degraded for bringing two robbers to justice though every one knew the real offence was his proposal to search the houses of the princes for the assassins of the duke of orleans and still the people shouted nevertheless fortune was not altogether constant and while the power of the duke increased in the capital let him do whatever he would a cloud was gathering round him from which he found it necessary to fly the duchess of orleans cried loudly for vengeance the dukes of bourbon brittany and berry armed for her support and for the deliverance of the throne the queen having the dauphin with her lent weight and countenance to the party and gradually the forces of the confederates increased so far that paris was no longer a safe asylum for the object of their just indignation it was then that the revolt took place in liege where the brother-in-law of the duke held the anomalous position of prince bishop and burgundy hurried away from paris both to aid his relation and to avoid the advance of the orleanist army without risking honour and power upon an unequal battle for a short space his position was perilous 
the strong-headed and turbulent citizens of liege no soft and silky burghers as they are represented by the great novelist in an after reign stout and hardy soldiers as ever were dared the whole power of burgundy an enemy's army was in his rear all the princes of the blood the council and most of the great vassals of france were against him but he fought and won a battle captured liege and turned upon his steps once more to overawe his enemies in france time enough had been given for disunion to spread among the allied princes william count of holland interfered to gain over the queen to the burgundian party and a hollow peace was brought about known as the peace of chartres which ended in the ascendancy of the duke of burgundy and the temporary abasement of his enemies once more the vengeance of the duke was visited on the heads of all distinguished persons who had shown themselves even indifferent to his cause but he forgot not his policy in his anger and the spoils of his victims conciliated fresh partisans intrigue succeeded intrigue for several years and in the midst of disasters and disappointments the spirit of valentine duchess of orleans passed away from the earth on which she had known little but sorrow still calling for justice upon the murderers of her husband her children however were powerless at the time and it was not till the marriage of her eldest son with the daughter of the count of armagnac that the light of hope seemed to break upon them then began that famous struggle between the parties known in history as the burgundians and the armagnacs paris became its great object of strife and during the absence of the duke of burgundy it was surrounded if not actually blockaded by the troops of armagnac the orleanist party within the walls comprised many of the noblest and most enlightened men in france but the lower classes of the people were almost to a man burgundians and forming themselves into armed bands under the leading of john of troy a surgeon and simon caboche the cutler they received the names of cabochian and exercised that atrocious ferocity which is the general characteristic of an ignorant multitude there was a reign of terror in paris in the fifteenth as well as in the eighteenth century and many had cause to know that the red scarfs of burgundy were dyed in blood anarchy and confusion still reigned within the walls nor probably was the state of the country much better but at length the duke of burgundy unable to oppose his enemies in the field unaided sought for and obtained the assistance of six thousand english archers and entered paris in triumph the offensive was soon after taken by the burgundians and the duke of berry was besieged in bourg but frenchmen were disinclined to fight against frenchmen and a treaty as hollow as any of the rest was concluded under the walls of that place even while the negotiations went on means were taken to open the eyes of the dauphin to the ambition of the burgundian prince and john sans peur saw himself opposed in the council by one who had long been subservient to his will but the duke found easy means to crush this resistance the people of paris were roused at his beck into tumult the bastille was besieged by the armed bands of caboche and his companions the palace of the dauphin invaded and he himself reduced to the state of a mere prisoner more bloodshed followed and burgundy at length found that an enraged multitude is not so easily calmed as excited his situation became somewhat difficult although the dauphin was shut up in the hotel st paul he found means of communicating with the princes of the blood royal without and nothing seemed left for the duke of burgundy but an extension of the convention of bourg to a general peace with all his opponents this was concluded at pontoise and against the will of the parisians the dauphin was set at liberty and the leaders of the armagnac party were permitted to enter paris burgundy soon found that he had made a mistake that his popularity with the people was shaken and his power over them gone he was even fearful for his person and well might he be so but his course was speedily determined and after having failed in an attempt to carry off the dauphin while on a party of pleasure at vincennes he retired in haste to flanders 
A complete change of scene took place. The creatures of the Duke of Burgundy were driven from power, and sanguinary retribution marked the ascendancy of, of the Armagnac party. The easiest labour of Hercules, probably, was the destruction of the Hydra, for creatures with many heads are always weaker than those with one. Dissension spread among the Armagnac faction. The Queen and the Dauphin disagreed, and the Prince, finding the tyranny of the Armagnacs as hard to bear as that of the Burgundians, instigated the Duke to return to Paris. John, without fear, however, had not force sufficient to effect any great purpose, and after an ineffectual attempt to besiege the capital, he retired before a large army, gathered from all parts of France, with the king and all the princes of the blood at its head. Compiègne capitulated to the Armagnacs, Soissons was taken by assault, but Arras held out, and once more negotiations for peace commenced under its walls. A treaty was concluded by the influence of the Dauphin, who was weary of being the shuttlecock between two factions, and resolved to make himself master of the capital. His first effort, however, was frustrated, and he was compelled to fly to Bourg. With great adroitness, he then took advantage of a proposed conference at Corbeil between himself and the allied princes. He agreed to the meeting, but while they waited for him at Corbeil, he passed quietly on to Paris, made himself master of the capital, and seized the treasures which his mother had accumulated in that city. Three parties now appeared in France, that of the Duke of Burgundy, that of the allied princes, and that of the Dauphin, and in the meanwhile an acute enemy with some just pretensions to certain portions of France, and unfounded claims to the crown itself, was watching from the shores of England for a favourable moment to seize the long-coveted possession. From the time of the Treaty of Bretigny, wars and truces had succeeded each other between the two countries, hostilities and negotiations, and during the late dissensions, English alliance had been sought and found by both parties. But at the same time, long discussions had taken place between the courts of France and England, with the pretended object of concluding a general and definitive treaty of peace. Henry demanded much, however. France would grant little. Offensive words were added to the rejection of captious proposals, and suddenly the news spread over the country like lightning, that Henry V of England had landed in arms upon the coast of France. End of chapter 32Chapter thirty three of Agnes Sorrel by G. P. R. James. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Chapter thirty three. A few miles from the strong town of Bourg, on the summit of a considerable elevation, was a chateau or castle, even then showing some signs of antiquity. It was not a very large and magnificent dwelling, consisting merely of the outer walls with their flanking towers, one tall square tower and one great mass stretching out into the court, and rising to the height of two stories. In a small, plain chamber, containing everything useful and convenient, but nothing very ornamental, sat a young gentleman of three or four-and-twenty years of age, covered with a corselet and back-piece, but with his head and limbs bare of armour. Two men, however, were busily engaged, fitting upon him the iron panoply of war. One was kneeling at his feet, fastening the greaves upon his legs. The other stood behind, attaching the pauldrons and pallets. On a table hard by stood a casque and plume, beside which lay the gauntlets, the shield, and the sword. And near the table stood a lady, somewhat past the middle age, gazing gravely and anxiously at the young man's countenance. But there was still another person in the room. A young girl of some six or seven years of age had climbed up upon the gentleman's knee, and was making a necklace for him of her arms, while ever and anon she kissed him tenderly. "'You must come back, Jean, you must come back,' she said, "'though dear mother says perhaps you may never come back. You must not leave your own little Agnes. What would she do without you?' Jean Charost embraced her warmly, but he did not speak for there were many emotions in his heart which he feared might make his voice tremble. 
few who had seen him six or seven years before would have recognized in that tall powerful young man the slim graceful lad who was secretary to the unfortunate duke of orleans nor was the change perhaps less in his mind than in his person for although he was of that character which changes slowly yet all characters change the oak requires a hundred years the willow hardly twenty and as one layer or circle grows upon another in the heart of the tree so do new feelings come over man's spirit as he advances from youth to age each epoch in human life has the things pertaining to itself a boy can never divine what the man will feel the man too little recollects what were the feelings of the boy however the change in jean charost in consequence of the circumstances in which he had been placed was somewhat different from that which might have been expected he had become tenderer rather than harder in the last seven years more flexible rather than more rigid till between seventeen and eighteen years of age hard necessities constant application the everlasting dealing with material things the guard which he had been continually forced to put upon himself knowing that not only his own future fate might be darkened but the happiness and deliverance of a parent might be lost by one false step had all tended to give him an unyouthful sternness of principle and of demeanour which had perhaps saved him from many evils but had deprived him of much innocent enjoyment since the death of the duke of orleans however acting altogether as his own master seeing more of the general world and with his mind relieved from the oppressive cares and anxieties which may be said to have frozen his youth he had warmed as it were in the sunshine and all the more gentle things of the heart had come forth and blossomed i know not whether the love of that dear beautiful child had not greatly aided the change whether his tenderness for her and her adoring fondness for him had not called out emotions natural but latent and affections which only wanted something to cling round whenever he returned from any of the scenes of strife and trouble in which he embarked with the rest one of his first thoughts was of agnes when he approached the gates of the old castle his eyes were always lifted to see her coming to meet him when he sought a time of repose in the plain and unadorned halls of his father no gorgeous tapestry no gilded ceiling no painted gallery could have ornamented the place so well as the smiles of that sweet young face the balmy influence of innocent childhood was felt by him very strongly he was very indulgent toward her his mother said he spoiled her but he was used to laugh joyfully and declare that nothing could spoil his little agnes and in truth with him she was ever gentle and docile seeming to love obedience to his lightest word and now he was going to leave her to leave all he held most dear in life for a long much for a fierce strife for a struggle on which the fate of france depended he was not without hope he was not without confidence but if almost all men feel some shade of dread when parting from a well-beloved home on any ordinary occasion if a chilling conviction of the dreary uncertainty of all earthly things comes upon them even what must have been his sensations when he thought of all that might happen between the hours of parting and returning but the trumpet had sounded throughout the land every well-wisher of his country was called upon to forget his domestic ties and selfish interests and private quarrels and arm to repel an invader the appeal was to the hearts of all frenchmen and he must go nay more he had taxed his utmost means he had mortgaged the very bequest of the duke of orleans he had done everything but impoverish his mother in order to carry with him as many men as possible to swell the hosts of france the last piece of his armour was buckled on martin grille took up the cask a cup of wine was brought and jean charost embraced his mother and the child how hard your breast is jean said the little girl none too hard said the mother god be your shield my son he is better than sword or buckler amen said jean charost and left them now let us change the scene once more for this must be a chapter of changes 
stand upon this little hill with me beside the great oak and let us look on as day breaks over the fair scene below us see how beautifully the land slopes away there on the north with the wooded heights near blangy and the church steeple on the rise of the hill and the old castle hard by how the light catches upon it even before the day is fully risen even that piece of marshy ground sloping gently up into a meadow with a deep ditch cut here and there across it acquires something like beauty from the purple light of the rising sun there is a little coppice there to the westward with a windmill somewhat like that at crecy waving its slow arms on the gentle morning breeze how peaceful it all looks how calm can this narrow space this tranquil scene be the spot on which the destiny of a great kingdom is to be decided in an hour so perhaps thought a man placed upon the hill near blangy as he looked in the direction of azincourt one half of the steeple of which could be seen rising over the slope soon however that quiet scene became full of life he saw a small body of some two hundred men run rapidly along under cover of the coppice bending their heads with no apparent arms except what seemed an axe slung upon the shoulder of each they carried long slim wands in their hands it is true but to the eyes those wands were very unserviceable weapons they reached the edge of a ditch upon the meadow and there they disappeared a loud flourish of martial music followed and soon after from behind the wood came on in steady array a small body of soldiery they could not have numbered more than one or two thousand men at the very most and little like soldiers did they look except in the even firmness of their line there was no glittering steel to be seen casque and corselet spear and banner were not there not even the foot soldiers jack and morion could be described among them but tattered travel-worn and many of them bareheaded they advanced with heavy tramp and steady countenance in the same direction which had been taken by the others the same long ones were in their hands and each bore upon his shoulder a heavy steel pointed post while a short sword or axe hung upon the thigh and a well-stored quiver was within reach of the right hand before them rode a knight on horseback with a truncheon in his hand and behind them still as they marched on sounded the war-stirring trumpet the face of the man who stood there and watched was very pale either with fear or some other emotion and every now and then he approached a tree to which three horses were tied one of which was fully caparisoned for war examined the bridles and saw that all was right as if he were anxious that everything should be ready either for strife or flight while he was thus employed two other men came up slowly climbing the hill from the eastward but there was nothing in the appearance of either to give any alarm to him who was watching there the one was a round short personage with a countenance on which nature had stamped cheerful good humour though his eyes had now in them an expression of wild anxiety which showed that he knew what scene was about to be enacted below the other was a tall gaunt man far past the middle age but his face betrayed no emotion it was still and pale as that of death and changed not even after they had reached a point where the whole array of the field was set out before them his brow however wore a heavy frown but that expression seemed habitual and not produced by any transitory feeling both the strangers were habited in the long grey gown of the monk with a girdle of plain cord and the string of beads attached besides which the elder man carried in his hand a staff and a large ebony crucifix the moment their heads rose above the slope so that they could see over into the plain beyond the younger and the stouter man stopped suddenly with a look of some alarm as if the moving mass of soldiery had been close to him jesu maria he exclaimed are those the english brother albert i did not know they were half so near the other answered nothing and his countenance changed not while his eye ran over the whole country beneath him with the calm deliberate marking look of a man who had beheld such scenes before suddenly on the right over the tops of the trees rose up a dense cloud of smoke 
which, rolling in large volumes into the air, became tinged with a dark red hue, and speckled with sparks of fire. "'What is that? What is that?' cried the younger monk. "'That must be some place on fire at Aubin.' "'No, no,' replied the other, speaking for the first time. "'That is much nearer. It is either at Teneur, or at the farm of our priory of St. George.' Can the English king have thrown out his right wing so far in order to take our army on the flank? If so, one charge would ruin him. But no, he is too wise for that. It must be a stratagem to deceive the constable. As he spoke, the first comer moved away from the horses and joined them, saying, God help us, this is a terrible scene, good fathers. The elder monk gazed at him with his motionless countenance, but answered nothing and the younger one replied, much in his own tone, A terrible scene indeed, my son, a terrible scene indeed. I know not whether it will be more so to stand as a mere spectator and witness such a sight as will soon be before us, or to mingle in the fray and, and lose part of its horrors by sharing in its fury. Oh, I have no doubt which, answered the other. My mind is quite made up on that subject. "'You may be a man of war,' replied the other. "'Indeed, these armed horses seem to speak it.' "'No, I am a man of peace,' rejoined the first comer. "'Those horses are my master's, not mine, and the fighting is his too. "'But he knows my infirmity and leaves me here out of arrow-shot. "'The boy who was with me has run down the hill to be nearer to our lord, "'but I, as in duty bound, stay where he placed me. "'I should like very much to know, however,' What is the name of that farmhouse, and the two or three cottages there, at the edge of the meadow, with the deep ditch across it? That is called Tramacor, replied the younger monk. It is but a small hamlet, and I heard this morning that our riotous soldiers had driven all the people out of it, and eaten up all their stores. Why do you ask, my son? Because I saw but now some two or three hundred men coming from the side of Blangy, run down by the willows there, and disappear in the ditch. God's retribution, said the elder monk gravely. Had not the soldiery driven out the peasantry, there would have been men to bear the news of the ambush. Think you it is an ambush, then? asked the younger monk. Beyond doubt, replied the other. And he who would do a good service to the army of France would mount yon horse, ride down toward Azincourt, and carry the tidings to the constable. As he spoke, he fixed his eyes upon their lay companion, who seemed a little uneasy under their gaze. He fidgeted, pulled the points of his doublet, and then said sturdily, "'Well, I cannot go. I must stay with the horses.' "'Are you a coward?' asked the elder monk in a low, bitter tone. "'Yes,' replied the man nonchalantly. "'I am a desperate coward. Have been so all my life. I have a reverent regard for my own skin, and no fondness for carving that of other people. If men have a peculiar fancy for poking holes in each other's bodies, I do not quarrel with them for it. Indeed, I do not quarrel with any one for anything. But it is not my taste. It is not my trade. Why should I make eyelet holes in nature's jerkin, or have myself bored through and through, like a piece of timber under an auger? Well, my son, "'Wilt thou let me have a horse that I may ride down and tell the constable?' asked the shorter of his two companions. "'There is hardly time,' said the elder monk. "'See, here comes a larger body of archers from the side of Blangy, "'and I can catch lance-heads and banners rising up in Azincourt. "'The bloody work will soon begin.' "'I would fain try at all events,' cried the other. "'Man, wilt thou let me have a horse? "'I will bring him back to thee in half an hour, "'if ever I come back alive myself.' "'Take him, take him,' answered the other. "'I am not the man to stop you. "'How could I resist two monks and three horses? "'Not the destroyer, not the battle-horse. "'That is my lord's. "'Here, take the pages. "'Let me help thee on, father. "'Thou art so fat in the nether end "'that thou wilt never get up without a ladder.' One time I was as bad a horseman as thyself, and so I have compassion on thy foibles. Have thou some upon mine? The monk was soon settled in the saddle, and away he went down the hill, showing himself a better horseman, when once mounted, than the other had given him credit for. 
As soon as he was gone, the elder monk fixed his eyes once more upon his companion, and said in a low voice, "'Have I not seen thee somewhere before?' "'I can't tell,' answered the other. "'I have seen you, I fancy, but if so, you, you gave no sign of seeing me, either by word or look. However, I am Martin Grille, the valet of the good Baron de Bracy. Perhaps that may give your memory a step to climb upon.' it needs no step replied the other i am all memory would to god i were not ay now you look more as you did then though not half so mad either said martin grille you are older too and your cowl makes a difference and there is a difference replied the monk in a tone of deep sadness penitence and prayer remorse and anguish sated revenge perhaps a thirst assuaged a thirst such as no desert traveller ever knew quenched in blood and tears all these have changed me the fire has gone out i am nothing but the ashes of my former self rather hot ashes even yet answered martin grille if i may judge by what you said about my cowardice just now but look look good father what will become of our fat brother there why he is riding right before that strong body of lances coming up from blangy he does not see them answered the other gravely he may reach the constable even yet for lo now there comes the power of france over the hill and england on to meet her by the holy rood they make a gallant show these great noblemen of france why what a sea of archery and, and men-at-arms is there with plumes and banners lance and shield and pennons numberless i have seen many a stricken fight and never but at poitiers saw fairer array than that why they will sweep the english from the face of the earth said martin grille if that be all king henry's power it is but a morsel for the more of such a monster as is coming down from azincourt the monk turned toward him and shook his head you know not these englishmen he said with a sigh when brought to bay they fight like wolves i have heard my father tell of crecy and at poitiers i was a page on each field we outnumbered them as here and at poitiers we might have had them on composition had it pleased the king but we forced them to fight and fight they did till the multitude fled before a handful and order and discipline did what neither numbers nor courage could effect look you now how skilfully this english king has chosen his place of battle unassailable on either flank showing a narrow front to his enemy so as to render numbers of no avail god send that they may not prove destructive ah he is too late replied martin grille who had been watching the course of the other monk who was riding straight toward the head of the ditch where he had seen the archers conceal themselves he is too late i fear his exclamation was caused by sudden movements observable in both armies the english force had been advancing slowly in three bodies each looking but a handful as compared with the immense forces of france but in firm and close array with little of that ornament and decoration which gilds and smooths the rugged reality of war but with many instruments of music playing martial airs and seeming to speak of hopeful confidence the french on the other hand who had lain quiet all the morning as if intending to wait the attack of the enemy had just spread out upon the sloping face of azincourt divided likewise into three vast bodies with their wings overlapping on either side the flank of the english force splendid arms and glittering accoutrements made the whole line shine and sparkle but not a sound was heard from among them except now and then the shout of a commander at the moment of martin grille's exclamation the advance guard of the french had assumed a quicker pace and were pouring down upon the english archery as they marched up through a somewhat narrow space enclosed between low thick copse hedges and swampy ground this narrow field forked out gradually becoming wider and wider toward the centre of the french host and the english had just reached what we may call the mouth of the fork with nearly fifteen thousand french men-at-arms and archers before them under the command of the constable in person slowly and steadily the englishmen marched on till within half bowshot of the french line headed by old sir thomas of erpingham who rode some twenty yards before the archery with a page on either side and nothing but a baton in his hand 
when near enough to render every arrow certain of its mark the old knight waved his truncheon in the air and instantly the whole body of foot halted short at the same moment each man planted before him the spiked stake which he carried in his hand and laid an arrow on the string of his bow a dead silence prevailed along each line unbroken except by the tramp of the advancing french sir thomas of erpingham looked along the line from right to left and then exclaimed in a loud powerful voice now strike throwing his truncheon high into the air and dismounting from his horse instantly from the ditch on the left flank of the french rose up the concealed archers with bows already drawn and well might martin grille exclaim that the monk was too late the next instant from one end of the english line to the other ran the tremendous cheer which has so often been the herald of victory over land and sea and the next a flight of arrows as thick as hail poured right into the faces of the charging enemy knights and squires and men-at-arms bowed their heads to the saddle-bow to avoid the shafts but on they still rushed each man directing his horse straight against the narrow front of the english and pressing closer and closer together so as to present one compact mass upon which each arrow told nor did that fatal flight cease for an instant hardly was one shaft delivered before another was upon the string and mad with pain the horses of the french cavalry reared and plunged among the crowd creating as much destruction and disarray as even the missiles of their foe all then became a scene of strange confusion to the eyes of martin grille the two opposing forces seemed mingled together the english he thought were forced back but their order seemed firmer than that of the french line where all was struggling and disarray here and there a small space in one part of the field would become comparatively clear and then he would see a knight or squire dragged from his horse and an archer driving the point of his sword between the bars of his helmet the figure of the monk was no longer to be discerned for he had long been enveloped in the various masses of light cavalry and camp followers which whirled around the wings of the french army of little or no service in the battle to those whom they served and only formidable to an enemy in case of his defeat the monk who stood beside martin grille remained profoundly silent though his companion often turned his eye toward him with an inquiring look as if he would fain have asked how think you goes the strife but though no words were uttered many were the emotions which passed over his countenance at first all was calm although there was a straining of the eye beneath the bent brow like that of the eagle gazing down from its rocky eyrie on to the prey moving across the plain below then came a glance of triumph as some two or three hundred of the french men-at-arms dashed on before their companions and hurled themselves upon the english line in the vain effort to break the firm array of the archery but when he saw the troops mingling together and the heavy pressure of the french chivalry one upon the other each impeding his neighbour and leaving no room for any one but those in the front rank to strike a blow his brow grew dark his eye anxious and his lip quivered for a moment more he continued silent but then when he saw the english arrows dropping among the ranks of his countrymen the horses rearing and falling with their riders to be trampled under the feet of those who pressed around some maddened with pain tearing through all that opposed them and carrying terror and confusion into the main body behind some urged by fearful riders at the full gallop from a field which they fancied lost because it was not instantly won he could bear no more but exclaimed sharply and sternly they will lose the day but all that vast number coming down the hill have not yet struck a stroke cried martin grille where can they strike said the monk sternly were the field cleared of their friends they might yet do something with their foes see the banner of alencon is down and where is that of brabant i see it no more he gazed for a moment more and then exclaimed oh my life they are flying flying right into the centre of the main battle to carry the infection of their fear with them as he spoke two or three horsemen in mad haste galloped up the hill directly toward them 
and Martin Grille sprang to the side of the horses, unfastened one of them, and put his foot in the stirrup. "'Fool, they will not hurt thee,' said the monk. "'Tis their own lives they seek to save.' And stretching out his arm across the path by which the men-at-arms were coming, he exclaimed fiercely, "'Cowards! Cowards! Back to the battle for very shame!' But they galloped on past him, one with an arrow through his shoulder, and one with the crest of his casque completely shorn off. The third struck a blow with a mace at the monk as he passed, but it narrowly missed him, and on he too rode, with a bitter curse upon his lips. By this time it was no longer doubtful which way the strife would go between the advance guard of the French and that of the English army. The former was all in disarray, and parties scattering away from it every instant, while the latter was advancing steadily, supported by a large body of pikes and billmen who now appeared in steady order from behind some of the tall trees of the wood. Just then, through the bushes which lay scattered over the bottom of the slope, a group was seen coming up the hill, so slowly that their progress could hardly be called flight. At first neither Martin Grille nor the monk could clearly perceive what they were doing, for the branches, covered with thin, dry October leaves, partly intercepted the view. Soon, however, they emerged upon more open ground, and three or four men on foot appeared, closely surrounding a caparisoned horse, which one of them led by the bridle, while another, walking by the stirrup, seemed to have his arm around the waist of the rider. An instant after, a mounted man in a grey gown appeared from among the bushes, paused by the side of the little party, and was seen pointing upward toward the hill. "'Brother Albert and a wounded knight,' said the monk, taking a step or two forward. "'Good Lord, I hope it is not my young master,' cried Martin Grille, clasping his hands together. "'Oh, if he would but stay at home and keep quiet, I'm sure his mother would bless the day.' The monk hardly listened to him, for he was gazing with an eager and anxious look upon the group below. Then, suddenly turning to the varlet, he asked, in a sharp, quick tone, "'Has thy young lord any children?' "'None of his own,' answered Martin Grille, "'but one whom he has adopted, "'a fairy little creature, as beautiful as a sunbeam, "'whom they call Agnes. "'He could not love her better, were she his own.' "'God will bless him yet,' said the monk, "'and then added sharply, "'Why stand you there? "'It is your lord. "'Go down and help.' "'And he himself hurried down the slope "'to meet the advancing party.' With his cask cleft open by an axe, an arrow through his right arm, a spear hole in his cuirass, and the blood dropping over his coat of arms, Jean Charost, supported by one of his retainers, on whose shoulder his head rested, was borne slowly up the hill. His face could not be seen, for his visor was closed, but there was an expression of deep sadness in the faces of the two or three men who surrounded him, which showed that they thought the worst had befallen. "'Is he dead?' asked the old monk, looking at the man who led the horse. "'I can't tell, father,' replied the soldier, gruffly. "'He has not spoken since we got him out of the fray. "'Here is one who has done his duty, however. "'Oh, if they had all fought as he did!' "'I think he is not dead,' said the other monk, riding up. "'You see, his hand is still clasped upon the rein, "'and once, I thought, he tried to raise his head. "'Bear him on. "'Bear him on behind the trees,' cried the older man, "'and get the horses out of sight. "'He is not dead. His hand moves. "'How goes it, my son? How goes it? Be of good cheer.' "'A low groan was the only reply, "'but that was sign sufficient that life was not extinct, "'and Jean Charost was carried gently forward "'to a spot behind the trees, "'well concealed from the field of battle.' The old monk, before he followed, paused to take one more look at the bloody plain of Azincourt. By this time the main body of the French army was in as great disorder as the advanced guard, while the English forces were making way steadily with the royal banner floating in the air. "'All is lost,' murmured the monk. "'God help them. They have cast away a great victory.' When he reached the little spot to which Jean Charost had been carried, the men were lifting him gently from his horse and laying him down on the dry autumnal grass. His cask was soon removed, but his eyes were closed and his breathing was slow and uneven. 
there was a deep cut upon his head but that which seemed robbing him of life was the lance wound in his chest and with hurried hands the two monks unclasped the cuirass and back piece and applied themselves to staunch the blood it has gone very near his heart said the elder monk no no replied the other it is too far to the side you understand fighting better than i brother albert but i know more surgery than you here hold your hand firmly here one of you men and give me up that scarf some one run down to the brook and get water take his bassinet take his bassinet we must call him out of this swoon before it is too late martin grille seized up his master's casque and impulsively ran away toward the brook which took its rise about two-thirds of the way down the hill when he came in sight of the battlefield however he stopped suddenly short with all his old terrors rushing upon him at the next instant love for his young lord overcame all other sensations and he plunged desperately down the slope and filled the bassinet at the fountain help me martin help me said a voice near and looking up he saw the young page who had followed his lord down the hill here boy come along cried martin grille what are you hurt you young fool yes sorely replied the boy while trying to cover the baron the first time he was thrown from his horse they hacked me with their swords but i shall never see him again he is dead now give me your hand give me your hand cried martin grille he is not dead so take good heart but i must hurry back with this water so put forth what strength you have left dragging the page along with one hand and holding the bassinet in the other martin contrived to climb the hill again and reached the spot where de bracy lay the younger monk immediately took a handful of the water and dashed it in the wounded man's face a shudder passed over him and then he opened his eyes and looked faintly round now some drops of this sovereign balsam said the younger monk taking a vial from his pocket open your lips my son and let me drop it in he had to repeat his words before the wounded man comprehended them but when the drops had been administered a great change took place very rapidly the light came back into jean charost's eyes and he said though faintly where am i who has won how goes it my son how goes it asked the elder monk bending over him with his cowl thrown back but feebly father answered jean charost <gasps> is that you even so answered the monk but cheer up you shall not die we will take you to our priory of st george of hestin and soon give you health again alas said jean charost raising his hand feebly and letting it drop again i have no strength to move but how goes the battle if france have lost let me lie here and die we cannot tell answered the younger monk the battle still rages fiercely here hold this crucifix in your hand and let me examine the wound tis not bleeding so fast he continued take some more of these drops they will give you strength again ah perrault poor boy said jean charost suffering his eyes to glance feebly round till they rested upon the page who was leaning against a tree attend to him good father he must be wounded sorely he saved my life when first i was dashed down by that blow upon my head take this first yourself rejoined the monk or the master will go where the page will not like to follow jean charost made no resistance and the monk then turned to the young boy examined and bound up his wounds and administered him likewise some of the elixir in which he seemed to put so much faith nor did it seem undeserving of his good opinion for again the effect upon jean charost was very great and he said in a stronger voice methinks i shall live can we not contrive to make some litter said the elder monk looking to the men who had aided their young lord up the hill we will try said one of them and taking an axe which hung upon his shoulder he began to cut down some of the sapling trees ere the materials were collected however to make a litter there came a sound of horses feet going at a slow trot and an instant after a small party of horse appeared ha huh, who have we here cried the man at their head a french knight wounded god save you sir i trust you will do well but you must surrender rescue or no rescue and give your faith thereon as he spoke he dismounted and approached the little group 
holding out his hand to Jean Charost. "'There is no help for it,' answered the wounded man, giving him his hand. "'Rescue or no rescue, I do surrender.' "'Your name is the next thing,' replied the English officer. "'Jean Charost, Baron de Bracy,' replied the young man. "'I pray you tell me how goes the battle.' "'It is over, sir,' answered the Englishman. "'God has pleased to bless our arms. "'Your men will surrender, of course.' With them, too, there was no help for it, as there were some twenty or thirty spears around them, and when they had given their pledge, the officer, an elderly man, turned again to Jean Charost, saying, in a kindly tone, "'You are badly hurt, sir, and I am sure have done your devoir, right nightly for your king and country. I cannot stay to tend you, but these good fathers will have gentle care of you, I am sure. When you are well, inquire for the Lord Willoughby. You will not find him hard to deal with. The parole of a gentleman with such wounds as these is worth prison bars of three-inch thickness. And thus saying, he remounted his horse and rode away. End of chapter 33 Chapter 34 of Agnes Sorrel by G. P. R. James This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Chapter 34 a few brief glimpses, if you please, dear reader, quiet and calm and cool, like the early sunshine of a clear autumn day, a few brief glimpses to throw some light upon a lapse of several years. It may be asked, why are not the events of those years recorded? Why are we not carried through the details of a history in which the writer, at least, must have some interest? In every life, as in every country which one passes through, there come spots of dull monotony, where the waters stagnate on the heavy flats, and to linger among them is dangerous to active existence. I say, in every life, there are these flats at some period or another, for I can recall none in memory or in history, where they have not been found, none where all has been mountain and valley. Take the most active life that ever was, that of Napoleon Bonaparte carry him from the military school to the command of armies go with him along his comet-like career from glory to glory up to the zenith of his power and then on his course down to the horizon with fierce rapidity you come to the rock in the atlantic and the dull lapse of impotence and captivity at last in a cell in a small priory of st george of heston and on the pallet bed of one of the monks lay a young gentleman pale and wan but still with the light of reviving life in his eyes by his side was seated a tall thin old man or if not very old in years old in the experience of sorrows tis a strange thing this life and all connected with it time and joy and grief and fear and hope and appetite and satiety very very strange the wise eastern people have said that at the root of the tree of life lies two worms continually preying on it the one black the other white but alas alas there is many another maggot piercing the bark eating into the core drying up the sap bringing on decay and instruction i have named a few of them one of the most blessed conceptions of the soul is that in its immortality none of these things can touch it he seemed an old man though probably he had not yet seen near sixty years of age but there were upon his face many harsh lines not such as are drawn by hard carking cares and petty anxieties not such as are imprinted on the face by the claws of grasping mercenary selfishness but the deep, strong brands of burning passions, fierce griefs, fierce joys, and strong, unruly thoughts. Yet the eye was subdued. There was not the light in it that had once been there, the wild, eager light, too intense to be fully sane. There was sadness enough, but little fire. It would seem that the two, they were the only tenants of the cell, had been talking for some time, and that one of those pauses had taken place in which each man continues for himself the train of thought suggested by what has gone before. 
the old man looked down upon the ground with his shaggy eyebrows overhanging his eyes the young man looked up as if catching inspiration from above it was hope and memory at length the old man spoke when one looks back he said upon the path of life we lose in the mistiness of the distance a thousand objects which have influenced its course we see it turn hither and thither and wonder that we took not a course more direct to our end we perceive that we have gone far out of the way but the obstacles are not seen that were or seemed insurmountable the stream too deep to be forded the rock too high to be scaled the thicket too dense to be penetrated and the mists and darkness too the mists and darkness of the mind forever blinding us to the right way oh my son my son beware of the eyesight of passion for you know not how false and distorting it is the things as plain as day become all dim and obscure false lights glare around us and nothing is real but our own sensations jean charost smiled i have escaped as yet father he said it is true indeed that when i look back on some passages of my life on the actions of other men and on my own i sometimes wonder how i could view the things around me as i did at the time and all seems to me as if i had been acting in a dream passion passion said the monk the dream of passion happily i have had no cause to regret that i did not see more clearly replied jean charost but let me turn to other matters good father there are many things that i would wish to ask you many that are necessary for me to know ask me nothing replied the monk quickly then laying his hand upon jean charost's arm he said in a low stern voice there is a space in memory on which i dare not tread by struggle and by labour i have reached firm ground and can stand upon the rock of my salvation but behind me there is a gulf of madness you would not drag me back into it young man god forbid replied jean charest but yet the monk waved his hand and an instant after the door of the cell opened and martin grille appeared booted and spurred with his dress covered with dust and every sign about him of long riding over parched and sandy roads well martin exclaimed the young man as soon as he saw him what says the lord willoughby but little and not pleasant replied martin grille however he has written here is his letter jean charost took the paper which the man held out to him and tore it open eagerly but his face turned pale as he read and he exclaimed fifteen thousand crowns for a baron's ransom this is ruin i think he cannot help himself said martin grille for he seemed very much vexed when he wrote indeed he told me that the ransoms had been fixed by higher power ay ay a mere excuse exclaimed jean charost this greedy englishman is resolved to make the most of the capture of a wounded man passion my son passion said the monk what the good lord says is true i do believe tis the ambition and policy of his master not his own greed i have heard something of this and feared the result king henry is resolved that all those who might serve france best against him should either pay the expenses of his next campaign by their ransoms or linger out their time in english prisons while he goes forth to conquer france shame be upon him cried jean charost wouldst thou not do the same wert thou the king of england asked the monk jean charost mused for several minutes then there is naught for me but a prison he said at length i will not impoverish my poor mother nor my sweet little agnes it has cost enough to furnish me forth for this fatal battle oh that frenchmen had coolness as well as courage discipline as well as activity oh that they had won the day i would not have treated my prisoners so well god's will be done i will cross the seas and give myself up to captivity let me have things for writing martin grille nay my son you are not fit said the monk it must be done answered jean charost what matters it to any one if i die he cannot coin my clay into golden pieces i will not pay this ransom so long as my mother lives 
Let me have ink and paper. Jean Charost wrote, but he was soon obliged to abandon the task, for he was still too feeble. The next day he wrote again, however, and two letters were accomplished. The one was sent off to his mother, the other to the Lord Willoughby. To the latter he received an answer courteous and kind, desiring him not to hurry his departure for England, but to wait till he was well able to bear the journey. There was one sentence somewhat confused in expression, intended to convey a regret that the ransom fixed upon prisoners of his rank was so high, but Jean Charost was irritated and threw the letter from him. The other letter conjured his mother to his side with all speed, and she brought his little Agnes with her, for she had a notion that the presence of the child would be balmy to him. Let us pass over her remonstrances, and how she urged him to sell all and pay his ransom. For her sake he was firm, he would not impoverish his mother, and though there were bitter tears, he departed from his native land. Now let us change the scene. Between three and four years had passed since the field of Azincourt had received some of the best blood of France, and thinned the ranks of French chivalry. Every city, every village, almost every family, was full of trouble, and the place that was at one day in the hands of England was another day in the hands of France, and a third in the hands of Burgundy. All regular warfare might be said to have come to an end. Each powerful noble made war on his own hand, and linked himself by very slender ties to this faction or that. His enterprises were his own, though they were directed, in some degree, to the benefit of his party. But if he owned in any one a right to command him, it was only with the reservation that he should obey or not as he pleased. Armed bands traversed the country in every direction. Hardly a field between the Loire and the Somme was not at some time a scene of strife. None knew, when they sowed the ground, who would reap the harvest. And the goods of the merchant were as often exposed to pillage as the crop of the husbandman. Yet it is extraordinary how soon the mind of man, and especially the gay, volatile mind of the Frenchman, accommodates itself to circumstances. Here was a state almost intolerable, it would seem, to any but savages. But yet, in France, the skilful cook plied his busy trade, and the reeking kitchen sent up fragrant fumes. The auberge, the cabaret, the gite, the repu, all the places of public entertainment, in short, were constantly filled with gay guests. The tailor's needle was never more employed, and as much ornament as ever was bestowed upon fair forms which might be destined a few days after to meet with a bloody death. The village bells called people to prayer and praise as usual, and rang out merrily for the wedding, even when hostile spears were within sight of the steeple. Such was the state of the country when, one day in the latter part of the summer of 1419, a young man, dressed in the garb of a monk, entered a small town near the city of Bourg. His feet were sandaled, he carried the pilgrim's staff in his hand, and he was evidently wayworn and fatigued. The greater part of the peasantry were in the fields, and the street of the little place, running up the side of a small hill, lay almost solitary in the bright sunshine. The master of the gite, or small inn, however, was sitting at his own door with an ancient companion, feeble and white-bearded, and they made some comments to one another upon the young stranger as he approached, which were not very favourable to monks in general. "'Oh, he is going to the Grey Friars Monastery, doubtless,' said the host to his companion, "'and doubtless they fare well there. He will have a jovial night of it after his journey, especially as this is Thursday. Ay, that's the time they always appoint for the women to come to confess, said the other, and I dare say they talk over all the sins they hear pleasantly enough. See, he seems tending this way. Not he, replied the landlord. We have but little custom from the brethren, though they can pay well when they will. But upon my life, I believe he is coming hither but perhaps tis but to ask his way. The stranger, however, did walk straight up to mine host of the inn, and instead of asking his way, inquired whether he could lodge there for the night. Assuredly, good father, replied the landlord in a very altered tone, 
This is a public sheet, though the prices are rather higher than they used to be because the country has been so run down. That matters not, answered the stranger. When can I sup? In an hour, father, supper will be on the table, answered the host. Would you like to go and wash your feet? They are mighty dusty. Not yet, replied the stranger. If I knew where to place my wallet in safety, I would go on a little further to see the sun setting from the hill. Come with me, come with me, said the host. I will show you your chamber, where you will have as good a bed as a baron could wish for, and a room not much bigger than a cell, it is true. But you will not mind that, for it is fresh and airy, and moreover it has a lock and key, which is more than many rooms have. The stranger followed in silence, was admitted to his room, and laid down the wallet. Then taking the key, almost as big as that of a church door of modern times, he issued forth from the inn again, and saying he would be back soon, he walked on to the other end of the street, where it opened out through a low mud wall upon the brow of the hill upon which the town was built. When clear of all houses, with his foot upon the green turf and the rocky descent below him, the young stranger crossed his arms upon his chest and stood gazing upon the scene around, with more of the air of a warrior than of a monk. He held his head high and seemed to expand his chest to receive fully the evening breeze, looking like a fine horse when first turned forth from a close stable, snuffing the free air before he takes his wild headlong career around the meadow. But the expression soon changed. Casting his eyes to the eastward, he just caught sight from behind the shoulder of the hill of the towers and battlements of Bourg, and a little further on, but more to the north, on the other side of the river, he perceived a wooded hill with a large square tower and some other buildings crowning the summit. A look of deep melancholy came upon his countenance. After gazing for several minutes, he turned his eyes toward the ground and fell into a deep fit of thought, as if debating some important question with himself. "'It will be a painful pleasure,' said he at length, "'but I will go. Let it cost what it may.' Once more he gazed over the prospect all around, and then, turning on his steps, he retraced his way back to the inn, where he found the landlord still seated at the door. "'Can you tell me,' he said, "'if Messire Jacques Coeur is now in Bourg?' "'No, that he is not, sir,' answered the landlord with great respect, dropping the title of father which he had previously bestowed upon his guest in favour of the grey gown. "'He is somewhere about Montereau, with his highness the dauphin that is unlucky said the other just remarking and no more the landlord's change of manner toward him and the substitution of the words sir and father well i will sup and go upon my way had you not better sleep here sir asked the landlord again avoiding the word father perhaps they are not prepared for you and you must have travelled far i suppose the other held to his resolution however without taking any outward notice of the great alteration in the man's demeanour but when he retired to his chamber to wash his feet before supper he found confirmation of a suspicion that the vaunted lock of his door had more keys than one nothing was abstracted indeed from his wallet but the contents had been evidently examined carefully since he left the house small as was the amount of baggage it contained there were several articles which bore the name of jean charost de bracy Night had fallen by the time that supper was over, and the stars shone out bright and clear when the young wanderer once more resumed his journey and took his way direct toward the castle he had seen upon the hill. Onward he went at an unflagging pace, descended from the higher ground into the valley, crossed the little river by its stone bridge, and approached the foot of the eminence where the tower stood. Large dogs bayed loudly as he came near the entrance of the castle, and one or two men were seated under the arch of the barbican. But Jean Charost's impatience had been growing with every step, and without pausing to put any questions or to ask permission, he passed the drawbridge, crossed the little court, and mounted the steps leading into the great hall. One of the men had followed him from the barbican, but did not attempt to stop him. Two of the dogs ran by his side, looking up in his face, and a third gambled wildly before him, whining with a sort of anxious joy. 
the great hall was quite dark but he found his way across it easily enough mounted a little flight of five steps and opened the door just above there were lights in that room and madame de brecy was there seated embroidering while little agnes now greatly expanded both in form and beauty sat beside his mother sorting the various coloured silks his feet were shod with sandals but his mother knew the tread she started up and gazed at him the instant after her arms were round his neck and agnes was clinging to his hand and covering it with kisses welcome welcome home my son cried madame de brecy has this hard lord then relented we heard that you were ill very ill and ere three days more had passed agnes and i would have set off to join you in england we waited but for safe conducts to depart i have been ill dear mother replied the young man and that obtained me leave to return for a time but do not deceive yourself i have not come back to stay indeed so brief must be my absence from my prison so hopeless is the errand on which i came that i had doubts whether i ought to pause even here to give you the pang of parting with me again i have only obtained leave upon parole to absent myself from london for three months in order to seek a ransom my only hope is in jacques coeur he perhaps can help us on easier terms than any one else will consent to i find however that he is not in bourg and i must go on to-morrow to montereau to seek him for well nigh three weeks of my time is already expired tis a long journey from england hither on foot ah my poor son cried madame de brecy our fate has been a sad one indeed but yet why should we complain we share but the unhappy fate of france and heaven knows she has deserved chastisement were it for nothing else but the bloody and unchristian feuds which have brought this evil upon her let us hope yet mother let us hope yet said jean charost the very feeling of being once more at home in this dear home where so many sunny days have passed rekindles the nearly extinguished fire and makes me hope again in despite of probability but why did you come on foot dear jean cried agnes clinging to him it was not for want of money was it oh i would gladly have sold all those pretty things you gave me long ago to have bought a horse for you though our dear mother says we must save everything we can in order to pay your ransom no dear child no replied jean charost there were other reasons for my coming on foot i could not come with my lance in my hand and my pennon and my band behind me and for a solitary traveller well dressed and mounted on a good horse it is dangerous to cross the country between Arfleur and bourg but it is vain to think of saving my ransom my only hope is to get it diminished and then to obtain the means of paying it both through jacques coeur diminished said madame de brecy eagerly is there a chance of that her son explained to her that a conference had already taken place between the dauphin and the duke of burgundy with a view to arrange the terms of peace jacques coeur he said has great influence with our own royal prince and i believe that i myself stand not ill with his highness of burgundy although heaven knows i have never sought his favour if the dauphin will condescend as perhaps he ought to make the liberation upon moderate ransom of several gentlemen taken at azincourt a stipulation in the treaty i think i have a fair claim to be among them there is another interview i find to take place in a few days and i must not miss the opportunity i bear his highness letters from his cousin the young duke of orleans and several other gentlemen of high repute let us hope then my mother at least till hope proves vain here will i rest to-night and speed onward again to-morrow perhaps i may lose my labour and have to travel back to england and to captivity then we will go with you jean said madame de brecy you shall stay no more alone in a prison yes yes let us go with you cried agnes eagerly drowning jean charost's reply we can all be as happy there as here it is not the walls or the earth that make a cheerful home it is the spirits that are in it thou art a young philosopher said jean charost with a smile but we will see the next morning jean charost was upon his way toward montereau still dressed in his monkish garb 
for the proverb proved true in his case but now mounted on an old mule the very beast that had carried the duke of orleans on the night of his assassination it had been given to him by the duchess when last he saw her and when she felt the hand of death pressing heavily upon her the journey was too much for one day twenty-three leagues as they counted them in those days when leagues were leagues and they had kings in france but jean charost resolved to push on as far as possible and by night of the second day he had reached the small town of moret whence a short morning's ride would bring him to montereau it was dark when he arrived but the small village was full of armed men and round the doors of many of the houses were assembled gay groups some seated on the ground some on benches some on empty barrels laughing drinking and singing with all the careless merriment of soldiery in an hour of peace lights burned in the windows lanterns and sometimes torches were out at the doors and the yellow harvest moon was rolling along the sky and shedding from her golden chariot wheels a glorious flood of light doubtless there was a good deal of ribaldry in the words doubtless there was a good deal of licentiousness in the hearts of those around but yet there was a joyous exuberance of life a careless happy thoughtless confidence an infectious merriment that was difficult to resist the ringing laughter the light song the gay jest the cheerful faces all seemed to ask jean charost as he passed along why should you take thought for the morrow when you can never tell that a morrow will be yours why should you have care for the future when the future is disposed of by hands you cannot see rejoice rejoice in the present day eat drink and be merry for to-morrow you die many a jest assailed the friar and his mule as they passed along but jean charost was in no mood to suffer a jest to annoy him his hopes had increased as he came near the spot where they were to be fulfilled or extinguished and the scene around him was certainly not calculated to bid them depart too soon at the door of a small inn he stopped and asked if he could find entertainment but the landlord rolled out a fat laugh and told him no not if he could make himself as small as the constable's dwarf we are all as full here he said as we can hold and running over with the dauphin's men-at-arms i doubt whether you will find a quarter of a bed in the whole place at the great sheath there that place which looks so dull and melancholy you will have a better chance than anywhere else for maitre longrin has raised his prices above the tax because he expects the lords and commanders to stay there but i don't think they will prefer his bad wine to my good and pay more for it thither however jean charost turned his mule and here the answer was much the same as before combined with the saucy intimation that they did not want any monks at that house and the young gentleman was turning away thinking with some anxiety how he could feed and stable his beast when he saw a man dressed apparently as a superior officer examining somewhat closely the mule which he had left tied to the tall post before the inn he was not fully armed although he had a hobegon on and his head was only covered with a plumed cap though tall and well formed he stooped a little and as he drew back a step or two when the young gentleman approached to mount he seemed to move with some difficulty and limped as he walked jean charost put his foot into the stirrup mounted and was about to ride away when the stranger called to him somewhat roughly saying where got you that mule monk it was a gift replied jean charost in a quiet tone turning his face full toward the speaker a gift not from a palmer to a convent cried the other but from a lady to a soldier and in a moment after his arms were thrown around jean charost while he exclaimed with a laugh why don't you know me de bracy i am not so much metamorphosed as you in all your monkery in heaven's name what are you doing in this garb and in this place where do you come from what are you doing some said you were killed at azincourt one man swore to me he saw you die another told me you were a prisoner in england and i have always supposed the latter was the case for i have found in my own case how difficult it is to get killed they have nearly chopped me to mincemeat but here i am what is left for me that is to say the young gentleman gave his old companion all the information he desired telling him moreover not without some hopes of assistance 
the difficulties under which he just then laboured oh come with me come with me said juvenal de royan i am captain of a company of horse archers and every one bows down in reverence to me here you shall have half of my room if they will give you none other and leading him back into the inn he called loudly for the host here master langrin he exclaimed when the uncivil functionary whom jean charost had before seen made his appearance again this gentleman is a friend of mine he must have accommodation there i know what you will say you must make it if you have not got it i took the gentleman for a monk sir said the host with all humility a monk cried de royan the gown does not make the monk where were your eyes i will answer for it he has got a steel coat on under that gown but he must have some rooms at all events there are none empty but those reserved for madame de giac replied the landlord and all the men are obliged to sleep four or five in a bed well put him in madame de giac's rooms cried de royan with a laugh i dare say neither party will object to the arrangement at all events you must find him some place i insist upon it i will quarter all my archers upon you if you don't eat out all you have got in the house and drink up all your wine take ten minutes to consider it and then come and tell me in the den where you have put me bid some of my people to look upon monsieur de brecy's mule and look to it well for before it carried him it carried as noble a prince as france has seen or ever will see come old friend i will show you the way when jean charost was seated in the room of juvenel de royan a lamp lighted and his companion stretched out at ease partly on his bed and partly on a settle the latter assumed a graver tone and de bracy perceived with pain that he was both depressed in mind and sadly shattered in body twelve years of almost incessant campaigning had broken down his strength and many wounds received had left him a suffering and enfeebled man god help me he said i try to bear up well de bracy and cannot make up my mind to quit the old trade i must die in harness i suppose but i believe what i ought to do would be to betake me to my castle by the garonne adopt my sister's son her husband fell at azincourt and feed upon the bouillons and medoc wine for the rest of my life i am never without some ache but now tell me what are your plans for as i am constantly on the spot i can give you a map of the whole country jean charost explained to him frankly his precise situation and de royan thought over it for some time in silence you must make powerful friends he said at length don't you know madame de giac every one knows that on that fatal night you were sent to her by the duke our lord and if so she must be under some obligations to you for your discretion i have remarked de royan replied the other that ladies generally hate those who have the power to be discreet that could be soon seen said de royan we can test it readily i see no use replied de bracy she is the avowed mistress of the duke of burgundy and of him i am going to ask no favour she may be his avowed mistress and no less a dear friend of his highness the dauphin answered de royan she was the duke's avowed mistress and no less a dear friend of his highness of orleans jean charost gave a shudder heaven forgive me he said if i lack charity but there is a dark suspicion in my mind de royan which would make me sooner seek a boon of the devil than of that woman ha said de royan raising himself partly from his bed if i thought that but no matter no matter we will talk of her no more what does she hear asked jean charost i will tell you all about it replied the other a conference took place some time ago in regard to the general pacification of the kingdom the duke of burgundy promised great things which he has never performed nor ever will and his highness the dauphin has summoned him to another conference here at montereau hard by the duke has hesitated for more than a month sometimes he would come sometimes he would not often urged that the dauphin himself should come to troyes where he lay with his forces and with the poor king and queen the dauphin said nay but promised all security if he would come hither john without fear has shown himself john with great fear however well considering that there are twenty thousand men with his prince in and around montereau nothing would serve him but he must have the castle given up to him for security and accordingly i and my men who kept it for his highness the dauphin 
were turned out to make way for who do you think nay i cannot tell replied jean charost perhaps james de la ligne master of the crossbow men who i hear is with the duke nothing of the kind answered de royen for good madame de giac her household and servants not an armed man among them she arrives here to-night goes on early to-morrow and the duke himself they say will arrive in the afternoon he came as far as bray sur seine five or six days ago but there he stopped and hesitated once more and one cannot tell whether he will come after all or not if he does he will come well accompanied for it is clear that his heart fails him is there any reason for his fear except that general doubt of all men which are wicked from the pictures in their own heart asked jean charost juvenel de royen raised himself completely and sat on the edge of the bed bending slightly forward and speaking in a lower tone i cannot tell he said slowly and thoughtfully but there is a general feeling abroad no one can tell why that if to-morrow's interview does take place something extraordinary will happen it is all vague and confused no one knows what he expects but every one expects something we have no orders for extraordinary preparation the side of the castle next to the fields is to be left quite free and open for the duke and his people to come and go at their pleasure and everything seems to indicate that his highness meditates nothing but peaceful conference yet i know that as soon as i hear the duke is in the castle of montereau i will have every man in the saddle and every horse out of the stable in order to act as may be needed but you must have some reasons for such apprehensions said jean charost none none upon my word replied juvenel de royen the only way i can account for the general feeling is that every man of our faction knows that john of burgundy is an enemy to france that his ambition is the great obstacle to the union of all frenchmen against our english adversaries and that it would be good for the whole country if he were dead or in prison perhaps what every one wishes every one thinks may happen but now de bracy once more to your own affairs your plan is a good one his highness in consenting to any peace ought to stipulate for the liberation of his friends upon a moderate ransom and yours is certainly unreasonable but how to get at him is the question in order to ensure that your name may be among those stipulated you will not use madame de giac nay but i have two means of access answered jean charost i have a letter for his highness from the young duke of orleans my fellow prisoner and i hear that my good friend jacques coeur has very great influence with the royal prince juvenel de royen mused before he answered the letter may not do what you want he said at length for you must see the prince before this interview takes place and when you present the letter a long distant day may be appointed for your audience jacques coeur can doubtless procure your admission at once if he be in montereau he was there certainly three days ago and supplied his highness liberally they say to his great joy for he was well nigh penniless but the rumour ran that he was to depart for italy yesterday then the case is hopeless said jean charost with a sigh a silence of some minutes succeeded but then de royen looked up with a smile not hopeless he said not hopeless i have just thought of a way more sure than any other first i will give you a letter to my friend and cousin Tanegui du Châtel, who is high in the Dauphin's confidence. There, however, you might be put off, but there is another means in your own hand. Do you remember Mademoiselle de saint Geran, the beautiful Agnes? People used to think that you were in love with her, and she with you, though she was but a girl, and you little more than a boy in those days. I remember her well, replied Jean Charost, and have a high regard for her. So has the Dauphin answered juvenel de royen with a meaning smile you do not mean to say cried jean charost but his companion interrupted him i mean to say nothing replied de royen in fact men know nothing but what i have said it is clear his highness has a great regard for her reverences her advice follows it even in affairs of war and policy and were it not that his wife reverences and loves her just as much there would be no doubt of the matter for her exquisite beauty i never thought her very beautiful said jean charost her form was fine and her face was pretty but that is all 
"'Oh, but there has been a change,' answered de Royan. "'She is the same, and yet another. "'It is impossible to describe how beautiful she has grown. "'Every line in her face has become fine and delicate. "'The colours have grown clear and pure. "'The roses blossom in her cheek. "'The morning star is sparkling in her eyes, "'warm as the summer, yet dewy as the daybreak. "'But that is not all. "'There is an inconceivable grace in her movements, "'unlike anything I ever saw.' Her quickest gesture is so easy that it seems slow, and her lightest change of attitude brings out some new perfection in her symmetry, and through the whole there seems a soul, a spirit shining like a light upon everything around. Why, the old Bishop of Longre himself said the other day that from the parting of her hair to the sole of her foot she was all beauty. The good man, indeed, said he did not know whether it was the beauty of holiness but he hoped so. "'Why, you seem in love with her yourself, de Royan,' answered Jean Charost. "'Go and see, go and see,' replied his companion. "'She will greet you right willingly, for she is mild and humble, and ever glad to welcome an old acquaintance.' "'But where can I find her?' asked Jean Charost. "'Oh, you will find her at the stranger's lodging at the Abbey,' answered de Royan. "'The Dauphin has his headquarters there, with the Dauphiness, and two or three of her ladies. Were I you, I would go to her the first, for her influence is certain, however it comes. But you must change your monk's garb, man, for though they lodge us at the abbey, the court is not very fond of the friars. Ah, here comes the landlord. Now, Monsieur Langrin, what has made you so long? The arrival of Madame de Giac, sir, answered the host. I can but give the gentleman a mere closet to sleep in, which I destined for another, but of course, as your friend, he must have it, and as for supper, it is on the table, with good wine to boot. End of chapter 34「Chapter 35 of Agnes Sorrel by G. P. R. James. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Chapter 35 towns have their varying expressions as well as human faces and the aspect of montereau on the tenth of september one thousand four hundred and nineteen presented a curious appearance but one with which those who have lived long on the face of the earth must sometimes have seen in moments of great excitement and expectation the city looked gay for it was filled with people and the splendour loving soldiery in their arms seen in every direction gave a brilliancy to the streets which in ordinary times they did not possess the day was bright and beautiful too one of those clear warm september days which often succeed a frosty morning and the trees which were then mingled with the vineyards on the heights of surville caught the rays of the sun upon foliage gently tinged with the tints of autumn the bells of the churches rang out for it was the sabbath and many a fair dame, in sparkling attire and with rosary on wrist, flaunted her Sunday finery along the streets, or might be seen gliding in through the dark portal to join in the service of the day. Still, there was a sort of silent solemnity over the place, an uneasy calm, if I may use an expression which seems to imply a contradiction, an oppressive expectation. Whenever the bells ceased, there seemed no other sound. Men walked in groups and spoke not. Even the women bated their breath and conversed in lower tones. Early in the morning a gay train had passed into the castle, after circling the town till a gate, opening beyond the walls into the fields, had been reached. There were ladies and waiting women, and several gentlemen of gallant mien, and a small troop of archers. But the castle gates swallowed them up, and nothing more was seen of them for several hours. From time to time two or three horsemen rode out of the town, and sometimes a small party re-entered it, but these were the only occurrences which gave any appearance of movement to the scene till after the hour of noon. About nine o'clock in the morning, indeed, a young man, in the dress of a monk, rode in on a mule, put up his beast at a stable, where he was obliged to use the name of the Marquis de Royan, to obtain any attention. 
and then proceeded on foot to a large house situated near the bridge over the Yon. There were a number of people at the door, and he made some inquiries, holding a letter in his hand. The answer seemed unsatisfactory, for he turned away, and walked through the town, inquiring for the abbey, which lay upon the other side. There were no signs of approaching the precincts of a court, as Jean Choros proceeded on the way he had been directed. The two streets through which he passed were nearly deserted, and being turned from the sun looked cool and desolate enough. He began almost to fancy he had made a mistake, when, on the opposite side of a little square or close, he saw a large and very beautiful building, with a church at one end of it, and a row of stone posts before it. All that was left of it, as far as I remember, in 1821, was one beautiful doorway, with a rounded arch overhead, sinking deep with moulding within moulding, of many a quaint and curious device, till it made a sort of niche, under which the traveller might find shelter from the sun or rain. It was, when I saw it, used as the entrance to a granary, but two guards with halberts on their shoulders, walking slowly up and down, and three or four servants loitering about, or sitting on the steps, showed that it had not been turned to such base uses in the year of our Lord, 1419. Directly toward this door de Bracy took his way, giving a glance round as he passed the corners of the houses opposite, and obtaining a view, down a short street, of the gently flowing Seine, with its ancient bridge and the walls of the old castle. There seemed to be some curious erections on the bridge, a little pavilion with a flag fluttering on the top, and several large wooden barricades. But de Bracy paused not to inquire what they meant, and walking straight on to one of the servants, inquired if the Seigneur du Châtel were there, adding that he had been directed thither from his quarters. The young gentleman spoke with a tone of authority, which probably, as well as the glistening of a military hobergeon above the neck of the monk's frock, procured him a civil answer. "'He is here, sir,' answered the servant, "'but is in deep conference with His Highness the Dauphin and several other lords.' He can in no way be interrupted. "'Give him that letter when he comes from the council, and fail not,' said Jean Charost. "'Moreover, I must beg of you to see immediately the principal officer of His Highness's household, and inform him that the Baron de Brécy, a prisoner of Azincourt, has arrived from England, bearing a letter for the Dauphin, from His Highness the Duke of Orléans, and craves leave to lay it at his feet as soon as his convenience serves.' "'I fear, sir, that will not be speedily,' said the servant. "'Where may you be found when His Highness has occasion?' "'If Mademoiselle de saint gerin be at the court,' replied Jean Charost, "'a little discouraged by the impediments he had met with, "'I will crave an interview with her. "'You may tell her,' he added, "'seeing the man take a step back as if to enter the building, "'that Monsieur de Brécy waits, an acquaintance of her childhood, "'whom he trusts she may remember.' "'You had better follow me, sir,' said the servant. "'She is here, and was alone some half-hour ago.' Jean Charost followed the man into the abbey, one whole wing of which seemed to be appropriated to the Dauphin and his train. No monks were visible, but still the dim religious light of the long passages and arched cloisters, the quiet courts, and galleries rich in grey stone fretwork, had a solemnity, if not a gloom, which Jean Charost thought must contrast strangely with some of those wild courtly revelries which chequered the fierce strifes and fiery passions of the age. Passing by a number of small doors leading to the cells along the cloister, where probably the inferior followers of the court were quartered, the young gentleman was led to the foot of a flight of highly ornamented stairs, carried boldly up through a wide, lightsome hall, round which it turned, and carved and supported, with such skill and delicacy that it seemed actually to hang in air. At the top ran round a gallery, screened by fine tracery of stonework from the staircase hall, and on the other hand, all round, except where the window was placed to afford light, were doors, and the opening of corridors over the arch of one of which appeared a mitre, showing that there had formerly been the apartments of the abbot. The servant passed on to the next corridor, and then led the visitor along to the very end, where, after knocking at a door, 
He entered, said a few words, and then opened the door wider for Jean Charost to pass in. It was a small but richly decorated room he entered, with a door apparently leading to another beyond, and at a table covered with many-coloured silks, which she seemed sorting into their different shades, sat a lady, magnificently dressed. She raised her eyes, beautiful and full of light, but with no glance of recognition in them, and for a moment de Bracy fancied there must be some mistake. There was a certain vague, shadowy likeness to the Agnes Sorrel he had formerly known, but there was a strange difference. It was the diamond polished, compared with the diamond dull from the mine. The next instant, however, the likeness suddenly became more strong. Remembrance seemed to flash up in the countenance of the lovely creature before him. She threw down the silk, rose hastily from the table, and exclaimed with a beaming smile, "'Ah, Monsieur de Bracy, he did not give your name rightly.' She was in the very act of advancing to meet him, but suddenly she paused, and from some cause unexplained, a warm blush rushed over her cheek and forehead, and then, the moment after, she turned deadly pale. She recovered herself speedily, welcomed him most kindly, made him sit down by her, and listened to all he had to say. She answered him, too, with every mark of interest, but from time to time she fell into a deep, silent fit of thought, during which her spirit seemed to take wings and fly far away. "'Forgive me, Monsieur de Bracy,' she said at length, "'if I seem sometimes inattentive and absent. Your sudden and unexpected coming carries me back continually to other days, without leaving me any power of resistance. I know not whether to call them happier days, though they were happier in one sense. They were days full of hopes and purposes, alas, not to be accomplished. But we learn hard lessons, Monsieur de Bracy, in this severe school of life. We learn to bear much that we thought we could never bear. And by constantly seeing changes and chances, and all that befalls others, learn to yield ourselves unresisting to our fate, with the sad philosophy of enjoying the day, from a knowledge that we will have no power over the morrow. Oh, what a lapse of strange things there seems to be since you and I last met! The frightful murder of the poor Duke of Orléans, and your own undeserved sufferings, mark out that distant time for memory as with a monument. Between that point and this, doubtless, much has occurred to both of us that can never be forgotten. But, God help us, it is well to curb memory with a strong hand, that she run not always back to the things past, for the course of all mankind is onward. Now, let us talk of what can be done for your deliverance. You must, of course, see His Highness the Dauphin before his meeting with the Duke of Burgundy, and I think I can warrant that he will make a strong effort for your deliverance. He is a noble and generous prince, and will do much to serve his friends, though, heaven knows, he has had discouragement enough to weary the heart, and sink the energies of any one. Nothing but selfishness around him, taking all the many shapes of that foul, clinging fiend which preys for ever upon human nature, ambition, covetousness, petty malice, calumny, sordid envy, ingratitude, Wherever he turns, there is one of its hateful hydra heads gaping wide-mouthed upon him. Yes, you must certainly see him before the meeting, for no one knows when there may be another. The meeting! What will be the parting? She fell into a fit of thought again, but it lasted not long. And, looking up, she added, I know not how it is, Monsieur de Bracy, but a certain sort of dread has come upon me in regard to this meeting, and every one who approaches me seems to feel the same. I cannot help remembering that this man who comes hither to-day murdered his own first cousin when pretending the utmost affection for him, and vowing peace and amity at the altar, and I should fear for the Dauphin's safety if I did not know that he has twenty thousand men in this place and neighbourhood, and that every possible precaution has been taken. What is it, I wonder, makes me feel so sad? Do you think there is any danger?' "'I trust not,' replied Jean Charost. "'They tell me the two princes are to meet within barriers, "'assisted by some of their most experienced counsellors. "'And though the castle has been given up to the duke, "'yet the Dauphin's force is so much superior to any Burgundian body, "'which could be brought up, "'that it would be madness to attempt any surprise.' "'Could he not secretly introduce a large force into the castle?' "'asked Agnes, and rushing suddenly upon the bridge, 
make the Dauphin his prisoner? He will be taken in the flank and rear, replied de Precy, and speedily punished for his temerity. No, dear lady, as far as I can judge, the interview must be a very safe one. But if you wish, I will go and make further inquiries. No, no, she replied, you must stay here. The council may break up at any moment, and I will then introduce you to his highness, provided they do not sit till after the dinner hour, when it would be well for you to go away and return. The duke, they say, will not be here till two or three o'clock, but he has sent word from Bray that he will assuredly come. Nay, is not Madame de Gillac in the castle? That is a certain sign of his coming. Now, let us talk of other things, and turn our eyes once more back to other days. I love sometimes a calm, dreamy conference with memory, as one sits over a fire at eventide and sees misty pageants of the mind rise up before the half-closed eyes, all in a bright, soft haze. Do you recollect that boy who played so beautifully upon the violin? He is now the chief musician to Her Highness the Dauphiness. Would he were here, he would soon soften down all hard fears and doubts with sweet music. Jean Charost took his tone from her, and the conversation proceeded, quietly and tranquilly enough, for more than an hour. Agnes Sorrel sometimes reverting to her companion's actual situation, but more frequently suffering her thoughts to linger about the past, as those are inclined to do who feel uncertain of the present or the future. Twice she turned the little hourglass that stood upon the table, but at length she said, "'It is in vain to wait longer, Monsieur de Brécy. His Highness's dinner hour is now fast approaching. Return to me at two o'clock, and in the meantime, if possible, see Tanneguy du Châtel. He may befriend you much, for he is greatly in the Prince's favour, and, moreover, he is honest and true, though somewhat fierce, and rough of speech, and unforgiving.' But he is zealous and faithful for his prince, and, strange to say, no envier of other men who seem rising into power with less truth and less merit than himself. I will not say farewell, for we shall meet again shortly. Remember, two o'clock. Jean Charost retired at once, but as he found his way down the stairs he heard a door below thrown suddenly open, and several persons speaking and even laughing as they came out. In the hall, at the foot of the stairs, he found some twelve or fifteen persons, slowly moving across, some stopping for a moment to add a word or two more to something which had gone before, others hurrying on toward the door by which he had entered the building. Among the former was a tall, powerful man, exceedingly broad in the shoulders, with a long peacock's feather in his cap, who paused for an instant just at the foot of the stairs to speak with a thin old man in a black gown. Jean Charost had just passed them, when the servant with whom he had spoken before approached the taller man as if to speak to him, and before Jean had taken ten steps more, he heard his name pronounced aloud. "'Monsieur de Bracy! Monsieur de Bracy!' said the voice, and turning round he found the personage with the peacock's feather following him. His manner was quick and decided, and not altogether pleasant, yet there was a frankness about it which one often finds in men of a bold and ready spirit— where there is no great tenderness or delicacy of feeling, stern things and rough, but serviceable and sincere. "'This letter from de Royan,' he said, "'comes at a moment of some hurry. "'But your business wants speedy attention. "'Come to my house and dine. "'We will talk as we eat. "'We have not time for ceremony.' As he spoke, he took hold of Jean Charost's arm as if he had been an old friend, and drew him on with long strides, to the house at which the young gentleman had called in the morning. As they went, he inquired what he had done in the matter of his ransom, and when he heard that he had seen Mademoiselle de saint Geran, and interested her in his behalf, he exclaimed, "'Tis the best thing that could be done. I could not serve you as well as she can. Are you an old friend of hers?' "'I knew her when she was a mere girl,' answered Jean Charost. Du Châtel appeared hardly to hear his answer, for he seemed, like Agnes Sorrel, subject to fits of deep thought that day, and he did not wake from the reverie into which he had fallen till they reached the door of his dwelling. Then, as they were mounting the steps, he broke forth again with the words, "'She can do what she will. Lucky that she always wills well for France. Let me see.' Then, speaking to a servant, he added, "'Dinner instantly. 
Tell Marival to have my armour all laid out ready. Come, De Bracy, all I can do for you I will, but that is only to make you known to the Dauphin, and it must be hastily too. The fair Agnes must plead your case with him, though I think it will not need much pleading. While he had been speaking, he had advanced into a little room on the left-hand side of the entrance, where a small table was laid, as if for the dinner of one person, and throwing himself on a stool, he pointed to another, saying, if this interview ends well, I think there can be no doubt of your success. I trust it will end well, said Jean Charost. Is there any reason to think otherwise? Hm, said Tanneguy du Chatel. That will depend altogether upon the Duke of Burgundy. He is puffed up and insolent, and there be hot spirits about the Dauphin. It were well for him not to use such bold words as he has lately indulged in. We all mean him well and fairly. But if he ruffles his wings, as he has lately done, he may chance to go back with his feathers singed, and then, my good friend, your suit would be of no avail. Ah, here comes the pottage. Eat, eat, for we must be quick. It must be a strange thing, he continued, after he had taken his soup. It must be a strange thing to go about the world with the consciousness that every man in all the land believes your death will be the salvation of France. I should not like the sensation. Here, wine. Boy, give me wine. God send that this all ends well. If the Duke of Burgundy will but be reasonable, sacrifice some small part of his ambition to his country's good. Remember that he is a subject and a Frenchman, and fulfil his promises. We may see some happy days again, and drive these islanders from the land. If not, we are all at sea again. I trust he will, answered Jean Charost. But yet he is of a stern, unbending spirit, as I have cause to know. Ha! Has he been your enemy, too? asked Du Chatel. Not exactly, answered Jean Charost. Indeed, long ago he made me high offers, if I would enter his service. But it was an insult rather than a compliment, for he had just then caused the assassination of the Duke of Orléans, my noble lord. Du Chatel ground his teeth. Ah, the villain, he said. That is a score to be wiped off yet. But you must have done something to serve him previously. John of Burgundy is not a man to court any one without some strong motive of self-interest. I have often puzzled myself as to what could be his motive, answered Jean Charost with a smile, but I have never been able to guess at any inducement, unless it were some words of an astrologer at Pithivier, who told him I should be present at his death and try to prevent it. "'Heaven send the prophecy may soon be accomplished,' exclaimed Tanneguy du Chatel with a laugh. "'I longed to send my sword through him the other day at Troy, "'but I thought it would be hardly courteous in his own house when we were eating together. "'But if I could meet with him lance to lance in the field, "'I think one or the other of us would not ride far after.' "'Shall I give you more wine, my lord?' asked a page, advancing with a flagon. "'No,' replied his master. "'I am hot enough already.' Change that dish. What is there else for dinner? A man came in as he spoke, and said in a low tone, The Duke is on the road, my lord. Well, let him come, replied Du Chatel. We are ready for him. Perhaps he may not come on still, replied the man, for Antony of Toulongon and John of Hermé have been examining the barricades upon the bridge with somewhat dark faces, and have ridden out to meet the Duke, their master. "'Then let him stay away,' answered Du Chatel abruptly. "'We mean him no ill. He has been courted enough. "'It's his own conscience makes him afraid to come. "'Here is some hair, De Bracy. Take some wine, take some wine. "'You do not require so spare a diet as I do. Art's oh, life. They let you blood enough at Azincourt to keep you calm and tranquil.' "'When the brief, frugal dinner was over, Tanneguy Du Chatel started up, saying, "'I must go get on my harness.' You hurry back to the beautiful lady you wot of, and wait with her till you hear from me, unless the Dauphin comes in and your business is settled. If not, I will present you to him before the interview, in the good hope that matters will go smoothly, and some fair conditions be settled for the good of France. I know not what is in me today. I feel as if quickened by another spirit. Well, I must get on this armour. Thus saying, he left the room, and Jean Charost found his way back to the abbey, where he was kept some time before he obtained audience of Agnes Sorrel. When he was at length admitted, he found her seated with another lady somewhat younger than herself, 
and very beautiful also, with their arms thrown round each other's waists. Neither moved when the young gentleman entered, but Agnes, bowing her head, said, "'This is Monsieur de Bracy, madam, of whom I spoke to your highness. Monsieur de Bracy, I present you to the Dauphiness.' Jean Charost, it need hardly be said, was greatly surprised, and in some degree embarrassed, for the suspicions of others had created suspicions in himself, which he now mistakenly thought were mistaken. He paid all due reverence to the Dauphiness, however, and remained for nearly an hour conversing with her and the beautiful Agnes, who were both waiting anxiously, it seemed, for the appearance of the Dauphin. The part of the house in which they were was very quiet, but the sounds from the country came more readily to the ear than those proceeding from the town. Some noise, like a hoof-tramp of many horses, was heard, and the Dauphiness looked at Agnes anxiously. "'What is that? Can you see, Monsieur de Bracy?' asked the latter, and Jean Charost sprang to the window. "'A large party of horse,' he answered. "'I should judge from four to five hundred men.' "'It is the Duke,' exclaimed the Dauphiness. "'Dearest Agnes, are you sure there is no danger? Remember the Duke of Orléans.' "'True, madam,' replied Agnes, "'but he was well nigh alone. His Highness has twenty thousand men around him.' The Dauphiness cast down her eyes in thought, and the moment after one of the officers of the household entered, saying, "'Monsieur de Bracy, the Seigneur du Châtel, desires to see you below.' End of chapter 35Chapter thirty six of Agnes Sorrel by G. P. R. James. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Chapter thirty six. When Jean Charost reached the bottom of the great staircase, he found everything below in a state of great hurry and confusion. A number of persons were passing out, and stately forms and burnished arms and waving plumes were seen flowing along through the corridor like a stream. At the foot of the stairs stood Tanneguy du Châtel, in complete arms, with his right foot raised upon the first step, his knee supporting the pommel of a small battle-axe, and his hand resting on the blade of the weapon. His beaver was up, and the expression of his countenance eager and impatient. "'Quick, quick, de Bracy,' he said. "'The prince has gone on. We must catch him before the interview begins, if you would speed in your suit.' "'I am ready,' said the young man and on they hastened, somewhat impeded by the number of attendants and noblemen of the Dauphin's court, who were already following him toward the bridge over the Seine. They issued out of the abbey at length, and then made greater progress in the open streets. But nevertheless they did not overtake the prince and the group that immediately surrounded him, till he had reached the foot of the high arched bridge on which the barriers were erected. In the open space on either side of the road, between the houses and the water, were assembled a strong body of horse and two large companies of archers. A herald and a marshal kept the way clear for the prince and his train, and no one appeared upon the bridge itself but some men, stationed at each of the four barriers, to open and close the gates as the several parties passed in. On the opposite side of the river towered up the old castle, with its outworks coming quite down to the bridge, but nobody appeared there except a few soldiers on the walls. "'Here is Monsieur de Bracy, royal sir,' said Tanneguy du Châtel, approaching the Dauphin, a tall and graceful but slightly formed young man, the gentleman who has been a prisoner since Azincourt, of whom I spoke to your highness, as did also, I hear, your royal lady and Mademoiselle de saint Geran. The Dauphin turned partly round, and gave one glance at Jean Charost, saying, "'Bring him in with you, du Châtel. We will speak with him within the barriers, for, by all I see, my fair cousin of Burgundy intends to keep me waiting.' Thus saying, the Dauphin passed on with two or three other persons, the barrier being raised to give him admission. The man in charge of the gate seemed to hesitate at the sight of Jean Charost in his monk's gown, but du Châtel explained sharply, the Baron de Bracy, let him pass, I am his warrant. And the second barrier was passed in the same way as the first by the Dauphin and his immediate followers. But a number of the train remained between the two barricades, according to orders apparently previously given. 
the keeper of the second barrier made greater difficulty than the other to let jean charost pass and it was not till the dauphin himself turned his head and said let him enter that the rail was raised across the centre of the bridge a single light rail was drawn and in the space between that and the second barrier was placed a little pavilion decorated with crimson silk and furnished with a chair for the use of the prince he advanced at once toward it and seated himself and those who accompanied him in number about two or three and twenty gathered round and an eager conversation seemed to take place among them Tanaguy du Châtel mingled with the rest, approaching close to the side of the Dauphin, but Jean Charost remained on the verge of the group, unnoticed and apparently forgotten. Someone was heard to say something regarding the insolence of keeping his highness waiting, and then the voice of du Châtel answered in a frank tone, Not insolence, perhaps, suspicion and fear very likely. We wish him no ill, said the Dauphin, let him keep his promises and we will embrace him with all friendship perhaps he does not know that we are here go and summon him du chatel without reply tanneguy hastened away vaulted armed as he was over the rail which crossed the bridge at the centre and passed through the two other barriers on the side of the castle disappearing under the archway of the gate the eyes of most persons present were turned in that direction but the dauphin looked round with a somewhat listless air as if for some object with which to fill up his time and seeing jean charost he beckoned him up i am glad to see you monsieur de bracy he said they tell me you have a letter for me from my cousin of orleans were you not if i remember right a secretary of his father my uncle who was so basely murdered i was your highness replied jean charost permit me to present you the young duke's letter the dauphin took it but did not break the seal merely saying i grieve deeply for my good cousin's long imprisonment and if we can bring this stout-hearted duke of burgundy to anything like reasonable terms of accommodation i doubt not that we shall be able to conclude an honourable peace with england in which case his liberation shall be stipulated and yours too monsieur de bracy for i am told you not only served well and suffered much at azincourt but that your noble devotion to my murdered uncle had well nigh cost your own life rest assured you shall be remembered jean charost judged rightly whence the prince's information came and he was expressing his thanks when some of those who were standing round exclaimed the duke is coming your highness somewhat late said the young prince with a frown but better that than not come at all well go some of you and do him honour thus saying he rose and advanced slowly to the rail across the bridge on which he leaned crossing his arms upon his chest in the meanwhile a small party consisting of ten or twelve people were seen approaching from the gate of the castle at the first barrier they halted and a short consultation seemed to take place before it was finished they were joined by some six or seven noblemen who had left the group about the dauphin by his command they then moved forward again but some way in advance of them came Tanneguy du Châtel with a quick step and a flushed countenance. "'This man is very bold, my prince,' he said in a low tone. "'God send his looks and words may be more humble here, for I know not how any of us will bear it.' "'Go back, go back and bring him on,' said the Dauphin. "'He shall hear some truths he may not lately have heard. "'Be you calm, du Châtel, and leave me to deal with him. "'I will not spare.' eagerness to see all the strange scene that was passing had led jean charost almost close to the rail by the time that tanneguy du chatel turned and advanced once more to meet the duke of burgundy that prince was now easily to be distinguished a little in advance of his company and jean charost remarked that he had greatly changed since he last saw him though still a strong and active man he looked much older and deep lines of anxious thought were traced upon his cheek and brow at first his eyes were fixed upon the dauphin who continued to lean against the rail without the slightest movement but as he came on the duke looked to the right and left running his eyes over the prince's attendants and when about ten steps from the rail they rested firmly and inquiringly on the face of jean charost for a moment the sight seemed to puzzle him and then a look of recognition came over his countenance and the next instant he turned deadly pale 
A sort of hesitation was seen in his step and air, but he recovered himself at once, advanced straight to the Dauphin, and bent one knee to the ground before him, throwing his heavy sword behind him with his left hand. The Dauphin moved not, spoke not for a moment, but gazed upon the Duke with a heavy, frowning brow. "'Well, cousin of Burgundy,' he said at length, without asking him to rise, "'you have come at length. I thought you were going to violate your promise now, as in other cases.' "'I have violated no promises, Charles of France,' replied the Duke, in a tone equally sharp. "'Heaven is witness that you have,' answered the Dauphin. "'Did you not promise to cease from war? Did you not promise to withdraw your garrisons from from five cities where they still are the duke's face flushed his eyes sparkled and his brow contracted what he replied jean charost did not hear but seeing a gentleman close to the dauphin lay his hand upon his dagger he caught him by the arm whispering forbear forbear at the same moment one of the dauphin's officers who had gone to meet the duke took that prince by the arm saying rise sir rise you are too honourable to remain kneeling whether the duke heard or mistook him i know not but he turned sharply toward him with a fierce look and either moved by his haughty spirit or in order to rise more easily he put his right hand on the hilt of his sword and robert de loire exclaimed in a voice of thunder dare you put your hand on your sword in the presence of our lord the dauphin it is time that this should cease cried tanneguy du chatel his whole countenance inflamed and his eyes flashing fire and at the same moment he struck the duke a blow with the axe he carried in his hand burgundy started up and partly drew his sword but another blow beat him on his knee again and another cast him headlong to the ground a strong man named oliver de lager and another sprang upon him and thrust a sword into his body at the same moment a scuffle occurred at a little distance between one of the followers of the duke and some of the dauphin's party and jean charost saw a man fall but all was confused and indistinct horror surprise and a wild grasping effort of the mind to seize all the consequences to france to england to himself which might follow that dreadful act stupefied and confounded him everything passed as in a dream with rapid indistinctness to be brought out vivid and strong by an after effort of memory that the duke was killed at the very feet of the dauphin was all that his mind had room for at the moment the next instant a voice exclaimed look to the dauphin look to the dauphin and jean charost saw him staggering back from the rail as pale as death and with his eyes half closed it is not unlikely that many there present had contemplated as possible some such event as that which had taken place without any definite purpose of effecting it or taking any part therein popular expectation has often something prophetic in it and the warning voice which had rendered so many grave and thoughtful during the whole course of that morning must have been heard also by the actors of the scene which had just passed but one thing is certain and the whole history of the time leaves no doubt of the fact that the dauphin himself had neither any active share in his cousin's death nor any participation in a conspiracy to effect it they bore him back fainting to the little pavilion which had been raised for his accommodation and thence after a time led him in profound silence to the abbey while his followers secured a number of the duke of burgundy's immediate attendants and the soldiery crowding on the bridge threatened the castle itself with assault jean charost retired from the scene with a sad heart his hopes were disappointed his fate seemed sealed but though he felt all this bitterly yet he felt still more despondency at the thought of his unhappy country's fate personal rivalry selfish ambition greed of power and of wealth undisciplined valour insubordinate obstinacy were all urging her on to the verge of a precipice from which a miracle seemed necessary to save her the feelings which filled his breast at that moment were very like those expressed by the contemporary historian when he wrote quote, only to hear recounted this affair is so pitiful and lamentable that greater there cannot be and especially the hearts of all noble men and other true men natives of the kingdom of france must be of great sadness and shame in beholding those of such noble blood as of the fleur-de-lis 
so near of kindred themselves destroy one another and the same kingdom placed in consequence of the facts above mentioned and others past and done before in the way and the danger of falling under a new lord and altogether going to perdition End quote. End of chapter thirty six Chapter thirty seven of Agnes Sorrel by G. P. R. James. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Chapter thirty seven To dwell minutely upon a period unfilled by action and merely marked by the revolution of day and night, even in the life of a person in whom we have some interest, would be almost as dull as to describe in detail the turning of a grindstone. It is not with the eventless events of a history that we have to do nor with the flat spaces on the road of life we sit not down to relate a sleep or to paint a fish-pond little occurred to jean charost during the rest of his stay in france that is worth the telling which will not be referred to hereafter let us change the scene then and spreading the wings of fancy fly on through the air of time to a spot some years in advance there was an old house or rather palace and well it deserved the name situated near the great city of london close upon the banks of the river thames men now living can remember parts of it still standing choked up with houses like some great shell of the green deep encrusted with limpets and other tiny habitations of the vermin of the sea at the time of this history it had gardens running all around it extending wide and pleasantly on the water-side though but narrow between the palace itself and the stone battlemented wall which separated them from the great strand road leading from the temple gate of the city to the village of charing fretted and richly carved in some parts plain and stern in others the old palace of the savoy combined in itself the architecture of several ages many were the purposes it had served too sometimes the place of revelry and mirth sometimes the witness of the prisoner's tears it had been the residence of john king of france during his captivity in england some half century before and since that time it had principally served grown almost by prescription to be so used as an honourable prison for foreign enemies when the chances of war brought them in bonds to england in the midst of the embattled wall that i have mentioned and projecting a little beyond its line stood a great gatehouse which has long since been pulled down or has fallen perhaps without the aid of man and that gatehouse had two large towers of three stories each affording very comfortable apartments as that day went to their occasional tenants they were roomy and pleasant of aspect enough one of these towers was appropriated to the wardens of the savoy and their families while the other received at various times a great number of different denizens sometimes princes sometimes prisoners sometimes refugees people who remained but a few days people who passed there half a lifetime the stone walls within were thickly traced with names some scrawled with chalk or written in ink and among these the most conspicuous were records of the existence there for several years of persons attached to the unfortunate king john it was a cheerful building in those days nothing obscured the view or hid the sunshine and the smiling gardens the glittering river or the busy high-road could be seen from most of the windows of the palace in a room on the first floor of the eastern tower of the gatehouse jean charost is once more before us montereau's blood-stained bridge the dauphin and the murderers and the dying duke of burgundy have passed away and there are but two women with him yes i may call them women both though their ages are very far apart one is in the silver-haired decline of life the other is just blossoming they are the withered flower and the bud they were seated round a little table and had evidently been talking earnestly madame de brecy's eyes had traces of tears on them and those of the young girl turned up to jean charost's face were full of eagerness and entreaty in vain dear mother in vain said jean charost my resolution is as firm as ever jacques coeur is generous but i cannot lay myself under such an obligation and even at the most moderate rate to raise such a sum in the present state of france would deprive you of two-thirds of your whole income 
this captivity is weary to me to remain here year after year while france has been dismembered her crown bought and sold her fair fields ravaged her cities become slaughter-houses has been terrible has doubled the load of time has depressed my light spirits and almost worn out hope and expectation but yet i will not trust the fate of two so dear as you two are to the power of circumstances you say apply to lord willoughby i have applied but it is in vain he gives me as you know all kindly liberty no act of kindness or courtesy is wanting but on one point he is inflexible and we all feel and know that he is ruled by a power which he must obey it is the same with others who have prisoners of some consideration they cannot place them at reasonable ransom though the rules of chivalry and courtesy require it he seems a kind man jean said the young girl still looking in his face he spoke gently and good-humouredly to me ay gentleness and good-humour my sweet agnes said jean charost will not make a man disobey the commands of his monarch another month and i shall have lain a prisoner seven long years why agnes my hair is growing grey while yours is getting darker every hour i can recollect your locks like sunshine on a hill and now a raven's wing is hardly blacker ah i saw a grey hair the other day in that curl upon your temple said the girl with a laugh you will soon be a white-headed old man jean if you obstinately remain here when our dear mother would willingly sell all to free you though i think after all you are getting a little younger since we came we have now been three years with you in this horrible country and i think you look a year younger jean charost smiled saying certainly i do sunshine else do you shine in vain well i am going out to seek more sunshine said the girl i will wander away up the bank of the river and say an ave at the blackfriars church and then perhaps i will go into the church of the templars and look at the tombs of the old knights with their feet crossed and their swords half drawn and then i will come back again for then it will be dinner-time good-bye till then she tripped away with a light step down the staircase out upon the road and when jean charost looked after her out of the window he saw her going slowly and thoughtfully along but agnes did not continue that pace for any great distance as soon as she was out of the gate tower of the savoy she hurried on with great rapidity turned up a narrow lane between two fields on the west of the road and passing the house of the bishop of lincoln not even stopping to scent her favourite briar rose which was thick upon the hedges paused at a modern brick house modern in those days with towers and turrets in plenty and the arms of the house of willoughby hung out from a spear above the gate an old white-headed man sat upon some great stone bench beneath the archway and a soldier moved backward and forward upon a projecting gallery in front of the building a page playing with a cat was seen further in under the arch in a blue shade and one or two loiterers appeared in the court beyond on the side where the summer sun could not visit them agnes stopped by the porter's side and asked if she could see the lord willoughby doubtless doubtless said the man if he be not taking his forenoon sleep and that can hardly be for old thomas of erpingham has been with him and the right worshipful deaf knight's sweet voice would well nigh rouse the dead especially when he talks of azancourt go boy to our lord and tell him a young maiden wants to see him ah i can recollect the time when that news would have got a speedy answer but alack fair lady we grow slow as we get old sit you down by me now till the page returns and then the saucy fellows in the court dare not gibe agnes seated herself as he invited her but she had not waited long ere the boy returned and ushered her through one long passage to a room on the ground floor where she found the old lord writing a letter with some difficulty it must be confessed for he was no great scribe but very diligently he hardly looked round but continued his occupation saying what is it child the boy tells me you would speak with me when you have leisure my good lord replied agnes standing a little behind him but the old man started at her voice and turned round to gaze at her ah he exclaimed my little french lady is that you 
"'It is very strange. Your face always puts me in mind of someone else, and your tongue does so, too. However, there is no time in life to think of such things. Sit you down. Sit you down a moment. I shall soon have finished this epistle. Would it were in the fire. I have but a line to add.' He was near a quarter of an hour, however, in finishing that line, and Agnes sat mute and thoughtful, gazing at his face, and, as one will do when one has important interests depending on another, drawing auguries from every line about it. It was a good, honest, old English face, with an expression of frank good nature, a little testiness and much courtesy, and the young girl drew favourable inferences before she ended her reverie. At length the letter was finished, folded, sealed, and dispatched, and then turning to Agnes, the old soldier took her hands in his, saying, "'I am glad to see you, my dear. What is it you want? Our friend at the Savoy, your father, brother, husband, I know not what, is not ill, I hope?' "'Very ill,' replied Agnes in a quiet, gentle tone. "'Ha!' cried the old gentleman. "'How so? What is the matter?' he is ill at ease my lord sick at heart is in a fever to return to his own land you little deceiver cried lord willoughby laughing you made me anxious about the good young baron and now it is but the old story after all but why should he pine so to get back to france this is a fine country this is a fine city and god is my witness i do all i can to make him happy he is little more than a prisoner in name but still a prisoner my lord replied agnes with a touching earnestness the very name is the chain think you not that to a gentleman a man of free spirit the very feeling of being a prisoner is heavier than fetters of iron to a serf you may cage a singing bird my lord but an eagle beats itself to death against the bars would you be content to rest a captive in france however well treated you might be would you be content to know that you could not revisit your own dear land, see the scenes where your youth had passed, embrace your friends and relations, breathe your own native air? Would you be content to sit down at night in a lonely room, not in your own castle, and, looking at your wrists, though you saw not the fetters there, say to yourself, I am a captive nevertheless, a captive to my fellow man. I cannot go where I would, do what I would, I am bound down to times and places, a prisoner, a prisoner still, though I may carry my prison about with me. Would any man be content with this? And if so, how much less can a knight and a gentleman sit down in peace and quiet, content to be a prisoner in a foreign land, when his country needs his services, when every gentleman of France is wanted for the aid of France, when his king is to be served, his country's battles to be fought, even against you, my lord, and his own honour and renown to be maintained ay you touch me there you touch me there young lady said the old nobleman on my life for my part i would never keep a brave enemy in prison but have him pay only what he could for ransom and then let him go to fight me again another day monsieur de brace's father continued agnes simply died in a lost field against the english the son is here in an english prison Think you not that he envies his father? Perhaps he does. Perhaps he does, cried Lord Willoughby, starting up and walking backward and forward in the room. But what can I do? he continued, stopping before Agnes and gazing at her with a look of severe distress. The king made me promise that I would not liberate any of my prisoners so long as he and I both lived, without his special consent, except at the heavy ransoms he himself had fixed my dear child you talk like a woman and yet you touch me like a child but you can i am sure understand that it is not in my power or upon my faith in chivalry i would grant you what you desire the tears rose in agnes's beautiful eyes i know you would be kind she said but his mother insisted upon selling all they have to pay his ransom he would not have it for it would reduce her to poverty and I came away to see if I could not move you. Oh, my life, cried Lord Willoughby, I have a mind to send you to the king. Where is he? cried Agnes. I am ready to go to him at once. The old lord shook his head. He is in France, he said, 
and was going to add something more when a tall servant suddenly opened the door and began some announcement by saying my lord here is but he was not suffered to finish the sentence for a powerful middle-aged man unarmed but booted and spurred pushed past him into the room and lord willoughby exclaimed ha dorset what brings you from france has aught gone amiss there was some cause for the latter question for there was more than haste in the expression of the earl of dorset's countenance there was grief and there was anxiety with a hasty step he advanced to lord willoughby laid his hand upon his arm and said something in a low voice which agnes did not hear the old lord started back with a look of sorrow and consternation dead he exclaimed dead so young so full of life so needful to his people dorset dorset in god's name say that my ears have deceived me killed in battle huh some random bolt from that petty town of cone whither he was marching when last i heard it must be so he like the great richard was doomed to find such a fate to fall before an insignificant hamlet by a peasant's hand he exposed himself too much dorset he exposed himself too much dorset shook his head no he replied he died of sickness in his bed but like a soldier and a hero still calmly courageously without a faltering thought or sickly fear heaven rest his soul we shall never have a greater or better king but hark ye willoughby i must go on at once and summon the council come you up with all speed for there will be much matter for anxious deliberation and need of wise heads and much experience i will i will replied lord willoughby ho oh, boy without there get my horses ready with all speed farewell dorset i will join you in half an hour now odds life my sweet young lady i have forgot your presence what was i saying oh i remember now the course of earthly events is very strange that which brings tears to some eyes wipes them away from others come hither i will write a note to your young guardian and none but yourself shall be its bearer my duty to my king is done and i am free to act as i will stay for it it shall be very short he then drew a scrap of paper toward him and wrote slowly the ransom of the baron de bracy is diminished one half in witness whereof i have set my hand willoughby there take it dear child he said and let him thank god and thank you and drawing her toward him he imprinted a kind and fatherly kiss upon her forehead and then led her courteously to the door End of chapter thirty seven Chapter thirty eight of Agnes Sorrel by G. P. R. James. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Chapter thirty eight. Sometimes very small and insignificant occurrences, even when anticipated and prepared for, produce mighty and unforeseen consequences sometimes great and startling events the least expected and the least provided against pass away quietly without producing any immediate result henry v of england had returned to france in high health had triumphed over all enemies and had used the very storms and tempests of passion and faction as instruments of his will all yielded before him victory seemed his right health and long life his privilege and success the obedient servant of his will no one contemplated a change no one even dreamed of a reverse defeat was never thought of death was never mentioned there was no expectation no preparation but in the midst of triumph and activity and energetic power he was touched by the transforming wand of sickness few hours were allowed him to set his house in order and in the prime of life and the midst of glory the successful general the gallant knight the wise statesman the ambitious king closed his eyes upon the world and nothing but a mighty name remained what changes might have been expected to follow events so little contemplated yet very few if any occurred his last hours while writhing on a bread of pain sufficed to regulate all the affairs of two great kingdoms and his wisdom and foresight as well as his energy and resolution were never more strongly displayed than on the bed of death 
all remained quiet the sceptre of england passed from the hand of the hero to the hand of the child and in france no popular movement of any importance showed that the people were awakened to the value of the chances before them all remained quiescent the vigorous and unsparing hand of bedford seemed no less strong than had been that of his departed brother and reduced to a few remote provinces the party of the dauphin was powerless and inert it was while this state continued that three persons entered the old hall of the chateau of bracy just as the sun was going down the elder lady leaned with a feeble and fatigued air upon the arm of jean charost agnes had both her hands clasped upon his other arm and all three paused at the door and looked round with an expression if not somewhat sad somewhat anxious all were very glad to be there again all were very glad to be even in france once more but three years make a great difference in men in countries and in places and when we return to an ancient dwelling-place we are more conscious perhaps of the workings of time than at any other period we feel within ourselves that we are changed and we expect to find a change in external objects also we look to see a stone fallen from the walls the moss or mildew upon the panelling the monetary dust creeping over the floor the symptoms of alteration and decay apparent in the place of cherished memories there was nothing of the kind however to be seen in the old hall of the chateau of de bracy the evening rays of sunshine gliding through the windows shone cheerfully against the wall the room was swept and garnished all was neat and in good array and it seemed as if from that little circumstance alone hope relighted her lamp for their somewhat despondent hearts there will be bright days before us yet my son said madame de bracy in a calm grave tone oh yes there will be bright days said agnes warmly and enthusiastically we are back in france fair bright france we are back safe and well and there must be happy days for us yet i wonder said jean charost thoughtfully who has kept up the place so carefully we left but poor old augustine incapable of much exertion the friendly offices of jacques coeur must have had a hand in this not much sir said a voice behind him if that very excellent gentleman will permit me to say so jean charost turned round and perceived jacques coeur himself entering the hall with a stout little man in a gardener's habit i say a gardener's habit because in those blessed days called the good old times which had their excellences as well as their defects you could tell a man's trade calling profession or degree at least usually by his dress it was a good habit it was a beneficial habit it was an honest habit you could never mistake a priest for a life guardsman nor a shop boy for a prime minister nor the reverse in our own times alas in our days of liberty approaching license equality founded upon the grossest delusion and fraternity which as far as we have seen it carried is the fraternity of cain we are allowed to disguise ourselves as we will to sail under any false colours that may suit us to cheat to swindle and lie and deceive in whatever garb may seem best fitted for our purpose the vanity and hypocrisy of the multitude have triumphed not only altogether over sumptuary laws but in a great part over custom itself and i know nothing that a man may not assume except the queen's crown and god protect that for her and for her race for ever the gardener's habit however with the blue cloth stockings bound on with leathern straps was so apparent in the present instance that jean charost who was unconscious of having a gardener could not for an instant conceive who the personage was till the face of martin grille waxen like that of the moon at the end of the second quarter grew distinct to recollection he says true my good friend monsieur de bracy said jacques coeur and right glad i am his care should have so provided that your first sight of your own house on your return from captivity should be a pleasant one the only share i have had in this as your agent has been to let him do what he would tis explained in a word sir said martin grille you told me you could not afford to keep me while you were a prisoner 
and I thought I could afford to keep myself out of the waste ground about the castle, and keep the castle in good order too. I had always a fancy for gardening when I was a boy, and had once a whole crop of beans in an old saucepan at the top of the garret where my mother lived in Paris. The first five sous I ever had in my life was for an ounce of onion seed which I raised in a cracked pitcher. I was intended by nature for digging the earth, and not for digging holes in other people's bodies, and the town of Bourg owes me some of the best cabbages that ever were grown. When I am quite sure I would have reaped anything but a crop of glory if I had cultivated the fields of war. However, here I am, ready to take up the trade of valet again, if you will let me, and to show that I have not forgotten the mystery. I rubbed up all your old arms last night, brushed coats, mantles, jerkins, houseo, and everything else I could find, and swept up every room in the house to save poor old Augustine's unbendable back. In more ways than one the house was well prepared for the return of its lord, and, thanks to the care of good Martin Grille, a very comfortable supper had not been forgotten. It was a strange sensation, however, for Jean Charost, when the sun had gone down and the sconces were lighted, to sit once more in his own hall, a free man, with friendly faces all about him, a pleasant sensation, and yet somewhat overpowering. The tears stood in Madame de Brécy's eyes more than once during that evening, but Agnes, whose spirits were light, and who had fewer memories, was full of gay joyfulness. Jean Charost himself was very calm, but he often thought, had he been alone, he could have wept too. Thus some thought and some feeling was given to personal things, but the fate, the state, the history of his country during his absence occupied no small portion of his attention. In those days news travelled slowly. Great facts were probably more accurately stated and known than even now, for there was no complicated machinery for the dissemination of falsehood, no public press wielded by party spirit for the purpose of adulterating the true with the false. A certain generosity, too, had survived the pure chivalrous ages, and men, even during life, could attribute high and noble qualities to an enemy. But details were generally lost. Jean Charost was anxious to hear those details, and when they gathered round the great chimney and the blazing hearth, for it was now October and the nights were frosty, Jacques Coeur undertook to give his young friend some account of all that had taken place in France since the Battle of Azincourt, somewhat to the following effect. "'You remember well, my friend,' he said, "'that after the fall of Arfleur, John of Burgundy only escaped the name of traitor by a lukewarm offer to join his troops to those of France, in defence of the realm. But he was distrusted, and probably not without cause. You were already a prisoner in England when the Orleanist party obtained entire preponderance at the court, and the young duke being in captivity like yourself, the leading of that faction was assumed by his father-in-law, the Count of Armagnac. Rapid, great, and perilous was his rise, and fearless, bold, and bloody he showed himself. The sword of Constable placed the whole military power of France at his disposal, and the death of the Dauphin Louis left him no rival in authority or favour. Happy had it been for him that he contented himself with military authority, but he must grasp the finances too, and in the disastrous state of the revenues of the crown, the imposts, only justified by a hard necessity, raised him up daily enemies. His rude and merciless severity, too, irritated even more than it alarmed, and it was not long before all those who had been long indifferent went to swell the ranks of his adversaries. True, his party was strong. True, hatred of the Burgundian faction was intense in a multitude of Frenchmen. But the great lords, and many of the princes attached to the House of Orléans, were absent and powerless in English prisons. By every means that policy and duplicity could suggest, John of Burgundy strove to augment the number of his friends. All those who fled from the persecution of Armagnac were received by him with joy and treated with distinction. He increased his forces, he hovered about Paris, he treated the orders of the court to retire, if not with contempt, with disobedience. At length, however, he seemed to give up the hope of making himself master of the capital, and retreated suddenly to Artois. 
not judging his enemy rightly the count of armagnac resolved to seize the opportunity of an open path in order to strike a blow for the recovery of arfleur and leaving a strong garrison in paris he set out upon his expedition no sooner was he gone than john of burgundy hastened to profit by his absence and rapid negotiations took place between him and his partisans within the walls of paris you know the turbulent and factious nature of the lower order of citizens in the capital many of them were animated with mistaken zeal for the house of burgundy more were eager for plunder or thirsty for blood and one of the darkest and most detestable plots that ever blackened the page of history was formed for the destruction of the whole armagnac party and that too with the full cognizance of the duke of burgundy it was determined that at a certain hour the conspirators should appear in arms in the streets of paris seize upon the queen the king and the young dauphin john murder the whole of the armagnac faction and after having seized the duke of berry and the king of sicily load them with chains and make a spectacle of them in the streets of paris mounted on an ox and then put them to death likewise the plot was frustrated by the fears or remorse of a woman within a few minutes of the hour appointed for its execution precautions were taken the royal family placed in safety and tanneguy du chatel at the head of his troops issued forth from the bastille and made himself master of the houses and the persons of the conspirators there was no mercy my friend for any one who was found in arms some suffered by the cord or hatchet some were drowned in the seine and armagnac returning added to the chastisement already inflicted on individuals the punishment of the whole city of paris suspicion was received as proof indifference became a crime the prisons were filled to overflowing and the very name of burgundian was prescribed the troops of the duke of burgundy which had approached the city of paris were attacked in the open field and civil war in its most desolating aspect raged all around the metropolis every sort of evil seemed poured out upon france as if all the fountains of heaven's wrath were opened to rain woes upon the land another dauphin was snatched away from us and rumours of poison were very general but the death of one prince was very small in comparison with the treason of another there is no doubt de bracy that john of burgundy frustrated in his attempt upon paris entered into a league with the enemies of his country and secretly recognised henry of england as king of france the dissensions arose between the queen and the count of armagnac in which our present dauphin charles was so far compromised as to incur the everlasting hatred of his mother burgundy the queen and england united for the destruction of the dauphin and the count of armagnac and vengeance and ambition combined for the final ruin of the country the politic king of england took advantage of all and marched on from conquest to conquest throughout normandy while by slow degrees the duke of burgundy approached nearer and nearer to the capital the perils by which he was surrounded appeared to deprive armagnac of judgment he seemed possessed of the fury of a wild beast and little doubt exists that he meditated a general massacre of the citizens of paris but his crimes were cut short by the crimes of others the troops of burgundy were in possession of pontoise a well-disposed and peaceable young man insulted and injured by a follower of armagnac found means to introduce his enemies into the city of paris at the first cry of burgundy thousands rose to deliver themselves from the tyranny under which they groaned and headed by a man named caboche retaliated in a most fearful manner on the party of armagnac the evils which it had inflicted the prisons were filled the streets ran with blood and the count of armagnac himself forced to fly was concealed for a few hours by a mason only to be delivered up in the end the queen and the duke of burgundy encouraged the massacre the prisons were broken into the prisoners murdered in cold blood the chatelet was set on fire and the unhappy captives within its walls were driven back into the flames at the point of the pike and the leaders of the armagnac faction were dragged through the streets for days before they were torn to pieces by the people tanneguy du chatel alone showed courage and discretion and obtained safety if not success 
he rescued the dauphin in the midst of the tumult placed him in safety at melon returned to the capital fought gallantly for some hours against the insurgents and the troops of burgundy and then retired to counsel and support his prince the queen and the duke of burgundy entered the city in triumph flowers were strewed before her on the blood-stained streets and a prince of the blood royal of france was seen grasping familiarly the hands of low-born murderers that the powers which he had raised into active virulence were soon found ungovernable by the duke of burgundy and he determined first to weaken and then to destroy them the troops of assassins fancied themselves soldiers because they were butchers and demanded to be led against the enemy the duke was right willing to gratify them and sent forth two bands of many thousands each the first was beaten and nearly cut to pieces by the armagnac troops the remnant murdered their leaders in their rage of disappointment but did not profit by the experience they had gained the second party were defeated with terrible loss and fled in haste to paris but the gates were shut against them and dispersing they joined the numerous bands of plunderers that infested the country and were pursued and slaughtered by the troops of burgundy thus weakened the insurgents who had brought back the duke of burgundy to paris were easily subjugated by the duke himself their leaders perished on the scaffold and thousands of the inferior villains were swept away by various indirect means a still more merciless scourge however than either armagnac or burgundy was about to smite the devoted city a scourge that spared no party respected no rank or station the plague appeared in the capital and in the space of a few months the grave received more than a hundred thousand persons of every age class and sex in some of these events perished caboche the uncle of your servant martin grille who with the courage of a lion and the fierceness of a tiger combined some talents which better employed might have won him an honourable name in history and what has become of his son asked jean charost he was attached i think to the court of the queen he left her answered jacques coeur and came hither to bourg with marie of anjou the wife of the dauphin when that prince removed from melon to bourg you know somewhat of what happened after how his highness was driven hence to poitiers how negotiations took place to reunite the royal family how divided counsels ambitions and jealousies prevented anything like union against the real enemy of france how step by step the english king made himself master of all the country almost to the gates of paris you were present i am told at the death of the duke of burgundy shall i or shall i not call it murder well had he deserved punishment well had he justified almost any means to deliver france from the blasting influence of his ambition but at the very moment chosen for vengeance he showed some repentance for his past crimes some inclination to atone and perhaps the very effects of his remorse placed his life in the hands of his adversaries would to god that act had not been committed and what has followed asked jean charost i have heard but little since except that at arras a treaty was concluded by which the crown of france was virtually transferred to the king of england on his marriage with the princess catherine the scene is confused and indistinct said jacques coeur like the advance of a cloud overshadowing the land and leaving all vague and misty behind it far from serving the cause of the dauphin far from serving the cause of france the death of the duke of burgundy has produced unmitigated evil to all his son has considered vengeance rather than justice the memory of his father rather than the happiness of his country leagued with the queen and with the king of england he has sought nothing but the destruction of the dauphin and has seen the people of france swear allegiance to a foreign conqueror whom his connivance enabled to triumph from conquest to conquest the king of england has gone on till almost all the northern part of france was his and the river loire is the boundary between two distinct kingdoms here and there indeed a large town and a strong fortress is possessed by one party in the districts where the other dominates and a border warfare is carried on along the banks of the river but for a long time previous to king henry's death fortune seemed to follow wherever he trod and the whole western as well as northern parts of france were being gradually reduced beneath his sway 
During a short absence in England, indeed, a false promise of success shone upon the arms of the Dauphin. A reinforcement of six thousand men from Scotland enabled him to keep the field with success, and the victory of Bourget, the death of the Duke of Clarence, and the relief of Angers gave hope to every loyal heart in France. Money, indeed, was wanting, and I was straining every nerve to obtain for my prince the means of carrying on the war. When the return of Henry and his rapid successes at saint ange and the La Mousin cut me off from a large part of the resources I had calculated upon, and once more plunged us all into despair. The last effort in arms was the siege of Cône, on the Loire, garrisoned by the Burgundian troops. The Dauphin presented himself before its walls in person, and the Duke of Burgundy marched to its relief, calling on his English allies for aid. Henry was not slow to grant it, and set out from saint Lys to show his readiness and his friendship. Death struck him, it is true, by the way, but even in death he seemed to conquer, and Colin was relieved as he breathed his last at Vincennes. Happily have you escaped, de Bracy, for had the Lord Willoughby received intimation of the king's dying commands before he freed you, you would have lingered many a long year in prison. Well knowing that the captives of Azincourt would afford formidable support to the party of the Dauphin as soon as liberated, it has always been Henry's policy to detain them in London, and almost his last words were an order not to set them free till his infant son had attained his majority. You are the only one, I believe, above the rank of a simple esquire, who has been permitted to return to France. "'I owe it all to this dear girl,' answered Jean Charost, laying his hand upon the little hand of Agnes. "'She went to plead for me at a happy moment. But where is the Dauphin now? He needs the arm of every gentleman in France, and I will not be long absent from his army.' "'Army?' said Jacques Coeur, with a melancholy shake of his head. "'Alas, de Bracy, he has no army. Dispirited, defeated, almost penniless, seeing the fairest portions of his father's dominions in the hands of an enemy, that father's name and authority used against him, his own mother his most rancorous foe, the Duke of Burgundy at the head of one army in the field, and the Duke of Bedford hardly inferior to the great Henry, leading another, he has retired, almost hopeless, to the lonely castle of Polignac, and strives, I am told, but strives in vain, to forget the adversities of the past, and the menaces of the future in empty pleasures. An attempt must be made to rouse him, but I can do nothing till I have obtained those means, without which all action would be hopeless. To Paris I dare not venture myself, but I have agents there, friends who will aid me, and wealth locked up in many enterprises. Diligently have I laboured during the last month to gather all resources together, but still I linger on in Bourg without receiving any answer to my numerous letters. "'Cannot I go to Paris?' asked Jean Charos. "'You know, my friend of old, that I want no diligence, and had once some skill in such business as yours.' Jacques Coeur paused thoughtfully, and then answered, "'It might perhaps be as well. You have been so long absent, your person would be unknown. When could you set out?' Jean Charost replied that he would go the very next day, and the conversation was still proceeding upon these plans when the sound of a horse's feet was heard in the castle court, and in a minute or two after a tall, elderly, weather-beaten man was brought in by Martin Grille. Jean Charost looked at him, thinking that he recognised the face of Armand Chauvin, the chevaucheur of the late Duke of Orléans, but the man walked straight up to Jacques Coeur, put a letter in his hand, and then turned his eyes to the ground, without giving one glance to those around. "'This is good news indeed,' said Jacques, who had read the letter by the light of a sconce. "'A hundred thousand crowns, and two hundred thousand more in a month. What with the money from Marseilles, we may do something. This is good news indeed.' "'I have more news yet,' said Chauvin gravely. "'Hark in your ear, Monsieur Jacques. I have hardly eaten or drank, and have not slept a wink from the gates of Paris to Bourg, and Bourg hither, all to bring you these tidings speedily. Hark in your ear. And he whispered something to Jacques Coeur, and the other listened attentively, gave a very slight start, and appeared somewhat, but not greatly, moved. God rest his soul, he said at length. He has had a troublous life. 
God rest his soul. End of chapter 38chapter thirty nine of agnes sorrel by g p r james this librivox recording is in the public domain chapter thirty nine who has not heard of the beautiful allier who has not heard of the magnificent auvergne but the horseman stopped not to gaze at the mountains round him he lingered not upon the banks of the stream he hardly gave more than a glance at the rich limagne at clermont indeed he halted for two whole hours but it was an enforced halt for his horse broke down with hard riding and all the time was spent in purchasing another a crust of bread and a cup of wine afforded the only refreshment he himself took and on he went through the vineyards and the orchards loaded with the last fruits of autumn at issoir he gave his horse hay and water and then rode on at great speed to lompol but passed by its mighty basaltic rock crowned with its castle though he looked up with feelings of interest and regret as he connected it with the memory of louis of orleans at brioud he was forced to pause for a while but his horse fed readily and on he went again out of the narrow streets of that straggling disagreeable town over the mountains through the valleys with vast volcanic forms all around him and hamlets and villages built of the dark grey lava hardly distinguishable from the rocks on which they stood more than seventy miles he rode on straight from clermont and drew not a rein between brioud and puy which burst upon his sight suddenly on the eastern declivity of the mountains with its rich unrivalled amphitheatre and its three rivers flowing away at the foot the sun was within a hand's breadth of the horizon all the valleys seen from that elevation were flooded with light the old cathedral itself looked like a resplendent amethyst and devout pilgrims to a miraculous shrine still crowded the streets some turning on their way homeward some mounting innumerable steps to say one prayer more at the feet of the virgin jean charost rode straight up to the little old inn small and miserable as compared with many of the vast buildings appropriated in those days to the reception of the traveller in france and still smaller in proportion to the number of devout persons who daily flocked into the city but then the landlord argued that the pilgrims came for grace and not for good living and that therefore the body must put up with what it could get if the soul was taken care of jean passed under the archway into the courtyard gave his horse to a hustler of precisely the same stamp as the man who afforded a type to shakespeare and then turning back toward the street met the host in the doorway prepared to tell him that he must wait long for supper and put up with a garret i want nothing at present my good friend replied jean charost but a cup of wine which is ready at all times and some one to show me my way on foot to Espali. indeed i should not have turned in here at all but that my horse could go no further ah sir cried the host with his civility and curiosity both awakened together so you are going to see monsieur le dauphin news now i warrant and good i hope pray what is it excellent good replied jean charost first that a thirsty man talks ill with a dry mouth and secondly that a wise man never gives his message except to the person it is sent to the dauphin will be delighted with these tidings and so now give me a cup of wine and some one to show me the way ha you are a wag said the landlord but hark ye sir you had better make you had better take my mule it will be ready while i am drawing the wine and you drinking it though they say espali near puy it is not so near as they call it my boy shall go with you on a quick trotting ass to bring back the mule and the news said jean charost if he can get it so be it however for good sooth i am tired i have not slept a wink for six-and-thirty hours but let them make all haste as quick as an avalanche sir said the landlord and god speed you if you bring good news to our noble prince he loves wine and women and is exceedingly devout to the blessed virgin of puy so all men should wish him well and all ladies too the landlord did really make haste and in less than ten minutes jean charost was on his way to Espali, along a sort of natural volcanic causeway which paves the bottom of the deep valley 
The sun was behind the hills, but still a cool and pleasant light was spread over the sky, and the towers of the old castle, with their many weathercocks, and a banner displayed on the top of the donjon, rising high above the little village at the foot of the rock, seemed to catch some of the last rays of the sun, and flash back again the western blaze in lines of dazzling light. The ascent was steep, however, and longer than the young gentleman had expected. It was dim twilight when he approached the gates, but there was little guard kept around this last place of refuge for the son of France. Nested in the mountains of Auvergne, with a long expanse of country between him and his enemies, Charles had no fear of attack. The gates were wide open, not a solitary sentinel guarded the way, and Jean Charost rode into the courtyard, looking round in vain for someone to address. Not a soul was visible. He heard the sound of a lute, and a voice singing from one of the towers, and a merry peal of laughter from a long, low building on the right of the great court. But besides this there was nothing to show that the castle was inhabited, till, just as he was dismounting, a page, gaily tricked out in blue and silver, crossed from one tower toward another, with a bird-cage in his hand. "'Ho, oh, boy!' cried Jean Charost. "'Can you tell me where I shall find the servant of Mademoiselle de saint Geron? "'Or can you tell her yourself that the Seigneur de Brécy wishes to speak with her?' "'Come with me, come with me, beau sire, said the boy, with all the flippant gaiety of a page. "'I am going to her with this bird from his highness, and this castle is the abode of liberty and joy. "'All iron coats and stiff habitudes have been cast down in the chapel.' and a vow against idle ceremony is made by every one under the great gate. "'Well, then, lead on,' said Jean Charost. "'My business might well abridge ceremony, if any did exist. "'Wait here till I return,' he continued, speaking to the innkeeper's son, and then followed the page upon his way. The tower to which the boy led him was a building of considerable size, although it looked diminutive by the side of the great donjon, which towered above and with which it was connected by a long gallery in a sort of traverse commanding the entrance of the outer gate. The door stood open, as most of the other doors throughout the place, leading into an old vaulted passage, from the middle of which rose a narrow and steep staircase of grey stone. A rope was twisted round the pillar on which the staircase turned, and it was somewhat necessary at that moment, for, to say sooth, both passage and staircase were as dark as Acheron. Feeling his way, the boy ascended till he came to a door on the first floor of the tower, which he opened without ceremony. The interior of the room which this sudden movement displayed, though darkness was fast falling over the earth, was clear and light compared with the shadowy air of the staircase, and Jean Charost could see, seated thoughtfully at the window, that lovely and never-to-be-forgotten form which he had last beheld at Montereau. Agnes Sorrel either did not hear the opening of the door, or judged that the comer was one of the ordinary attendants of the place, for she remained motionless, plunged in deep meditation, with her eyes raised to a solitary star, the vanward leader of the host of heaven, which was becoming brighter and brighter every moment, as it rose high above the black masses of the Annie Mountains. "'Madam, here is a bird for you which his highness has sent,' said the page abruptly, some say it is a nightingale, and though his coat is not fine, he sings deliciously. Agnes Sorrel turned as the boy spoke, but she looked not at him, or the cage, or the bird, for her eyes instantly rested upon the figure of Jean Charost as he advanced towards her, apologising for his intrusion. Though what light there was fell full upon him through the open window, it was too dark for her to distinguish his features. But his voice she knew as soon as he spoke, though she had heard it but rarely. Yet there are some sounds which linger in the ear of memory, echoes of the past, as it were, which instantly carry us back to other days, and recall circumstances, thoughts, and feelings long gone by, with a brightness which needs no eye to see them, but the eye of the mind. The voice of Jean Charost was a very peculiar voice, soft and full and mellow but rounded and distinct like the tones of an organ possessing if such a thing be permitted me to say a melody in itself monsieur de bracy she exclaimed i am rejoiced to see you here no longer a prisoner i hope no longer seeking ransom but a free man what brings you to this remote corner of the earth some generous motive doubtless 
patriotism perhaps and love of your prince alas de bracy patriotism finds cold welcome where pleasure reigns alone and as to love would to god your prince loved himself as others loved him what shall i say to his highness madam asked the boy whom she had hardly noticed what shall i say about the bird tell him replied agnes rising quickly from her seat tell him that if i am a good instructor i will teach that bird to sing a song which shall rouse all france in arms ay little as it is and feeble as may be its voice i am not more powerful my voice is not more strong and yet i hope i hope get thee gone boy tell his highness what i have said tell him what you will say i am half mad if you please you for so i am to sit here idly looking at that mountain and that star and to think that the banners of england are waving triumphant over the bloody fields of france well de bracy well she continued as the boy retired and closed the door what news from the court of the conquerors what news from the proud city of london we have lost our henry but we have got a john in exchange what matters christian names in these unchristian times a plantagenet is a plantagenet and they are an iron race to deal with which requires more steel i fear than we have left in france my news dear lady replied jean charost is not from london but from paris well what of paris then asked agnes sorrel in an indifferent tone taking another seat partly turned from the window let me ask you to ring that bell upon the table it is growing dark we must have lights one star is not enough bright as it may be even the star of love one star is not enough to give us light in this darksome world jean charost rang the bell but ere any attendant could appear he said hurriedly dear lady listen to me for one moment i bring important news good or bad asked agnes sorrel quickly one half is unmingled good answered jean charost the other is of mixed nature full of hope yet alloyed with sorrow even that is better than any we have lately had replied agnes nevertheless i am a woman de bracy and fond of joy give me the unmingled first we will temper it hereafter well then dear lady i am sent to tell his highness from our good friend jacques coeur that a hundred thousand crowns of the sun are by this time waiting his pleasure at moulin and that two hundred thousand more will be there in one month joy joy cried agnes clasping her hands oh this is joyful indeed but then she added heaven send that it be used aright i fear oh i fear nay nay i will fear no more it is undeserved misfortune crushes the noble heart bows the brave spirit and takes its energy away from greatness have you told him de bracy what did he say how did he look not with light joy i hope but with grave expectant satisfaction as a prince should look who finds his people's deliverance nigher than he thought i have not seen him replied de bracy first because i knew not well how to gain admission and secondly because i wished that you should have the opportunity of telling him of a change of fortunes hoping knowing that you would direct his first impulses aright i i exclaimed agnes oh de bracy de bracy i am unworthy of such a task how should i direct any one aright yet it matters not what i be weak frail faulty as i am the courage and resolution the energy and purpose which once possessed me solely shall all that is left be given to him and to france one error shall not blot out all that is good in my nature ha here comes the lights she paused for a moment or two while the servant entered placed lights upon the table and retired and then in a much calmer tone resumed the discourse i have been much moved to-day she said but even this brief pause of thought has been sufficient to show me the right way lights you have done me service she added with a graceful smile come de bracy i will lead you to her who alone is worthy and fitted to give these good tidings to my friend to my dear good friend the princess his wife but have you forgotten replied jean charost i have other tidings to tell ha she said and those mingled i did forget indeed say what it is de bracy we must not raise up hopes to dash them down again that will not be the effect said de bracy the news i have is sad yet full of hope 
that which has been wanting on the side of his highness and of france in this terrible struggle against foreign enemies and internal traitors has been the king's name in his powerless incapacity the mighty influence of the monarch's authority has been arrayed against the friends and for the foes of france dear lady it will be so no more no more exclaimed agnes eagerly and with her whole face lighting up has he been snatched from their hands then tell me de bracy how when where but you look grave nay sad is the king dead charles the sixth is dead answered de bracy but charles the seventh lives to deliver france stay stay said agnes sorrel seating herself again and putting her hand thoughtfully to her brow poor king poor man may the grave give him peace oh what a life was his de bracy full of high qualities and kindly feelings born to the throne of the finest realm in all the world adored by his people how bright were once his prospects and who would ever have thought that the life thus begun would be passed in misery madness sickness and neglect that his power should be used for his own destruction his name lead his enemies to battle against his son his wife contemn despise and ill-treat him and his daughter wed his bitterest foe that he should only wake from his insane chances to see his kinsman murder and be murdered before his face all his sons but one pass into the tomb before him perchance by poison and that he himself should follow before he reached old age without that tendance in his lingering sickness that a common mechanic receives from tenderness the beggar from charity oh what a destiny we might well weep for his life said de bracy but we cannot mourn his death to him it was a blessing to france it may be a deliverance this news however you have now to carry to the king true true cried agnes but then she paused a moment and repeated his last words with a thoughtful and anxious look to the king she said to the king no i will take it to the queen de bracy come you with me in case of question and to receive those honours and rewards which are meet for him who brings such tidings ay let us to speak it plainly such good tidings for on these few words charles the sixth is dead depends i do believe the salvation of our france as she spoke she rose and moved toward the door and de bracy followed her down the staircase and through the long passage which connected the tower with the donjon the yellow autumn moon peeped up above the hills and poured its light upon them through the tall windows as they went there was a solemn feeling in their hearts which prevented them from uttering a word the way was somewhat lengthy but at last agnes stopped before a door and knocked the sweet voice of marie of anjou bade them come in and agnes opened the door ah my agnes cried the princess have you come to cheer me i know not how it is but i have felt very sad to-night i have been moralizing dear girl and thinking how much happier i should have been had we possessed nothing but this castle and the domain around mere lords of a little patrimony instead of seeing kingdoms called our own but to be snatched away from us france seems going the way of sicily my agnes but who is this you have you his face seems known to me you have seen him once before madam said agnes he is the bringer of great tidings but no lips but mine must give them to my queen and advancing gracefully she knelt at the feet of marie of anjou and kissed her hand saying madam you are queen of france his majesty charles the sixth has departed the queen stood as one stupefied for so often had the unfortunate king been reported ill and then recovered so little was known of his real state beyond the walls of the hotel st paul and so slow was the progress of information in that part of france that not a suspicion of the impending event had been entertained in the chateau of espali after gazing in the face of agnes for a moment she cast down her eyes to the ground remained for a brief space in deep thought and then exclaimed but after all what is he a king almost without provisions a general without an army a ruler without power or means rise rise dear agnes and casting her arms round her neck marie of anjou shed tears they were certainly not tears of sorrow for the departed for she knew little of the late king 
we do not even know from history that she had ever seen him but all sudden emotions must have voice generally in laughter or in tears it has been generally remarked that joy has its tears as well as sorrow but few have ever scanned deeply the fountain source from which those drops arise it is not that like those of a sealed fountain unconsciously opened they burst forth at once to sparkle perhaps in the sunshine of the hour but yet bear with them a certain chilliness from the depths out of which they arise Marie of Anjou recovered herself speedily, and Agnes Sorrel, rising from her knee, held out her hand to Jean Charost, and presented him to the Queen, saying, "'He brings you happier tidings, madam, tidings which, I trust, may give power to the sceptre just fallen into his majesty's hand. I edge his sword to smite his enemies when they least expect it. By the skill and by the zeal of one I may venture to call your friend, as well as mine, noble Jacques Coeur, the means which have been so long wanting to make at least one generous effort on behalf of france are now secured speak de bracy speak and tell her majesty the joyful news you bear the young gentleman told his tale simply and well and when he had concluded the queen with all traces of sorrow passed away exclaimed let us hasten quick dear agnes and carry the news to my husband there may be some men fitted for prosperity and he is one misfortune depresses him but this news will restore him all his energies oh this castle of espali it has seemed to me a dungeon of the spirit where chains were cast around the soul and the fair daylight of hope came but as a ray through the loophole of a cell come with me come with me my friends i need no attendance but you two jean charost raised a light from the table and opened the door then followed along the dark passages till they reached a small hall upon the ground floor, which the queen entered without waiting for announcement or permission. Her light step roused no one within from his occupation, and the whole scene was before her eyes ere any one engaged in it was aware of her presence. She might, perhaps, have seen another less tranquil to look upon. At a table under a sconce in one corner of the room sat a young man reading the contents of a book richly illuminated. His cap and plume were thrown down by his side, his sword was cast upon a bench near, and his head was bent over the volume, with his eyes eagerly fixed upon the page, deciphering, probably with difficulty, the words which it presented. In another corner of the room, far removed from the light, and with his shoulders supported by the angle of the building, sat Tanneguy du Châtel, sound asleep, but with his heavy sword resting on his knees, and his left hand lying upon the scabbard nearer to the windows some seven paces probably in advance stood a boy dressed as a page looking at what was going on at a table before him but not venturing to approach too near at that table with a large candelabra in the centre sat a young gentleman of powerful frame though still a mere lad with a slight moustache on the upper lip and his strong black hair curling round his forehead and temples on the opposite side of the table nearest to the page was charles the seventh himself he was the only one in the room who wore his cap and plume and to the eyes of jean charost whether from prepossession or not i cannot tell there seemed an air of dignity and grace about his youthful figure which well befitted the monarch the thoughts of france however were evidently far away and his whole attention seemed directed to the narrow board before him on which he was playing at chess with his cousin and after celebrated du noir still the step of the queen and her companions did not rouse him his whole soul seemed in the move he was about to make and it was not till they were close by that he even looked round even then he did not speak but turned his eyes upon the game again and in the end moved his knight so as to protect the king that is a good move said his wife taking a step forward but some such move must be made speedily my lord upon a wider board then bending her knee she added god save his majesty king charles the seventh charles started up nearly overturning the board and deranging all the pieces what is it marie he asked looking almost aghast but agnes sorrel and jean charost knelt at the same time saying god save your majesty he has done his will with your late father up started dunois and waving his hand in the air exclaiming god save the king 
and the other three in the chamber pressed around, repeating the same cry. Charles stood in the midst, gazing gravely on the different faces about him, then slowly drew his sword from the scabbard, and laid it on the table, saying, in a calm, thoughtful, resolute tone, Once more! End of chapter 39Chapter forty of Agnes Sorrel by G. P. R. James. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Chapter forty. How the news spread through the castle, I know not, but Charles the seventh had hardly recovered from the first surprise of the intelligence when, without waiting for permission or ceremony, all whose station justified their admission to the presence of the prince crowded into the little hall of Espali a bright and beautiful sight it presented at that moment for it was a court of youth and beauty and not more than two or three persons present had seen thirty years of age hope and enthusiasm was in every countenance and the heavy beams of the vault rang with the cries of long live the king the bearer of this intelligence which had caused the acclamation seemed likely to be altogether forgotten by the monarch in the gratulations which poured upon him but some bold frank words of the young and heroic lord of la Hire gave to generous agnes sorrel an opportunity of calling the attention of charles to jean charost ay god save the king cried la Hire warmly and sent him some more crowns in his purse to secure the one upon his head agnes whispered something to the young queen and marie of anjou turned gracefully toward de bracy saying this gentleman my lord has something to tell your majesty on that score he is the messenger of all good tidings sir urged agnes sorrel but perhaps your majesty forgets him he was the trusted friend of your uncle of orleans he was wounded and made prisoner at azincourt and his first steps upon french ground after his liberation brings you tidings of dignity and the promise of success speak monsieur de bracy tell his majesty the good news you have in store Charles the Seventh fixed his eyes upon Jean Charost, and a shade came over his face, not of displeasure, indeed, but of deep melancholy. It is probable the memories awakened by the sight, as soon as he recognised him, were very sorrowful. The bloody bridge of Montereau, the dying Duke of Burgundy, and all the fearful acts of a day never to be forgotten, came back to memory, but the impression was but momentary and when he heard the tidings which the young gentleman bore of present relief and of the prospect of large future supplies and he was made aware that he had also brought the news of his being king of france he smiled graciously upon him saying how can we reward you monsieur de bracy few kings have less means than we have at that moment tanneguy du chatel to whose disinterested character history dwelling on his faults has not done full justice came forward and laid his hand upon jean charost's shoulder saying give him saint florent sir which we were talking of the other day its lord not having appeared for fully fifteen years the thief has clearly fallen into the domain of the crown but i promised du chatel said charles turning toward him never mind that sire said du chatel bluffly i do not want it de bracy here has served the crown well and suffered for his services so did his father before him i have been told he brings you good tidings good tidings for france also i do hope give him the thief sir if i had it every one would be jealous no one will be jealous of him well then so be it replied charles the town and castle of saint florent near bourg monsieur de bracy shall be yours but by my faith you must keep them well for the place is of importance, commanding the supplies at Bourg. The letters of concession shall be ready for you to-morrow, and you can do homage before you go, if you will but stay at our court for a few days. I must stay here, sire, or at Puy, for the arrival of Messire Jacques, replied Jean Charost. He has many another scheme for your majesty's service. In saint Florent, I will do my duty, and I humbly thank you much for the gift stay here stay here said charles and then he added with a faint and melancholy smile our court is not so large as to fill even the castle of espali to overflowing some one see that he is well cared for and now lords and ladies other things are to be thought of 
My first thought, so help me heaven, has been of France, and of what benefit the event which has happened may prove to her. But I cannot forget that I have lost a father, a kind and noble prince, whom God has visited with long and sore afflictions, but who never lost the love of his people or his son. I do believe, from all that I have heard, that death was to him a blessing and relief. But still I must mourn that so sad and joyless a life has ended without one gleam of hope or happiness, even at the close. I had hoped that it might be otherwise, that my sword might have freed him from the durance in which he has been so long kept, that my care and love might have soothed his latest hours. It has been ordered otherwise, and God's will be done. But all to-morrow we will give up to solemn mourning, and the next day take counsel as to instant action. Thus saying, he took the hand of the queen in his own, and was retiring from the room, the group around him only moving to give him passage, except one gentleman, who sprang to open the door. Two persons were left in the midst of the little crowd, not exactly isolated, but in circumstances of somewhat awkwardness. Agnes Sorrel, notwithstanding all her influence at the court, notwithstanding all her power over the mind of the young king, felt that the bonds between herself and those who now surrounded her were very slight, and that there were jealousies and dislikes toward her in the bosoms of many present. But she was relieved from a slight embarrassment by the unvarying kindness of Marie of Anjou. Ere Charles and herself had taken six steps through the hall, the queen turned her head, saying, with a placid smile, "'Come with us, Agnes. I shall want you.' "'Marvellous, truly,' said a lady, standing near Jean Charost, speaking in a low tone, as if to herself. "'Were I a queen, methinks I would have the vengeance heaven sends me, even if I did not seek some for myself.' At the same moment, Tanneguy du Châtel laid his hand upon Jean Charost's arm. "'You must come with me, de Bracy,' he said. "'You shall be my guest in the chateau. I have room enough there where I lodge.' Wait but a moment till I speak a word or two with these good lords. We must not let the tide of good fortune ebb again unimproved. The royal name alone is a great thing for us, but it may be made to have a triple effect upon our enemies, upon our friends, and upon the king himself. By my life this is no time to throw one's card out of one's hand. He then spoke for several minutes in a low tone with Dunois, La Hire, Louvet, and others, and returning to the side of Jean Charost, led him down to the outer court, on his way to that part of the building which he himself inhabited. There, patiently waiting by the side of the mule, they found the son of the landlord at Puy. The boy was dismissed speedily, well satisfied, with directions to send up the young gentleman's horse to the castle the next morning, and the rest of the evening was spent by Jean Charost and Tanneguy du Châtel almost alone. It was not an evening of calm, however, for the excitable spirit of the prévôt was much moved with all that had passed, and with his prompt and eager impetuosity he commented, not alone upon the news that had been received, but upon all their probable consequences. Often he would start up and pace the room in a deep reverie, and often he would question his young companion upon details into which the king himself had forgotten to inquire. "'The happy moment must not be lost,' he said. The happy moment must not be lost. The young king's mind must be kept up to the tone which it has received by this intelligence. Would to heaven I could ensure half an hour's conversation with the fair Agnes, just to show her all the consequences of the first great step. But I do not like to ask it, and, after all, she needs no prompting. She is a glorious creature, de Bracy. Heart and soul with her are given to France." "'Yet there be some,' said Jean Charost, "'some even in this court, who seem not very well disposed toward her. "'Did you hear what was said by a lady near me just now?' "'Oh, Joan of Vendôme,' cried Tanneguy, with a laugh, "'she is a prescribed railer at our fair friend. "'She came to Poitiers two years ago, "'fancying herself a perfect paragon of beauty, "'and making up her mind to become the Dauphin's mistress. "'But he would have naught to say to her faded charms.' not even out of courtesy to her husband. So the poor thing is full of spleen, and would kill the beautiful Agnes if she dared. She is too cowardly for that, however, at least I trust so. 
Jean Charost meditated deeply over his companion's words, and whither his thoughts had led him might be perceived by what he next said. "'Strange,' he murmured, "'very strange, the conduct of the Queen.' "'Ay, strange enough,' answered Du Châtel. "'We have here, within this little chateau of Espali, de Bracy, two women such as the world has rarely ever seen, both young, both beautiful, both gentle. The one has all the courage, the intellect, the vigour of a man, and yet, as we see, a woman's weakness. The other is tender, timid, kind, and loving, and yet without one touch of that selfishness which prompts to what we call jealousy. By the Lord de Bracy, it has often puzzled me this conduct of Marie of Anjou, I do believe I could, as readily as any man, sacrifice myself to the happiness of one I love, but I could not make a friend of my wife's lover. There are things too much for nature, for human nature at least, but this girl, her majesty I mean, seems to me quite an angel, and the other does, I will say, all that a fallen and repentant angel could to retain the friendship which she fears she may have forfeited. All that deference and reverence and humble firm attachment can effect to wash away her offence she uses toward the queen. And I do believe from my very heart that no counsel ever given by Agnes Sorrel to Marie of Anjou has any other object upon earth but Marie's happiness. Still, it is all very strange, and the less we say about it, the better. Jean Charost thought so likewise, but that conversation brought upon him fits of thought which lasted, with more or less interruption, during the whole evening. Society, in almost every country, has its infancy, its youth, its maturity, and its old age. At least, such has been the case hitherto. These several acts of life are of longer or shorter duration, according to circumstances, but the several epochs are usually sufficiently marked. The age in which Jean Charost spoke was not one of that fine, moralizing tendency which belongs to the maturity of life, but it was one of passion and of action, of youth, activity, and indiscretion. Nevertheless, feeling often supplied a guide where reason failed, and from some cause Jean Charost felt pained that he could not find one character among those who surrounded him sufficiently pure and high to command and obtain his whole esteem. He asked himself that painful question which so often recurs to us, ere we have obtained from experience, as well as reason, a knowledge of man's mixed nature. Is there such a thing as virtue, and truth, and honour upon earth? The next day was passed as a day of mourning, but on the following morning early, all the nobles in the castle of Espali met together in the great hall, and some eager consultations went on among them. There were smiles and gay looks, and many a lively jest, and lances were brought in, and bucklers examined, as if for a tournament. Jean Charost asked his companion, Du Châtel, the meaning of all that they beheld, and the other replied with a grave smile, Merely a boy's frolic, but one which may have important consequences. A moment after, the young king himself, habited in scarlet, entered the hall, followed by a number of the ladies and gentlemen of the court, and received gracefully and graciously the greetings of his subjects. But an instant after, La Hire and two or three others surrounded and pressed upon him so closely that Jean Charost thought they were showing scanty reverence toward the king, when suddenly a voice exclaimed, "'Pardon us, sire!' And in an instant spears were crossed, a shield cast down upon them, and the young monarch lifted to a throne which might have befitted one of the predecessors of Charlemagne. Dunois seized a banner embroidered with the arms of France, and moving on through the doors of the hall to the chapel, the banner was waved three times in the air, and the voices of all present made the roof ring with the shout of, Long live King Charles the Seventh! Almost at the same time, another personage was added to the group around the altar, and Jacques Coeur himself repeated heartily the cry, adding, "'I have brought with me, sire, at least so I trust, the means to make you King of France, indeed. It is here in this chateau, and all safe.' "'Thanks, thanks, my good friend,' said the young king. "'We must take counsel together how it may be used to the best advantage, and our deep gratitude shall follow the service, whatever be the result of the use we make of it.' 
and now lords and ladies to poitiers immediately ay to-morrow morning to be solemnly crowned in the cathedral there that city at least we can call our own and there we will deliberate how to recover others End of chapter forty chapter forty one of agnes sorrel by g p r james this librivox recording is in the public domain chapter forty one what a wild whirlpool is history and how strange it is to gaze upon it and to see the multitudes of atoms that every instant are rushing forward upon the whirling and struggling waters of time borne fiercely along by causes that they know not but obey now catching the light now plunged into darkness agitated tossed to and fro turned round in giddy dance and at length swallowed up in the deep centre of the vortex where all things disappear it is a strange a terrible but a salutary contemplation no sermon that was ever preached no funeral oration ever spoken shows so plainly brings home to the heart so closely the emptiness of all human things the idleness of ambition the folly of avarice the weakness of vanity and the meanness of pride as the sad and solemn aspect of history the record of deeds that have produced nothing and passions that have been all in vain but there is a book from which all these things will at one time be read and then how awful will be the final results disclosed to men who make history however while floating round in that vortex and tending onward amid all their struggles to the one inevitable doom how light and easy is the transition how imperceptible the diminution of the circle as onward onward they are carried how rapid especially in times of great activity is the passage of event into event time seems to stop in the heat of action and energy like the prophet exclaims sun stand thou still upon gibeon and thou moon in the valley of Ajalon. It seemed to Jean Charost, after several years had passed, but as a day and a night since he had left Agnes and his mother in the chateau of Bracy, near Bourg. Each day had had its occupation, each hour its thought. The one had glided into the other, and the one deed trod so hastily upon the steps of another that there was no opportunity to count the time. And yet so many great events had happened that one would have thought the hours upon the dial were marked sufficiently he had taken part in battles he had been employed in negotiations he had navigated one of the many armed vessels now belonging to jacques coeur upon the mediterranean in search of fresh resources for his king and one of those lulls had taken place at the court of france those periods of idle inactivity which occasionally intervened between fierce struggles against the foreign enemy of factious cabals among the courtiers themselves he took his way from poitiers toward bourg to fulfil the promise he had often made to himself of returning at least for a time to those he loved with unabated fondness and as he went he thought with joy of his dear mother just as he left her not knowing that her hair was now as white as snow and his dear little agnes forgetting that she was no longer a mere bright girl of fourteen years of age but Jean Charost now no longer appeared as a poor youth struggling to redeem his father's encumbered estates, nor as a soldier followed to battle by a mere handful of followers. His train was strong and numerous. The lands of Saint Florent, so near his own castle and the town of Bourg, as to be under easy control of an intendant, had furnished not only ample revenues but hardy soldiers and with a troop of some sixty mounted men all joyful like himself to return for a period to their homes he rode gladly onward a powerful man in full maturity with a scarred brow and sunburned face but with the rich brown curls of his hair hardly streaked with grey except where the cask had somewhat pressed upon it and brought the wintry mark before its time but it was in the expression of his countenance that youth was most strongly apparent still there were no hard lines no heavy wrinkles there was gravity for he had never been of what is called a very merry disposition but it was if i may be allowed an expression which at first sight seems to imply a contradiction it was a cheerful gravity 
more cheerful than it had been in years long past. Success had brightened him, experience of the world and the world's things had rubbed off the rust that seclusion and study and hard application had engendered, and a kind, a generous, and an upright heart gave sunshine to his look. The country through which he passed was all peaceful. The troops of England had not yet passed the Loire. The Duke of Bedward was in England, and his lieutenants showed themselves somewhat negligent during his absence. After the fiercest struggle, the spirit of the Frenchman soon recovers breath, and in riding from Poitiers to Bourg, one might have fancied that the land had never known strife and contention, that all was peace, prosperity, and joy. There was the village dance upon the green. There was the gay inn, with its well-fed host, and his quips, and jests, and merry tales. The marriage bells rang out, the procession of the clergy moved along the streets, and there was song in the vineyard and the field. It was an evening in the bright, warm summer, when the last day's march but one came toward an end, and on a small height, rising from the banks of the Cher, with a beautiful village at its foot, and woods sweeping round it on three sides, appeared the old castle of saint Florent, where Jean Charost was to halt for the night, and journey on to de Brecy the following day. It was a pleasant feeling to his heart that he was coming once more upon his own land, and there above, upon the great round tower, for it was a very ancient building even then, floated a flag which bore, he doubted not, the arms of de Brecy. Just as he was passing one of the curious old bridges over the Cher, with its narrow pointed arches and massy ivy-coloured piers, a flash broke from the walls of the tower, and a moment after the report of a cannon was heard. "'They see us coming and are giving us welcome, de Bigny, said Jean Charost, turning to one of his companions who rode near. "'Oh, tis pleasant to enjoy one's own peace. Would to heaven these wars were over. I am well weary of them.' They rode on toward the slope, and entered a sort of elbow of the wood, where the dark oak trees, somewhat browned by the summer sun, stretched their long branches overhead, and made a pleasant shade. It was a sweet, refreshing scene, where the eye could pierce far through the boles of the old trees, catching here and there a mass of grey rock, a piece of rich green sword. A sparkling rivulet, dashing down to meet the share, a low hermitate, with a stone cross raised in front, and two old men with their long snowy beards, retreating beneath the shady archway at the sight of a troop of armed men. "'This is pleasant,' said de Bracy, still speaking to his companion. "'But to-morrow will afford things still pleasanter. The face of nature is very beautiful, but not so beautiful as the faces of those we love.' A hundred steps further, and the gates of the old castle appeared in view, crenellated and machicolated, with its two large flanking towers, and the walls running off and losing themselves behind the trees. But there was the flutter of women's garments under the arch, as well as the gleam of arms. The heart of de Bracy beat high, and dashing on before the rest he was soon upon the drawbridge. It is rarely that fortune comes to meet our hopes, hard schoolmistress. She lessens man's impatience by delay. But there they were, his mother and little Agnes, as he still called her. The change in both was that which time usually makes in the old and in the young. And with old Madame de Brecy we will pass it over, for it had no consequences. But upon the changes in Agnes it may be necessary to pause somewhat longer. From the elderly to the old woman, the transition is easy, and presents nothing remarkable. From the child to the young woman the step is more rapid, more distinct, and strange. There is something in us which makes us comprehend decay better than development. Agnes, who, up to the period when Jean Charost last beheld her, had been low of stature, though beautifully formed, seemed to have grown up like a lily in a night, and was now taller than Madame de Brecy. But it was not only in height that she had gained. Her whole form had altered, and assumed a symmetry as delicate, but very different from that which it had displayed before. Previously she had looked what Jean Charost had been fond to call her, a little fairy, but now, though she might have a fairy's likeness, still there was no doubting that she was a woman. Beautiful, wonderfully beautiful, she was to the eyes of Jean Charost, 
but yet there was something sorrowful in the change the dear being of his memory was gone for ever and he had not yet had time to become reconciled to the change he felt he could not caress he could not fondle her as he had done before that he could be to her no longer what he had been and he dreamed not of ever becoming aught else strange to say agnes seemed to feel the change far less than he did indeed she saw no change in him his cheek might be a little browner the scar upon his brow was new but yet he was the same jean charost whom she had loved from infancy and she perceived no trace of time's hand upon his face or person she had not yet learned to turn her eyes upon herself and the alteration in him was so slight she did not mark it she sprang to meet him even before his mother held up her cheek for his first kiss and gazed at him with a look of affection and tenderness while he pressed madame de bracy to his heart which might have misled any beholder who knew not the course of their former lives but jean charost was very happy between the two whom he loved best on all the earth he entered the old chateau was led by them from room to room which he had never seen heard how as soon as they had received news of his proposed return they had come on from de bracy to meet him how the hands of agnes herself had decked the hall and how the tidy care of good martin Grille had seen that everything was in due order for the reception of his lord joyfully the evening passed away with a thousand little occurrences all pleasant at the time but upon which i must not dwell now the supper was served in the great hall and after it was over and generous wine had given a welcome to de bracy's chief followers he himself retired with his mother and his fair young charge to talk over the present and the past during that evening the conversation was rambling and desultory a broken ill-ordered chat full of memories and hardly to be detailed in a history like this jean charost heard all the little incidents which had occurred in the neighbourhood of bourg how agnes had become an accomplished horsewoman how she had learned from a musician expelled from paris to play upon the lute how madame de bracy had ordered all things both on their ancient estates and those of saint florent with care and prudence and how there were a thousand beautiful rides and walks around which agnes could show him on the banks of the cher then again he told them all he himself had gone through dwelling but lightly upon his own exploits and acknowledging with sincere humility that he had been rewarded for his services more largely than they deserved many an anecdote of the court too he told which did not give either of his hearers much inclination to mingle with it how the adhesion of the count of richmond had been bought by the sword of constable and other honours how the somewhat unstable alliance of the duke of brittany had been gained by the concession of one half of the revenues of guienne how richmond had played the tyrant over his king and forced him to receive ministers at his pleasure how he had caused beaulieu to be assassinated and how after a mock trial he had tied gillac in a sack and thrown him into the loire happily he added la Trimouille, whom he had compelled the king to receive as his minister had avenged his monarch by ingratitude toward his patron how richmond was kept in activity at a distance from the court and all was quiet for a time during his absence thus passed more than one hour the sun had gone down and yet no lights were called for for the large summer moon shone lustrous in at the window harmonizing well with the feelings of those now met after a long parting madame de bracy sat near the open casement agnes and jean charost stood near with her hand resting quietly in his i know not how it got there and the fair valley of the cher stretched out far below till all lines were lost in the misty moonlight of the distance just then a solemn song rose up from the foot of the hill between them and saint florent and agnes leaning her head familiarly on jean charost's shoulder whispered hark the two hermits and the children of the village whom they teach are chanting before they part jean charost listened attentively till the song was ended and then remarked in a quiet tone i saw two old men going into the hermitage i hope their reputation is fair for it is difficult to dispossess men who make a profession of sanctity and yet their proximity is not always much to be coveted 
"'Oh, yes, they are well spoken of,' replied Madame de Brécy. "'But one of them, at least, is very strange and frightened us.' "'It was but for a moment,' cried Agnes eagerly. "'He is a kind, good man, too. "'I will tell you how it all happened, dear Jean, "'and we will go down and see him to-morrow, "'for he and I are great friends now. "'The day after our arrival here, I had wandered out, "'as I do at de Brécy, "'thinking myself quite as safe here as there, when suddenly in the wood, just by the little waterfall, I came upon a tall old man, dressed in a grey gown, and walking with a staff. What it was he saw in me, I do not know, but the instant he beheld me he stopped suddenly, and seemed to reel as if he were going to fall. I started forward to help him, but he seized hold of my arms, and fixed his eyes so sternly in my face he frightened me. His words terrified me still more, for he burst forth with the strangest, wildest language I ever heard, asking if I had come from the grave, and if his long years of penitence had been in vain, saying that he had forgiven me, and surely I might forgive him, that God had forgiven him he knew, then why should I be more obdurate? And then he wept bitterly. I tried to soothe and calm him, but he still held me by the arm, and I could not get away. Gradually, however, he grew tranquil, and begged my pardon. He said he had been suffering under a delusion, asked my name, and made me sit down by him on the moss. There we remained, and talked for more than half an hour, for whenever I wished to go, he begged me piteously to stay. All the time I remained, his conversation seemed to me to ramble a great deal. At least I could not understand one half of it. He told me once, however, that he had once been a rich man, a courtier and a soldier, and that many years ago he had been terribly wronged, and in a moment of passionate madness he had committed a great crime. He had wandered about, he said, for some years as a condemned spirit, not only half insane, but knowing that he was so. After that he met with a good man who led him to better hopes, and thenceforth he had passed his whole time in penitence and prayer. When he let me go, he besought me eagerly to come and see him in his hermitage, and, taking Margiette, the maid, with me, I have been down twice. I found him and his companion teaching the little children of the village, and he seemed always glad to see me, though at first he would give a sidelong glance, as if he almost feared me. But he seemed to know much of you, dear Jean, at least by name. He said you had always been faithful and true, and would be so to the end, and spoke of you as I loved to hear, so you must come down with me and see him and his comrade. "'I will see him,' replied Jean Charost. He made no further remark upon her little narrative, but what she told him gave him matter for much thought, even after the whole household had retired to rest. End of chapter 41《ハッピーバースデー》《ハッピーバースデー》《ハッピーバースデー》《ハッピーバースデー》《ハッピーバースデー》《ハッピーバースデー》《ハッピーバースデー》《ハッピーバースデー》《ハッピーバースデー》《ハッピーバースデー》《ハッピーバースデー》《ハッピーバースデー》《ハッピーバースデー》《ハッピーバースデー》《ハッピーバースデー》《ハッピーバースデー》《ハッピーバースデー》《ハッピーバースデー》《ハッピーバースデー》《ハッピーバースデー》《ハッピーバースデー》《ハッピーバースデー》《ハッピーバースデー》《ハッピーバースデー》《ハッピーバースデー》《ハッピーバースデー》《ハッピーバースデー》《ハッピーバースデー》《ハッピーバースデー》《ハッピーバースデー》《ハッピーバースデー》《ハッピーバースデー》《ハッピーバースデー》《ハッピーバースデー》《ハッピーバースデー》《ハッピーバースデー》《ハッピーバースデー》《ハッピーバースデー》《ハッピーバースデー》《ハッピーバースデー》《ハッピーバースデー》《ハッピーバースデー》《ハッピーバースデー》《ハッピーバースデー》《ハッピーバースデー》《ハッピーバースデー》《ハッピーバースデー》《ハッピーバースデー》《ハッピーバースデー》《ハッピーバースデー》《ハッピーバースデー》《ハッピーバースデー》《ハッピーバースデー》《ハッピーバースデー》《ハッピーバースデー》《ハッピーバースデー》《ハッピーバースデー》《ハッピーバースデー》《ハッピーバースデー》《ハッピーバースデー》《ハッピーバースデー》《ハッピーバースデー》《ハッピーバースデー》《ハッピーバースデー》《ハッピーバースデー》《ハッピーバースデー》《ハッピーバースデー》《ハッピーバースデー》《ハッピーバースデー》《ハッピーバースデー》《ハッピーバースデー》《ハッピーバースデー》《ハッピーバースデー》《ハッピーバースデー》《ハッピーバースデー》《ハッピーバースデー》《ハッピーバースデー》《ハッピーバースデー》《ハッピーバースデー》《ハッピーバースデー》《ハッピーバースデー》《ハッピーバースデー》《ハッピーバースデー》《ハッピーバースデー》《ハッピーバースデー》《ハッピーバースデー》《ハッピーバースデー》《ハッピーバースデー》《ハッピーバースデー》《ハッピーバースデー》《ハッピーバースデー》《ハッピーバースデー》《ハッピーバースデー》《ハッピーバースデー》《ハッピーバースデー》《ハッピーバースデー》《ハッピーバースデー》《ハッピーバースデー》《ハッピーバースデー》《ハッピーバースデー》《ハッピーバースデー》《ハッピーバースデー》《ハッピーバースデー》《ハッピーバースデー》《ハッピーバースデー》《ハッピーバースデー》《ハッピーバースデー》《ハッピーバースデー》《ハッピーバースデー》《ハッピーバースデー》《ハッピーバースデー》《ハッピーバースデー》《ハッピーバースデー》《ハッピーバースデー》《ハッピーバースデー》《ハッピーバースデー》《ハッピーバースデー》《ハッピーバースデー》《ハッピーバースデー》《ハッピーバースデー》《ハッピーバースデー》《ハッピーバースデー》《ハッピーバースデー》《ハッピーバースデー》《ハッピーバースデー》《ハッピーバースデー》《ハッピーバースデー》《ハッピーバースデー》《ハッピーバースデー》《ハッピーバースデー》《ハッピーバースデー》《ハッピーバースデー》《ハッピーバースデー》《ハッピーバースデー》《ハッピーバースデー》《ハッピーバースデー》《ハッピーバースデー》《ハッピーバースデー》《ハッピーバースデー》《ハッピーバースデー》《ハッピーバースデー》《ハッピーバースデー》《ハッピーバースデー》《ハッピーバースデー》《ハッピーバースデー》《ハッピーバースデー》《ハッピーバースデー》《ハッピーバースデー》《ハッピーバースデー》《ハッピーバースデー》《ハッピーバースデー》《ハッピーバースデー》《ハッピーバースデー》《ハッピーバースデー》《ハッピーバースデー》《ハッピーバースデー》《ハッピーバースデー》《ハッピーバースデー》《ハッピーバースデー》《ハッピーバースデー》《ハッピーバースデー》《ハッピーバースデー》《ハッピーバースデー》《ハッピーバースデー》《ハッピーバースデー》《ハッピーバースデー》《ハッピーバースデー》《ハッピーバースデー》《ハッピーバースデー》《ハッピーバースデー》《ハッピーバースデー》《ハッピーバースデー》《ハッピーバースデー》《ハッピーバースデー》《ハッピーバースデー》《ハッピーバースデー》《ハッピーバースデー》《ハッピーバースデー》《ハッピーバースデー》《ハッピーバースデー》《ハッピーバースデー》《ハッピーバースデー》《ハッピーバースデー》《ハッピーバースデー》《ハッピーバースデー》《ハッピーバースデー》《ハッピーバースデー》《ハッピーバースデー》《ハッピーバースデー》《ハッピーバースデー》《ハッピーバースデー》《ハッピーバースデー》《ハッピーバースデー》《ハッピーバースデー》《ハッピーバースデー》《ハッピーバースデー》《ハッピーバースデー》《ハッピーバースデー》《ハッピーバースデー》《ハッピーバースデー》《ハッピーバースデー》《ハッピーバースデー》《ハッピーバースデー》《ハッピーバースデー》《ハッピーバースデー》《ハッピーバースデー》《ハッピーバースデー》《ハッピーバースデー》《ハッピーバースデー》《ハッピーバースデー》《ハッピーバースデー》《ハッピーバースデー》《ハッピーバースデー》《ハッピーバースデー》《ハッピーバースデー》《ハッピーバースデー》《ハッピーバースデー》《ハッピーバースデー》《ハッピーバースデー》《ハッピーバースデー》《ハッピーバースデー》《ハッピーバースデー》《ハッピーバースデー》《ハッピーバースデー》《ハッピーバースデー》《ハッピーバースデー》《ハッピーバースデー》《ハッピーバースデー》《ハッピーバースデー》《ハッピーバースデー》《ハッピーバースデー》《ハッピーバースデー》《ハッピーバースデー》《ハッピーバースデー》《ハッピーバースデー》《ハッピーバースデー》《ハッピーバースデー》《ハッピーバースデー》《ハッピーバースデー》《
and immediately on his return to the castle messengers were dispatched to several public functionaries in bourg it was done quietly however and even those who bore the short letters of their lord had no idea that his impulse was a sudden one supposing merely that he acted on orders received before he had set out from poitiers ere he joined his mother and agnes too de bracy passed some time in examining a packet of old papers a few trinkets and a ring and then walked up and down thoughtfully in his room for several minutes then casting away care he mingled with his household again and an hour went by in cheerful conversation perhaps jean charost was gayer than usual less thoughtful yet his mother observed that once or twice his eyes fixed upon the face of agnes for a very few moments with a look of intense earnestness and consideration nor was agnes herself unconscious of it and once for a single instant as she caught his look directed toward her a fluttering blush spread over her cheek and some slight agitation betrayed itself in her manner shortly after she left the hall and madame de bracy said in a quiet tone but not without a definite purpose i doubt not we shall have an early visit my son from a young neighbour of ours who lives between this place and de bracy monsieur de brive whose chateau and the village of that name you can see from the top of the tower he has frequently been to see us both here and at de bracy i believe i might say to see our dear agnes you see my dear son how beautiful she has become and to say the truth i am very glad you have arrived before this young gentleman has come to any explanation of his wishes for i could not venture to tell him even the little that i know of agnes's history and yet he might desire some information regarding her family she watched her son's countenance quietly while she spoke but she could discover no trace of emotion thereon jean charost was silent indeed and did not reply for two or three minutes but he remained quite calm and merely thoughtful at length he asked do you know my dearest mother anything of this young gentleman's character it is very fair i believe as the world goes replied madame de bracy he seems amiable and kind and distinguished himself in the attack of cone some years ago i am told he is wealthy too and altogether his own master how does agnes receive him asked jean charost thoughtfully friendly and courteously replied his mother but i have remarked nothing more indeed i have given no great encouragement to his visits thinking that perhaps the dear girl might meet with a sad disappointment if her affections became entangled and her obscure history were to prove an insurmountable obstacle in the eyes of the man she had chosen did it do so he would be unworthy of her answered jean charost rising and walking slowly to and fro in the room then stopping opposite to his mother he added i have been thinking all this morning my dear mother of telling agnes everything i can tell of her history it is a somewhat difficult and somewhat painful task but yet it must be done i think the sooner the better replied madame de bracy i have long thought so but trusting entirely to your judgment i did not like to interfere does she know that she is in no degree allied to us asked jean charost yes yes answered his mother that her own questions elicited one day i could see she would have fain known more but i merely told her she was an orphan committed to your care and guardianship that seemed to satisfy her and she asked no more but i think it is right that she should know all she shall answered jean charost i will tell her but it must be at some moment when we are alone together if you will give me any sign i will quit the room answered madame de bracy no replied her son thoughtfully no that will not be needful i could not tell it in a formal way it must be told gently easily my dear mother in order not to alarm and agitate her some day when we are riding or walking forth in the woods around or on the castle walls i will say something which will naturally lead her to inquire then piece by piece i will dole it out as if it were a matter of not much moment there sounds the horn at the gates perhaps it is this monsieur de brive what will you do if he speaks at once asked madame de bracy quickly adding i doubt not that he will do so i will refer him to agnes herself answered jean charost she must decide 
First, however, I will let him know as much of her history as I may, and, as some counterpoise, will assure him that all which I have gained by my labours or my sword shall be hers. But you will some day marry yourself, dear Jean. I hope so. I trust so, said his mother earnestly. Never, answered her son. And the next moment Monsieur de Brive was in the room. He was a tall, handsome young man of some five or six and twenty, polished and courteous in his manners, with a tone of that warm sincerity in his whole address which is usually very winning upon a woman's heart. Why, it is hardly possible to say, Jean Charost received him with somewhat stately coldness, and the first few words of ceremony had hardly passed when Agnes herself re-entered the room and welcomed their visitor with friendly ease. De Brace's eyes were turned upon her eagerly. At the end of a few minutes, Monsieur de Brive turned to Jean Charost, saying, "'I am glad you have returned at last, Monsieur de Brace, for I have a few words to say to you in private, if your leisure serves to give me audience.' "'Assuredly,' replied de Brace, rising, and whispering a word to his mother as he passed, he led the way to a cabinet near, giving one glance to the face of Agnes. It was perfectly calm. His conversation with Monsieur de Brive lasted half an hour, and some time before it was over, Madame de Brecy quietly left the hall, while Agnes remained embroidering a coat of arms. At length the two gentlemen issued from the cabinet, and Monsieur de Brive took his way at once to the room where Agnes was seated. Jean Charost, for his part, went down to the lower hall, which had been left vacant while his followers sported in the castle court. There, with a grave, stern air, and his arms crossed upon his chest, Jean Charost paced up and down the pavement, pausing once to look out into the court upon the gay games going on. But he turned away without even a smile. Bending his eyes thoughtfully upon the old stones, as if he would have counted their number or spied out their flaws. The time seemed very long to him, and yet he would not interrupt the lover in his suit. At length, however, he heard a rapid step coming, and the next instant Monsieur de Brive entered the hall, as if to pass through it to the court. His face was deadly pale, and traces of strong emotion were in every line. Well, cried de Bracy, advancing to meet him, she has accepted you, of course, she has accepted you. De Brive only grasped his hand and shook his head. Did you tell her you knew all? asked de Bracy. Did you tell her of your generous... "'In vain, all in vain,' said the young man, and wringing de Brace's hand hard in his, he broke away from him and left the castle. Jean Charles stood for an instant in the midst of the hall buried in deep thought, and then mounted the stairs to the room where he had left Agnes. He found her weeping bitterly, and going gently up to her, he seated himself beside her and took her hand. "'Dear Agnes,' he said, "'you are weeping. You regret what you have done.' "'It is not yet too late. "'Let me send after him. "'He has hardly yet left the castle.' "'No, no, no,' cried Agnes eagerly. "'I do not regret what I have said, "'though I regret having given him pain. "'I regret to give pain to anything, "'but I told him the truth.' "'What did you tell him?' asked Jean Charost, "'perhaps indiscreetly.' "'Agnes's face glowed warmly, but she answered at once.' I told him I could not love him as a woman should love her husband. Bitter truth enough from such lips as those, said Jean Charost in a low tone. Indeed, indeed, cried Agnes, who seemed to feel some reproach in his words. I did not intend to grieve him more than I could help in telling him the truth. But how could I love him? she asked with a bewildered look, and then shaking her head sadly, she added, No, no. "'Not a word more, dear Agnes,' answered Jean Charost. "'You did right to tell him the truth, "'and I am quite sure you did it as gently as might be. "'Now let us forget this painful incident as soon as we can, "'and all be as we were before.' "'Oh, gladly!' cried Agnes with a bright smile. "'I hope for nothing. I desire nothing but that.' "'He soothed her with kindly tenderness, "'and soon wiled her away from all painful thoughts.' gradually and with more skill than might have been expected, leading the conversation by imperceptible degrees to other subjects and to distant scenes. 
the return of madame de brecy to the room renewed for a time the beautiful girl's agitation and jean charost left her with his mother with a promise to take a long ramble with her that evening and make her show him every fair spot in the woods around the castle woman's heart it is generally supposed is more easily opened to a fellow woman than to a man and sometimes it is so but sometimes not if we have watched closely most of us must have seen the secret within more carefully guarded from a woman's eyes than from any other perhaps from a knowledge of their acuteness such indeed might not probably was not the case with agnes nevertheless it was in vain that madame de brecy questioned her she told all that had occurred frankly and simply every word that had been uttered as far as she could recollect it but there was something that agnes did not tell the cause of all that had occurred true she could not tell it for it was intangible to herself misty indefinite as something which she could feel but not explain gladly she heard the trumpet sound to dinner for she had set madame de brecy musing and agnes did not like that she should muse too long over her conduct of that day noon proved very sultry and jean charost had plenty of occupation for several hours after the meal horsemen came and went he saw several persons from bourg and several of the tenants of saint florent he sent off a large body of the men who had accompanied him from poitiers to the neighbouring city and the castle resumed an air of silence and loneliness toward evening however he called upon agnes to prepare for her walk and as he paced up and down the hall waiting for her madame de brecy judged from his look and manner that he meditated speaking to his fair charge that very evening on the delicate subject of her own history be gentle with the dear girl my son she said and if you see that a subject agitates her change it there is something on agnes's mind that we do not comprehend fully and one may touch a tender point without knowing it do you suspect any other attachment asked jean charost turning so suddenly and speaking so gravely that his mother was surprised none whatever she answered indeed i cannot believe such a thing possible to my knowledge she has seen no one at all likely to gain her affections but this monsieur de brive the stiff old soldiers left to guard this castle and de brecy good martin grille and Henriot, the groom upon my word are the only men we have seen the return of agnes stopped further conversation and she and de brecy took their way out by one of the posterns on the hill agnes was now as gay as a lark the shower had passed away and left all clear not a trace of agitation lingered behind de brecy was thoughtful but strove to be cheerful likewise paused and gazed wherever she told him the scene was beautiful talked with no ignorant or tasteless lips of the loveliness of nature and of the marvels of art which he had seen since he was last in berry but there was something more in his conversation there was a depth of feeling a warmth of fancy a richness of association which made agnes thoughtful also he seemed to lead her mind which way he would to have the complete mastery over it and exercising his power gently and tenderly it was a pleasant and new sensation to feel that he possessed it there was one very beautiful scene that came up just when the sun was a couple of hands breadth from the horizon it was a small secluded nook in the wood of some ten or fifteen yards across surrounded and overshadowed by the tall old trees but only covered itself with short green grass it was as flat and even too as the pavement of the hall but just beyond to the south-west was a short and sharp descent from the foot of which some lesser trees shot up their branches letting in between them as through a window a prospect of the valley of the Cher and the glowing sky beyond this is a place for dryads agnes said jean charost making her sit down by him on a large fragment of stone which had rolled to the foot of an old oak nymphs of the woods dear girl might well hold commune here with spirits of the air i was thinking but the day before yesterday said agnes what a beautiful spot this would be for a cottage in the wood with that lovely sky before us and the world below it is always better said jean charost with a smile 
to keep the world below us, or rather, to keep ourselves above the world. But I fear me, Agnes, it is not the inhabitants of cottages who have the most skill in doing so. I have little faith either in cottages or hermitages. Do not destroy my dreams, dear Jean, said Agnes, almost sadly. Oh, no, he answered, I would not destroy, but only read them. Agnes paused, with her eyes bent down for a moment or two, and then looked earnestly in his face. They are very simple, she said, and easily read. The brightest dream of my whole life, the one I cherish the most fondly, is but to remain for ever with dear Madame de Bracy and you, without any change. Except, she added eagerly, to have you always remain with us, to coax you to throw away swords and lances, and never make our hearts beat with the thought that you are in battle and in danger. Jean Charost's own heart beat now, and he was silent for a moment or two. That cannot be, Agnes, he said, and you would not wish it, my dear girl. Every one must sacrifice something for his country, very much in perilous times. Men their repose, their ease, often their happiness, their life itself, should it be necessary. Women the society of those they love, brothers, fathers, husbands. Now, dear Agnes, I am neither of these to you, and therefore your sacrifice is not so much as that of many others. I know you are not my father, answered Agnes, that our dear mother told me long ago. But do you know, dear Jean, I often wish you were my brother. Jean Charost smiled and seemed for a moment to hesitate what he should reply. He pursued his purpose steadily, however, and at length answered, That is a relationship which, wish as we may we cannot bring about but indeed we are none to each other agnes you are only my adopted child no not your child she said you are too young for that why not your adopted sister i have never heard of such an adoption replied de bracy but you are like a child to me agnes i have carried you more than one mile in my arms when you were an infant and an orphan she added in a sad tone how much, how very much do I owe you, kindest and best of friends? Not so much, perhaps, as you imagine, Agnes, replied Jean Charost. To save my own life in a moment of great danger, I made a solemn promise to protect, cherish, and educate you, as if you were my own. I had incautiously suffered myself to fall into the hands of a party of ruthless marauders, who, imagining that I had come to espy their actions, and perhaps to betray them, threatened to put me to death. There was no possibility of escape or resistance, but a gentleman who was with them, and who, though not of them, possessed apparently from old associations great influence over them, induced them to spare me on the condition I have mentioned. You were then an infant lying under the greenwood tree, and I, it is true, hardly more than a boy. But I took a solemn promise, dear Agnes, and I have striven to perform it well. Yet I deserve no credit even for that, dear Agnes, for what I did at first from a sense of duty, I afterward did from affection. Well did you win, and did you repay my love. And as I told Monsieur de Brive this morning, although at my death the small estate of de Bracy must pass away to another, and very distant branch of my own family, all that I have won by my own exertions will be yours. "'Do you think I could enjoy it, and you dead?' asked Agnes in a sad and almost reproachful tone. "'Oh, no, no. All I should then want would be enough to find me place in a nunnery, there to pray that it might not be long till we met again. You have been all and everything to me through life, dear Jean. What matters it what happens when you are gone?' Jean Charost laid his hand gently upon hers, and she might have felt that strong hand tremble, but her thoughts seemed busy with other things. She knew not the emotions she excited. Doubtless she knew not even those which lay at the source of her own words and thoughts. It is sad, she continued after a brief pause, never to have seen a father's face or known a mother's blessing, to have no brother, no sister, and though the place of all has been supplied, and well supplied, by a friend, I sometimes long to know who were my parents, what was my family. I know you would tell me, if it were right for me to know, and therefore I have never asked, nor do I ask now, 
though the thought sometimes troubles me. "'I am ready to tell you all I know this moment,' answered Jean Charost, "'but that is not much, and it is a sad tale. Are you prepared to hear it, Agnes?' "'No, not if it is sad,' she answered. "'I have been looking forward to the time of your return, dear friend, "'as if every day of your stay were to be a day of joy, "'and not a shadow to come over me during the whole time. "'Yet you have been but one day here, "'and that has been more chequered with sadness "'than many I have known for years. "'I have shed tears, which I had not done before since you went away. "'I would have no more sad things to-day, some other time. "'Some other time you shall tell me all about myself.' "'All that I know,' answered Jean Charost, "'and I will give you, too, some papers which, perhaps, may tell you more. "'There are some jewels, too, which belong to you.' "'See,' said Agnes, interrupting him, as if her mind had been absent, "'the sun is half-way down behind the edge of the earth. "'Had we not better go back to the castle? "'How gloriously he lights up the edges of the clouds, "'changing the dark grey into crimson and gold. "'I have often thought that love does the like.' and when you and our dear mother are with me i feel that it is so for things that would be otherwise dark and sad seem then to become bright and sparkle even that which made me weep this morning has lost its heaviness and as it was to be i am glad that it is over will you never repent my agnes asked jean charost with a voice not altogether free from emotion of this monsieur de brive i know nothing but by report yet he seemed to me one well calculated to win favour and perhaps to deserve it what is he to me asked agnes almost impatiently a mere stranger shall i ever repent oh never never but you must marry some one nearly as much a stranger to you as he is replied jean charost she only shook her head sadly again answering never jean charost was silent for a moment and then rising they returned to the castle with nothing said of all that might have been said End of chapter forty two